Harper Audio presents Tomb of the Golden Bird by Elizabeth Peters, performed by Barbara Rosenblatt. Chapter One Ramses! Seated on the terrace of Shepherd's Hotel, I watched with interest as a tall young man stopped and turned, as if in response to the calling of his name. Yet this was not the 14th century B.C., but the year of our Lord, 1922. And the tall man was no ancient pharaoh, though his bronzed skin and black hair resembled those of an Egyptian his height and bearing proclaimed him for what he was, an English gentleman of the finest quality. He was also my son, Ramses Walter Peabody Emerson, who was better known in Egypt by his sobriquet. He raised his hand to his brow and realized that, as usual, he was not wearing a hat. In lieu of removing that which was not present, he inclined his head in greeting, and one of his rare, attractive smiles warmed his thin face. I craned my neck and half rose from my chair in order to see the individual who had occasioned this response, but the crowds that filled the street blocked my view. Cairo traffic had grown worse since my early days in Egypt. Motor cars now mingled with donkeys and camels, carts and carriages, and the disgusting effluvians their engines emitted offended the nostrils more than the odors of the above-mentioned beasts, to which, admittedly, I had become accustomed. I deduced that the person my son addressed was of short stature and most probably female, basing this latter assumption on Ramsay's attempt to remove his hat and the affability of his smile. A portly person wearing a very large turban and mounted on a very small donkey passed in front of my son, and by the time he had gone by, Ramses was wending his way toward the steps of the hotel and the table where I sat awaiting him. Who was that? I demanded. Good afternoon to you too, mother. Ramses bent to kiss my cheek. Good afternoon. Who was that? Who was whom? Ramses, I said. Warningly, my son abandoned his teasing. I believe you're not acquainted with her, mother. Her name is Suzanne Malraux, and she studied with Mr. Petrie. Ah, yes, I said. You are mistaken, Ramses. I heard of her last year from Professor Petrie. He described her work as adequate. That sounds like Petrie. Ramses sat down and adjusted his long legs under the table. But you must give him credit. He has always been willing to train women in archaeology. I have never denied Petrie any of the acclaim that is his due, Ramses. Ramses' smile acknowledged the ambiguity of the statement. Training is one thing, employment another. She has been unable to find a position. I wondered if Ramses was implying that we take the young woman on to our staff. She might have approached him rather than his father or me. He was, I admit, more approachable particularly by young ladies. Let me hasten to add that he did not invite the approaches. He was devoted to his beautiful wife, Nefret, but it might be asking too much of a lady who is approaching a certain time of life to allow her husband close association with a younger female. Miss Malraux was half French, and she was bound to be attracted to Ramses. Women were. His gentle manners my contribution, and athletic frame, his father's, his somewhat exotic good looks, and a certain je ne sais quoi. In fact, I knew perfectly well what it was, but refused to employ the vulgar terms currently in use. No, despite our need for additional staff, it might not be advisable. Have you had any interesting encounters? Ramses asked looking over the people taking tea on the terrace. They were the usual sort, well-dressed, well-groomed, and almost all white, if that word can be used to describe complexions that ranged from pimply pale to sunburned crimson. Lord and Lady Allenby stopped to say hello, I replied. He was most agreeable, but I understand why people refer to him as the bull. He has that set to his jaw. He has to be forceful. As High Commissioner, he is under fire from the imperialists in the British government and the nationalists in Egypt. On the whole, I can only commend his efforts. I did not want to talk politics. The subject was too depressing. 
There is your father, I said, late as usual. Ramses looked over his shoulder at the street. There was no mistaking Emerson. He is one of the finest looking men I have ever beheld. Raven locks and eyes of a penetrating saffirine blue, a form as impressive as it had been when I first met him. He stood a head taller than those round him, and his booming voice was audible some distance away. He was employing it freely, greeting acquaintances in a mixture of English and Arabic, the latter liberally salted with the expletives that have given him the Egyptian sobriquet of Father of Curses. Egyptians had become accustomed to this habit and replied with broad grins to remarks such as, How are you, Ibrahim, you old son of an incontinent camel? My distinguished husband, the finest Egyptologist of this or any era, had earned the respect of the Egyptians with whom he had lived for so many years because he treated them as he did his fellow archaeologists. That is to say... He cursed all of them impartially when they did something that vexed him. It was not difficult to vex Emerson. Few people lived up to his rigid professional standards, and time had not mellowed his quick temper. He's got someone with him, said Ramses. Well, well, I said. What a surprise. The individual who followed in Emerson's mighty wake was none other than Howard Carter. Perhaps I should explain the reason for my sarcasm, for such it was. Howard was one of our oldest friends, an archaeologist whose career had undergone several reversals and recoveries. He was presently employed by Lord Carnarvon to search for royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Searching for royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings was Emerson's great ambition, one he could not fulfill until Carnarvon gave up his concession. Rumour had it that his lordship was about to do so, having come to the conclusion, shared by most Egyptologists, that the valley had yielded all it ever would. Emerson did not share that conclusion. At the end of the previous season, he had admitted to me that he believed there was at least one more royal tomb to be found, that of the little-known king Tutankhamun. He had done his best without actually lying, to conceal this belief from Howard. One of the reasons why we had come to Egypt so much earlier than was our custom was to discover what plans Howard and his patron had made for the coming season. One look at Emerson's expressive countenance told me what I wanted to know. Despite the heartiness of his vociferous greetings, his saffirine eyes were dull, his well-cut lips set in a downward curve. Carnarvon had not abandoned his concession. However, Howard Carter appeared no more cheerful. Natalie dressed as was his habit in a tweed suit and bow tie, a cigarette holder in his hand, he addressed me with a rather stiff bow before assuming the seat I indicated. How nice to see you, Howard, I said. We tried several times this summer to communicate with you, but without success. Sorry, Howard muttered. I was in and out, you know, busy. I ran into him by accident at the office of the director, said Emerson, who had been haunting that spot for two days. He relapsed into gloomy silence. Ramses gave me a meaningful look and tried to revive the conversation. Like ourselves, you are out early this year, Carter. Had to be. The waiter approached with a tray. He had, with the efficiency one expects at Shepherds, noted our number and brought cups and biscuits for all. The area where I mean to excavate is very popular with tourists, Howard resumed. Want to get it over before they arrive in full force. Ah, said Ramses. So Lord Carnarvon has decided on another season. We had heard he was thinking of giving up the Furman. Emerson made a soft, growling sound, but Howard perked up a trifle. One more season at least. I persuaded him we must examine that small triangle we left unexcavated near Ramses the Sixth. Before we can claim, we have finished the job we set out to do. He glanced at Emerson and added, I have the professor to thank for that. Initially, his lordship was of the opinion that another season in the valley would be a waste of time. But when I told him that Professor Emerson had offered to take over the concession and my services, Carnarvon had second thoughts. Naturally, I said, managing not to look at Emerson. 
Well, Howard, we wish you good fortune and good hunting. When are you off to Luxor? Not for a while. I want to visit the antiquities dealers, though I don't suppose I will come across anything as remarkable as that statuette you found last year. I doubt you will, said Emerson, cheering up a bit. Howard asked about our own plans, and we thanked him for allowing us to continue working in the West Valley, which was probably part of his lordship's concession. After we had finished tea and Howard had taken his leave, I turned to Emerson. Don't say it, muttered my husband. Emerson, you know I would never reproach you for failing to follow my advice. I did warn you, however, that making that offer to Lord Carnarvon would have an effect contrary to what you had hoped. Given your reputation, your interest was bound to inspire a spirit of competition in... I told you, Emerson shouted. People at a nearby table turned to stare. Emerson glared at them, and they found other objects of interest. With a visible effort, he turned the glare into a pained smile directed at me. I beg your pardon, my dear Peabody. That brief moment of temper was the most encouraging thing I had seen for months. Ever since my near demise the previous spring, Emerson had treated me as if I were still on my deathbed. He hadn't shouted at me once. It was very exasperating. Emerson is never more imposing than when he is in a rage, and I missed our animated discussions. I smiled fondly at him. Oh, well, it is water over the dam. We will not discuss it further. Ramses, when are Nefret and the children due back from a tea? Ramses consulted his watch. They ought to have been here by now, but you know how difficult it is to extract the twins from their admirers in the village. You ought to have gone with them, said Emerson, still looking for someone to quarrel with. Nonsense, I said briskly. Selim and Daoud and Fatima went with them, which was only proper since they wanted to visit with their friends and kinfolk. They ought to be able to keep two five-year-olds from taking harm. It would take more than three or four people to keep Charla from doing something harmful to herself or others, said Emerson, darkly. In this assumption he was justified, since his granddaughter had a more adventurous spirit than her brother, and an explosive temper. However, it was not Charla who returned, cradled in the muscular arms of Daoud. We had returned to our sitting room in the hotel, and when Emerson saw David John limp as a dead fish and green-faced as a pea, he sprang up from his chair with a resounding oath. Hell and damnation, what is wrong with the boy? Dowd, I trusted you to. He's drunk, shouted David John's twin sister, her black eyes shining and her black curls bouncing as she jumped up and down with excitement. The boys gave him beer and dared him to drink it, she added regretfully. They wouldn't let me have any. They said it was only for men. David John, who was as fair as his sister was dark, raised a languid head. I wanted to know what it felt like. Well, now you know, I said, for of course I had immediately diagnosed the cause of the boy's malaise. It doesn't feel very nice, does it? Put him to bed, Daoud, and let him sleep it off. I'll do it, said Ramses, taking the limp little body from Daoud, whose face was a picture of guilt. Dowd is a very large man, with a very large face, so the guilt was extensive. Ramses gave him a slap on the back. It wasn't your fault, Dowd. From the quirk at the corner of his mouth, I knew he was remembering the time he had returned from the village after a similar debauch, though not in a similar condition. He had prudently rid himself of the liquor all over the floor of Selim's house before leaving the village. Are Selim and Fatima downstairs? I asked. They were afraid to come up, I suppose. Tell them it's all right, Dawood. I expect you were all busy watching Charla. But I was good, Charla informed us. She ran to her mother, who had sunk into a chair. Wasn't I, Mama? Not like David John? In a way, I couldn't blame her for gloating a trifle. Usually, she was the one who got in trouble. Nefret patted the child's dusty curls. No, you weren't. Climbing the palm tree was not a good plan. She got halfway up before Dowd plucked her down, she informed us. But I didn't get drunk, Mama. You must give her that, said Emerson, chuckling. 
Come and give Grandpapa a kiss, you virtuous young creature. She is absolutely filthy, Emerson, I said, catching hold of Charla's collar as she started to comply. Come along, Charla. We will have a nice long bath, and then Grandpapa will come in to kiss you goodnight. No, no, Fred, you sit still. You look exhausted. The advantage of having the children spend the day with Selim and Daoud's kin at the nearby village of Atiyah was that the Enterprise usually left them so tired they went to bed without a fuss. David John was already asleep when I turned Charla over to Fatima, assured the latter that we did not consider she had neglected her duty, and returned to the sitting room to join my husband and son. Emerson was pouring the whiskey. Owing in part to our early departure from England, we four were the only members of our staff in Egypt. In fact, we were currently the only members of the staff. Ramsay's best friend, David, our nephew by marriage, had finally admitted he would prefer to spend the winter in England with his wife, Leah, and their children, pursuing his successful career as an artist and illustrator. He had admitted this under pressure from me and over Emerson's plaintive objections. Emerson's brother Walter and his wife, my dear friend Evelyn, who had been out with us before, had given up active careers in the field. Walter's chief interest was in linguistics, and Evelyn was fully occupied with grandmotherhood. She had quite a lot of grandchildren. To be honest, I had rather lost track of the exact number, from Leah and their other sons and daughters. Other individuals whom we had hoped to employ the previous season had turned out to be murderers or victims of murder. A not uncommon occurrence with us, I must admit. Selim, our Egyptian foreman, was as skilled an excavator as most European scholars, and his crew had learned Emerson's methods. Still, in my opinion, we needed more people, particularly since I was determined to carry out my scheme of allowing Ramses and Nefret to spend the winter in Cairo, instead of joining us in Luxor. I hadn't proposed this to Emerson as yet, since I knew he would howl. Emerson is devoted to his son and daughter-in-law, as they are to him, but he tends to regard them as extensions of himself, with the same ambitions and interests. The dear children had given us loyal service for many years, and they were now entitled to pursue their own careers. I assumed that Emerson and I would be going on to Luxor, though I wasn't certain of that. Emerson had reverted to his infuriating habit of keeping his plan secret, even from me, until the last possible moment. That moment, in my opinion, had come. Very well, Emerson, I said, after a few refreshing sips of whiskey. The moment has come. You have had several interviews with the director of the Antiquities Service, and since you did not return from them in a state of profane exasperation, I presume Monsieur Lacour was agreeable to your request? What site has he allotted to us? You know, Emerson said, I told you before. No, you did not. The West Valley? inquired Ramses. Emerson, who had been anticipating the prolongation of suspense, looked chagrined. Um, yes, quite right. What about Carter and Carnarvon? I persisted. If their dig in the East Valley comes up empty, won't they want to move to the West Valley? It is properly part of their firman. If, that is to say, when they give up the East Valley, Carnarvon may decide to end the season, Emerson said. If they do continue, it will most likely be in the tomb of Amenhotep III. Carter made a very cursory excavation there in 1919. It's at the far end of the West Valley from the area in which we would be working. There's room for half a dozen expeditions. I seized my opening. It would make better sense for us to join forces with Cyrus Vandergeld at the Tomb of Eye. We are short on staff, and Cyrus has... A timid tap at the door interrupted me. Now who the devil can that be? Emerson demanded. I am ready for dinner. Where's Nefret? She'll be here directly, Ramsay said. She wanted to bathe and change. Answer the door, Emerson, I said, impatiently. The suffragi on duty outside bowed low and handed Emerson a slip of pasteboard. The gentleman is waiting, Father of Curses. He can damn well go on waiting, said Emerson, inspecting the card. Of all the impertinence, it's that rascal Montague Peabody. I won't see him. 
Emerson seldom wants to see anyone, but he had a particular animus against Sir Malcolm Page Henley de Montague. He was a wealthy collector of antiquities, a category to which my spouse objects on principle, and a very irritating man in his own right. I doubted that he had called upon us from motives of friendship. However, it is advantageous to discover the motives of such persons in order to guard oneself against their machinations. Now, Emerson, don't be rude, I said. We can't go down to dinner until the fret is ready, so we may as well hear what he has to say. Show him in, Ali. Sir Malcolm carried a silver-headed stick, not for support, but for swatting at the unfortunate Egyptian servants he employed. Carefully doffing his hat so as not to disturb his coiffured mane of white hair, he bowed and greeted us all in turn. It is good to see you back in Egypt, he began. Bah, said Emerson. What do you want? Pray take a chair, Sir Malcolm, I said, frowning at Emerson. We were about to go down to dinner, but we can spare you a few minutes. The door, which Ali had closed behind Sir Malcolm, opened again to admit Nefret. Her eyes widened at the sight of our visitor, but she extended her hand and let him bow over it. His look of admiration was justified. She looked very lovely, although the styles of that year were not nearly so pretty as they had been in my youth. The frock of a soft blue that matched her eyes had no sleeves, only narrow straps supporting a beaded bodice, and the skirt reached just below her knees. At least, she had not given in to the fad of cutting her hair short. Its red-gold locks were swept into a knot atop her head. "'I apologize for coming at an inopportune time,' said Sir Malcolm. "'Since I know the professor dislikes social conventions, I will come straight to the point.' "'May I ask where you intend to work this season?' "'The West Valley of the Kings,' said Emerson shortly. "'Not the East Valley? No. "'Then Carnarvon has not abandoned the concession? No. "'I was surprised that Emerson had not informed Sir Malcolm at the outset "'that it was none of his expletive business where we intended to excavate. "'He can control his temper when it is to his advantage to do so, "'and I realized that, like myself, he was curious about the gentleman's motives. "'Ah,' said Sir Malcolm, "'I would give a great deal to have the firman for that area.' "'Emerson shrugged and took out his watch. "'Sir Malcolm persisted. "'I believe you are of the same mind. "'You attempted to persuade Carnarvon to give up the concession to you, did you not?' "'Good God!' said Emerson.' his colour rising. Is there no end to gossip in this business? Where did you hear that? From an unimpeachable but necessarily anonymous source, said Sir Malcolm smoothly. Come, Professor, let us not fence. You believe Carter will find a tomb, specifically that of Tutankhamun. So do I. Emerson returned his watch to his pocket and stared fixedly at Sir Malcolm, after waiting in vain for a verbal reaction, Sir Malcolm was forced to continue. Evidence of such a tomb exists. You know it, and I know it. Theodore Davis believed he had found it, but he was wrong. That cache of miscellaneous objects was clearly left over materials from Tutankhamun's burial. The statuette that was in your possession last year obviously came from his tomb. Tomb 55... The only other East Valley tomb of the same period is directly across the way from the area Carter means to investigate. I do know that, said Emerson, impatiently. But the evidence, such as it is, is irrelevant. Carnarvon has the concession, and that is that. Sir Malcolm leaned forward. What if Lacour could be persuaded to revoke it? There was a moment of silence. Then Emerson said softly, By you? There are ways, Sir Malcolm murmured. He wouldn't award it to me, but he could hardly deny an excavator of your reputation. Supposing you could accomplish that, Emerson said, fingering the cleft in his chin. What would you want in return? Only the right to share the expenses and the uh, rewards, Sir Malcolm said eagerly. Emerson! I cried, unable to contain myself. You would not enter into such an immoral hush, Peabody. Emerson raised a magisterial hand. It seems to me, Sir Malcolm, that you are risking your influence on a very slim hope. 
even if such a tomb exists, even if it is in the area in question, the likelihood is that it was looted in antiquity, like all the other royal tombs. It's not much of a financial risk, Sir Malcolm declared. He thought he had won his case. His eyes shone with poorly concealed excitement. You, of all men, know it doesn't cost all that much to excavate here. Wages are low, and one can manage quite well without expensive equipment. Carnarvon may complain about getting a low return on his investment, but the return can't be measured in terms of objects found. It's the thrill of the hunt, the gamble. For a moment, Emerson's expressive countenance mirrored the enthusiasm that had transformed that of our visitor. Then he shook his head. The return is in terms of knowledge gained. Your protestations would be more convincing, Sir Malcolm, if you were not known as a rabid collector. I cannot participate in such a scheme. I bid you good evening. Sir Malcolm rose to his feet. I am staying here at the hotel, and I can be reached at any time. Good evening, said Emerson. Sir Malcolm smiled and shrugged and started for the door. Oh, he said, turning. It nearly slipped my mind. It is common knowledge that you are short-handed this year. I know a well-qualified fellow who... Good evening, Emerson shouted. Well, I exclaimed, after Ali had shown the gentleman out. What effrontery! Does the man never know when to give up? He is a collector, said Emerson, in the same tone in which he might have said he is a murderer. And he is still smarting about losing the statuette to Vandergelt. The little golden statue, which had been temporarily in our hands the year before, was certainly enough to inspire the lust of any collector. An exquisitely fashioned image of a king, it had been identified by us as that of the young Tutankhamun, stolen from his tomb shortly after his burial by a thief whose confession had miraculously survived among the papyri found by us at the workmen's village of Deir el-Medina. Tutankhamun's tomb was one of the few that had never been located, and Ramsay's translation of the papyrus had led Emerson to believe it yet lay hidden in the Royal Valley. He was not the only one to think so, as Sir Malcolm's offer proved. Do you suppose Sir Malcolm really has that much influence? I asked. Ramsay said thoughtfully, It's possible, but of course any collaboration with a man like that is out of the question. It would ruin your reputation, father. I am not such a fool as to be unaware of that, Emerson retorted. Besides, I added, you said last spring that you would leave the matter in the hands of fate. Fate appears to have made up her mind. It would be dishonorable to do anything more. I am not such a fool as to be unaware of that either, said Emerson, somewhat reproachfully. As for taking on a staff member recommended by him, I would as soon hire a damned journalist. Where did he get the notion that we need more people? I was about to tell him when Nefret jumped up. I'm ravenous. Shall we go down to dinner now? Emerson had had a trying day, what with one thing and another, so I attempted to keep the dinner conversation light and cheerful. It is a well-known fact that acrimony at mealtime adversely affects the digestion. Finding a neutral topic was not easy. Any mention of archaeology would remind Emerson of his failure to obtain the concession for the valley, and a discussion of family matters might start him complaining about David's absence. After we retired to our room, I assumed my most becoming dressing gown and settled myself at the toilet table to give my hair its usual one hundred strokes. Emerson likes to see my hair down, but even this did not rouse him from his melancholy mood. Instead of preparing for bed, he sat down in an armchair and took out his pipe. I wish you wouldn't smoke in our bedroom, I said. The smell permeates my hair. What's wrong with that? Emerson demanded. I like the smell of pipe smoke. But he laid the pipe aside without lighting it. I put down my brush and turned to face him. I am sorry, my dear, that Lord Carnarvon refused to yield to you. Don't rub it in, Emerson grumbled. 
The matter was more serious than I had supposed. More drastic methods were required. I went to him and sat down on his lap, my arms round his neck. Hmm, said Emerson, his dour expression lightening. That is very pleasant. What are you up to now, Peabody? Must I always have an ulterior motive when I invite my husband's attentions? In fact, I was about to thank you again for keeping your vow. You said last year, when I was so ill, that I would give up every damn tomb in Egypt if you were spared to me. Emerson's strong arms enclosed me. You are right to remind me, Peabody. I have been behaving badly. I shall not err in that fashion again. I felt quite certain that he would, but I gave him credit for good intentions, and gave him a little something else besides. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Insofar as Ramses was concerned, the sooner they left for Luxor, the better. Despite his claim of disinterest, Emerson was obviously up to no good. He spent more time than usual at the museum and the office of the Directorate of Antiquities, and he cultivated Howard Carter in a highly suspicious manner. The city itself had an uneasy feel. The official declaration of independence in February had satisfied no one. The High Commissioner, Lord Allenby, was vilified by the imperialists and the British government for giving too much power to Egypt. The Egyptian nationalists were furious with Britain for exiling their revered leader, Saad Zaglul. The king, Fuad, wanted to be an absolute monarch instead of being bound by the limits allowed him by the proposed constitution. Ramses was glad his friend David had not come out that year. David had been involved with one of the revolutionary groups before the war, and although his service to Britain since had won him a pardon, he was still devoted to the cause of independence. Some of his former associates held a grudge against him for what they considered his betrayal of their cause. Others wanted nothing more than to involve him in their plots and counterplots. His mother was plotting, too. Ramses began to get an idea of what she was up to when she announced she meant to give one of my popular little dinner parties. It had been a habit of hers to meet with their archaeological colleagues soon after their arrival in Egypt to catch up on the news, as she put it. The war had interrupted this pleasant custom because so many of their friends were on the front lines or engaged in work for the war office. When she announced her intentions... Emerson grumbled, but gave in without a struggle. Howard Carter was to be one of the guests. When they gathered in the elegant dining salon at Shepherd's, it was something of a shock to see so many new faces. The quibbles were friends from the old days, as was Carter, but many of the guests were of the new generation. Among them was Suzanne Malraux. She had come alone, and when he saw her standing in the doorway, Ramses went to welcome her. She was a wispy-looking little thing, with large, protuberant blue eyes and silvery fair hair so fine the slightest breeze lifted it around her small head. She made Ramses think of an astonished dandelion. He presented her to his wife and parents. Nefret's greeting was warm. She must have taken Suzanne's hesitation for shyness, and she always went out of her way to encourage career-minded young women. She was only too well aware of the difficulties they faced— after the trouble she herself had had in obtaining her medical degree and in starting a woman's hospital in Cairo. His mother was pleasant but less effusive. After subjecting Suzanne to a searching stare, she drew the girl aside and began to talk about her studies with Petrie. She managed to have private conversations with some of the other younger guests as well, and Ramses began to wonder what she was up to. His father was too busy with old friends to notice— Emerson objected to his wife's social engagements as a matter of form, but he generally had a roaring good time once they were underway. All in all, it was a successful affair, with champagne flowing freely and tongues wagging just as freely. Next day, Ramses managed to get his mother alone. She had taken up embroidery again and was stabbing at a grubby scrap of cloth when he joined her in the sitting room. Putting it aside with evident relief, she invited him to take a chair. "'A pleasant evening, was it not?' she inquired. "'Yes. 
Your father was impressed by Miss Marrow. I thought she stood up to his quizzing admirably. She's not the shrinking violet I had believed her to be, Ramses admitted. Coming alone took some courage. It was a declaration of her desire to be judged for herself, without the support of a man. Nefret liked her, too. Yes. Mother, you are scheming again. What is it this time? There's a very nice house to let in Rhoda. It has a large walled garden, servants' quarters, even a nursery. I see. He only wondered why he hadn't foreseen it. Watching him, she picked up the embroidery again and waited. Have you taken the place? he inquired. Goodness, no! I would never venture to do that without Nefret's and your approval. Mother, my dear boy. She leaned forward and fixed him with those steely grey eyes. It is time the children were in school. Time for Nefret to carry on her work at the hospital. Time for you to have... Time to concentrate on your interest in philology. Several of the young people we met last night are admirably qualified, including Miss Marrow. They can never replace you and Nefret, but they deserve a chance. And you, too, deserve the opportunity to pursue your own careers. Have you broached this scheme to father? Ramsay's thoughts were in a whirl. He had a pretty fair idea of how Nefret would react. She missed the hospital and the chance to practice surgery. And although she adored his parents, their constant presence was bound to be a burden at times. As for himself... I don't know, he said slowly. It would be such a change. I have to get used to the idea. Talk it over with Nefret. You needn't decide immediately. It is early in the year, and there are always houses to let. She smoothed out the scrap of embroidery and frowned at it. And it may take a while to convince your father. We can at least start out the season as usual, Ramsay said. In Luxor, you mean? She smiled with perfect understanding. Of course, you will want to revisit your old haunts and see old friends. The children won't like living in Cairo. I don't suppose they will, not at first. They've become accustomed to being the centres of their little universe. Not so little a universe at that, she amended, for it includes most of Luxor. They are becoming spoiled. The change would be good for their characters. Emerson might have lingered in Cairo had not two untoward events changed his mind. The first occurred when the entire family had gone to Giza for the day. The tourist season had barely begun, and the site was relatively uncrowded, but it offered innumerable opportunities for an adventurous child to get in trouble, with its open tomb pits and temptingly climbable pyramids. David John, who was developing a taste for Egyptology, stuck close to his grandfather, peppering him with questions, while the rest of them tried to keep close on Charla's heels. It took all three of them. We ought to have brought Fatima, Ramsay said to his mother, after he had plucked Charla from the first step of the Great Pyramid. How she had got up there he couldn't imagine. He had only turned his back for a minute, and the step-like blocks were almost three feet high. Fatima is no longer a young woman, said his mother. She cannot keep up with Charla. Charla, do not climb the pyramid. It is dangerous. Then you take me up, Charla pleaded, wrapping her arms round her father's waist. Her big black eyes, fringed with long lashes, were hard to resist, but Ramses shook his head. The idea of being responsible for his peripatetic daughter on that steep 400-foot climb made his hair stand on end. When you are older, perhaps. They returned in time for tea and handed the children over to Fatima for intensive washing. Ramses and Afret were about to follow their example when his mother burst into the room without so much as a knock. I beg your pardon, she said, seeing him shirtless and Nefret unlacing her boots, but this is important. Our rooms have been searched. What about yours? Ramses gazed helplessly round the room. Nefret stepped out of her boots and went to the bureau. He wouldn't notice unless his precious papers had been disturbed, she said. I think... Yes, mother, someone has been looking through this drawer. The paper lining is askew, and my underwear isn't folded as neatly. Perhaps it was the maid, Ramses suggested. His mother was prone to melodramatic fantasies. The maids don't go into drawers, his mother said. 
Is anything missing, Lefret? I don't think so. She opened her jewellery case. It's all here. What about you? His mother sat down and folded her hands. Emerson, of course, claims he is missing several important papers, but he's always losing things. Ramses had gone through the documents piled on his desk. Nothing is missing, but you're right. Someone has looked through them. Looking for what, do you suppose? Something small enough to be concealed under the drawer lining or in amongst one's uh, personal garments. That suggests a letter or paper. I can't imagine what it could be, Nefret said. You haven't received any strange messages or threatening letters, have you, Mother? Not so much as a mysterious treasure map. Dear me, how odd. Could it have been Sir Malcolm? Ramsay slipped back into his shirt. His mother clearly had no intention of leaving immediately. Her eyes were bright and her brow furrowed with thought. There is no reason to assume that, Ramsay said. You only want to catch him doing something illegal. Yes, certainly. I know he was responsible for several dirty tricks last year, though I wasn't able to pin anything on him. She looked immensely pleased with herself for working in these bits of modern slang. Ramses sympathised with her feelings. He didn't trust Sir Malcolm either, but he felt obliged to protest. What could he hope to find? Father hasn't any secret information about... A horrible thought struck him. Has he? If so, he has concealed it well. His mother didn't even look abashed at this implicit confession. In her opinion, Emerson had no business concealing anything from her, so she was entitled to use any means possible to discover what he was hiding. Let us see what information Ali can contribute. The Suffragi was unable to contribute anything. He had not seen anyone enter or leave their rooms. This proved only that the hypothetical intruder had been cautious enough to avoid him. Ali had a number of guests in his charge and was frequently absent from his post, attending to their requests. His missing papers having been located by his exasperated wife, Emerson was not inclined to take the matter seriously. It was the second incident that convinced him. At Nefret's strongly worded request, the party left for Luxor a few days later. The request followed Charla's escape from the hotel in the company of Ali the Suffragi. They had been seen leaving the hotel, but no one knew where they had gone afterward. It was late afternoon before the guilty pair returned. Charla was indescribably dirty, smeared with sugary substances, and completely unrepentant. Ali, who had obviously begun to have second thoughts about his seduction, went into hiding in a broom closet, from which Ramses dragged him by the collar. "'She is not injured,' said Charla's grandmother, holding her off at arm's length. "'Ali wouldn't let anyone hurt me,' Charla shouted. He only did what I told him. We went to the souk, and a nice man gave me money, and we bought whatever I wanted. Nice man, Ramses repeated. What was his name? He said he was a friend of Grandpapa's. She couldn't remember his name or what he looked like. Under questioning, Ali could only say that he was dressed like a hawaji, and that he had graying hair. The father of Curses has many friends he insisted. He knew you. He asked about all the family. The repentant Ali was let off with a stern warning, since, as Nefret pointed out, it was primarily Charla's fault. She took ruthless advantage of his fondness for children and his awe of a member of the father of Curse's family. Let's go on to Luxor as soon as possible. It's easier to keep track of the twins when they're in their own home. When the windows are barred and the entire household knows their little tricks... Ramses agreed. Fatima, who hadn't let go of David John since his sister turned up missing, let out a heartfelt groan of agreement. Officially, she was housekeeper, not nursery maid, and although Ramses didn't know her precise age, she was no longer a young woman. It took several people in the prime of life to keep up with the twins. Their house in Kent had been their English base for many years, its rose gardens lovingly tended by his mother, its grounds haunted by the descendants of the cats they had brought back from Egypt.'
Yet, in a sense, returning to Luxor was coming home. It certainly was for his mother. If home is where the heart is, as she kept remarking, hers was in the ruins of the imperial city of ancient Egypt. Except for brief interludes at other sites, this was, he tried to remember, their twenty-third season at Thebes. Or was it longer? She had, he thought sentimentally, grown old here, though he would never have used that word to her. She had built a house, and another for Nefret and him, made friends and lost them, discovered treasure, and dug through tons of sand. It wasn't quite the same for him, but when they stepped out of the train, he felt a surge of, well, call it satisfaction. Their progress through the familiar streets of Luxor was slowed by hails from old friends and a few old foes. The sun was high in a cloudless sky when they reached the riverbank. The Nile flowed quick and swollen. It had reached maximum flood stage and would soon be subsiding, though, thanks to modern barrages and dams, its flow was now controlled so that water could be supplied during the formerly dry months of the summer. The temperature was unpleasantly hot for October, and Emerson, who had the constitution of a camel, was the only one who didn't keep mopping perspiration from his face. The twins were beside themselves with excitement, and it took all the adults to keep them from falling overboard. Leaving their baggage in the willing hands of men waiting on the west bank, they set out along the road that led through the cultivation and into the desert. The house his mother had caused to be built had a comfortable settled look, with green vines and blooming roses framing the arcaded windows of the veranda. The garden she had tended with such determination formed another patch of green behind and to one side. Through the trees he could see the walls of his and Nefret's house. Every brick and every bloom was his mother's creation. It was no wonder she cherished it. Cheers from the assembled household staff came to their ears, but the first to greet them was the dog, Amira, who flung herself at the feet of the twins, howling rapturously. Ramses had believed and hoped she wouldn't get any bigger, but she had, and after a summer of pampering, she was sleek and well-fed and almost as large as a lioness. The great cat of Ray did not believe in vulgar displays of emotion. He waited for them inside the house and showed his annoyance at their absence by sitting with his back turned, ostentatiously ignoring them for several hours, his plumy tail swishing. Their other cats had usually travelled back and forth with them, but the great cat of Ray had made it clear that he did not care for travel, by sea or by land. When the tea tray arrived, he decided to overlook their transgressions and settled down at Ramsay's feet. Sometimes there were fish paste sandwiches. They had gathered on the veranda, as was their usual habit, watching the soft glow of paling colour on the eastern cliffs. Lights began to twinkle in Luxor, across the river, and the long stretch of sandy ground in front of the house was deserted, except for a few shadowy forms of local villagers on their way home from the fields. Even the twins were subdued, having worn themselves out playing with the dog and rushing from room to room to make sure everything was where they had left it. The peace of Luxor, Ramses thought, and then smiled to himself. Their peace had been often disturbed, sometimes violently. Reminded of one of the most flagrant disturbers of the peace, he asked, Where's father? His mother was pouring the tea. She handed him a cup before she replied. He sneaked, I use the word intentionally, out of the house shortly after we arrived, ignoring my courteous request that he get his papers and books in order. I do not know where he went. Ramses handed the cup to Nefret and went back to get one for himself. You can guess, though, he said. When Emerson turned up, half an hour late for tea, he didn't deny the charge. Why, yes, he said innocently. I did go to the East Valley for a quick look round. What were you looking for? his wife asked. Nothing in particular, Peabody, nothing in particular. I suppose you will want to go to the West Valley tomorrow. What's the hurry? inquired Emerson, who was always in a hurry. Vandergelt won't be here for a few more days, and we ought to consult with him before we begin. 
It is his concession, after all. He shifted uneasily under his wife's steady stare and went on. I thought I would spend a little time getting the motor car back in operation. Selim believes he has diagnosed the difficulty. He has brought several new parts from Cairo. That is, if you have no objections, my dear. What possible objection could I have, aside from the fact that Selim is our rice, in charge of our excavations, not a mechanic, and the additional fact that a motor car has limited utility here? The motor car had been a bone of contention between them from the first. Her point was well taken. There were a few usable roads on the West Bank, but her chief objection was that Emerson knew absolutely nothing about the internal workings of the vehicle but was under the mistaken impression that he did. She was primed for an argument, cheeks flushed and eyes accusing, but Emerson refused to be provoked. I won't let it interfere with our work, Peabody. Come now, my love, he went on, with one of his most winning smiles. You know, we always spend a little time reacquainting ourselves with our favorite sights and determining what has gone on since we were last here. Aren't you the least bit curious about that final little triangle Carter proposes to excavate. Idle curiosity is not one of my failings, Emerson. However, since you are so determined, who am I to stand in your way? Emerson's eyes twinkled. He recognized hypocrisy when he heard it. We'll make a day of it, he declared. Take the kiddies. You'd like to see the Valley of the Kings again, wouldn't you, my dears? He patted Charla's curly head a familiarity she permitted from no one else. She nodded eagerly, visualizing, her father felt certain, a large picnic basket. David John was also pleased to indicate his agreement. They made quite an imposing caravan when they started off the next morning, the children on their favorite donkeys and the adults on horseback. Leaving their mounts in the donkey park by the entrance, they passed the barrier into the archaeological zone. The East Valley was not a single canyon, but a web of them, with smaller wadis leading off on either side of the main path. Bounded on all sides by towering cliffs, and the hills of rocky debris washed down by rain or tossed out by excavators, ancient and modern, it was a waterless waste that had once held treasure beyond imagining. On either side, the rectangular openings of the royal tombs of the Empire gaped open, and forlorn, robbed of the rich grave goods that had been meant to provide the dead kings with all the luxuries they had enjoyed in life. Only tantalizing scraps of their gilded and bejeweled equipment had survived. For the convenience of tourists, the once uneven floor of the wadis had been smoothed, and access to the most popular tombs made easier. Some were even illumined by electric lights, provided by a generator in one of the sepulchres. Tourists brought money, not only to the Department of Antiquities, but to the dragomen and guides who earned their livings from them. But Ramses sometimes regretted the old days, when visitors had to scramble up the uneven rock surfaces and carry candles through the deep-cut passages of the tombs. One thing hadn't changed. Above the valley rose the pyramid-shaped peak representing the goddess Metzger, she who loves silence. The mighty pyramids of the kings of old lay empty and violated when the monarchs of Thebes determined to abandon ostentation in favor of secrecy, hiding their burial places deep in the cliffs and building temples elsewhere to serve their funerary cults. Emerson believed the shape of the mountain served as a substitute for the pyramid, a symbol of the sun god and of survival after death. You see the advantage of coming out early in the season, Emerson declared. Not so many cursed tourists. Charla, stay with me. I won't have you wandering off alone. The tourists were less numerous than they would be later on, but there were a number of them. They observed the caravan's procession with open curiosity, and a buzz of whispered comments followed its progress. Dragomen and guards gathered round the twins, chuckling with pleasure as the children returned their greetings in Arabic, as fluent as their own. Ramses didn't have to worry about carrying one or both of the twins. A dozen willing hands reached for Charla when she fluttered her lashes and declared she was tired. 
She isn't tired, said David John in disgust, watching his sister hoisted onto the shoulder of a beaming dragoman. She just likes being high above the rest of us. Ramses deemed it wiser to ignore this accurate appraisal. David John, having made his point, did not pursue it. He slipped his hand into that of his father. Just remind me, if you will, of the relative location of the tombs in this area, he requested. Amused by the contrast between the high-pitched voice and the pedantic speech, Ramses said, Remind you, you haven't been here very often, David John. How much do you remember? Naturally, I have studied the maps and the books, Papa. There, I believe, is the entrance to Tomb 55, where you worked last season. A most frustrating excavation. The entrance had been filled in, as was Emerson's custom when finishing an excavation. Only an uneven surface of sand and pebbles marked the spot. Obediently, Ramses indicated the other nearby tombs, Ramses the Ninth, and across the way, on the hillside, that of another obscure Ramses, awarded the number six by modern historians. There is certainly a great deal yet to be done here, said his son judiciously. What is Grandpapa looking at so intently? The remains of workmen's huts. Not very impressive, are they? They were nothing more than seemingly random heaps of rough stones. Only an expert eye would have recognized them as the temporary living quarters of men who had worked on the nearby royal tombs, or understood, as Ramses was beginning to do, why Emerson stared at them with such interest. Chala had forged ahead of the others, urging her grinning bearer on with shouts of glee. Her grandmother clucked disapprovingly. Ramses, she is becoming a positive little slave driver. Make her stop. Emerson had also observed the situation, and by the time Ramses reached his daughter, his father had already caught her up and was lecturing both Chala and the man who carried her. I told you you were not to get away from the rest of us, he said sternly. And you, what is your name? I don't know you. The man was a stranger to Ramses as well. A tall, well-set-up fellow with a narrow face and protruding jaw. Mahmud, father of curses, he said readily. I came here from Medamud because I heard you would be hiring workers. I have two wives and thirteen children, and... Yes, yes, said Emerson. See my Raish Selim. You know him, of course. All men know Selim, father of curses. My thanks. Charla propelled herself into Emerson's outstretched arms. He set her on her feet. It won't do you any harm to walk a while, he declared. Take my hand. He was a nice man, said Charla, unrepentant. He ran very fast when I told him to. You must not treat people like beasts of burden, Ramses said. I hope you thanked him properly. Chala looked round, but the nice Mahmoud was no longer in sight. They had their picnic lunch in the mouth of an empty tomb, and then returned to the house. David John's fair skin was turning pink, despite the hat his mother insisted he wear, and both children were drooping a little from the heat. They considered themselves far too old for afternoon naps, but they were receptive to the idea of a quiet hour in their room. Nefret went to her clinic. The news of her arrival had spread, and a number of patients had turned up. Hers was the only clinic on the West Bank, and Nur Misur, Light of Egypt, as Nefret was called, had earned the loving respect of the villagers. Some of the older men still preferred the medical and magical skills of her mother-in-law, who decided to accompany her. Ramses found himself alone on the veranda with his father. Odd that, he said. The helpful Mahmoud? Emerson gestured him to a chair and took out his pipe. I might have known you'd wonder too. I am wondering about a number of things. Emerson turned to look down the road to the little guardhouse they had built the year before. It was a humble mud-brick shelter designed to discourage uninvited visitors. Wasim, the man on duty that day, squatted in the open doorway, placidly smoking his water pipe. I had a word with Wasim, Emerson went on. 
I thought he was looking pleased with himself, and he frankly admitted having extracted a tidy amount of bakshish from a fellow who was asking questions about recent visitors. A fellow named Mahmoud? The description didn't match. Wasim said he spoke Arabic fluently, but with a strange accent. Odd, Ramses repeated. What did Wasim tell him? The truth, O oh father of curses, that we have had no visitors since we arrived. We're being watched. It seems that way, Emerson agreed. People hanging about the vicinity of the house at odd hours last night. You noticed, too? I was tempted to go out and run them off, but... But they weren't doing anything illegal, Emerson finished. Quite. This sheds rather a new light on your mother's claim that our rooms in Cairo were searched. And on the amiable Mahmoud? Emerson frowned. He can't have hoped to carry the child off, not with so many people about. But he might have asked her the same questions the other man asked Wasim. She's a chatty little creature. Did she tell you what they chatted about? Ramses laughed. That's the disadvantage of Charles' chattiness. She doesn't answer questions or even hear them. She carries on a monologue. Anyhow, we haven't had any visitors. True. It's all very tenuous, Father. A possible search of our rooms, an unknown person asking possibly harmless questions of Wasim, a postulated but unproven attempt to question Charla. Two such attempts, Emerson corrected. We never identified the nice man who gave her money in the souk. We may be letting our imaginations run away with us. Possibly. Emerson chewed on the stem of his pipe. Better safe than sorry, though, as your mother would say. If there is any basis to our suspicions, the suspects will have to try something more direct sooner or later. At the moment, we can only wait and see. There are too many possibilities to allow speculation. Emerson chuckled. Perhaps it's Howard Carter, suspecting me of designs on his Furman. It wasn't until the following afternoon that Emerson's prediction proved correct. The message wasn't from Howard Carter, however. The old familiar anonymous letter, Ramses said, perusing the paper his father handed him. Does Mother know about this? Good God, no, and she mustn't find out. She'd insist on coming with us. You mean to respond? This is an open invitation to an ambush, father. It's an invitation to a solution, Emerson retorted. I'm tired of subterfuge and mystery. I cannot conceive of any danger the two of us couldn't handle. The implicit compliment was so flattering, Ramses abandoned his half-hearted objections. Emerson was an army unto himself, but as the saying went, a friend does not leave a friend's back exposed. He said only, how do you propose to get away from Mother and the fret? Hmm. Emerson frowned. That does present a difficulty. Have you any suggestions? We might try telling them the truth. Good God, are you serious? Emerson thought it over. It's a new approach, at any rate. Somewhat to Ramsay's surprise, it succeeded. Emerson waited until after dinner to break the news. His wife had also noticed the surveillance to which they'd been subjected, or so she claimed. She always claimed to know everything, and who would have the timidity to call her a liar? In this case, it was a tactical error, of which Emerson took immediate advantage. The fellow didn't tell me to come alone, but we cannot suppose he will appear if the whole lot of us turn up. I take you into my confidence, Peabody, and you, Nefret, because you know that to be true. I trust in your good sense, as you must trust in mine. Bah, said his wife. She had taken out her embroidery, and in her agitation she stuck a needle into her finger. Sucking it, she said indistinctly, Fred, what do you think? I don't like it one damned bit, mother, but... Her voice trailed off. Think of the children, Emerson said. If we don't respond, these people may go after them next. She had thought of it. Her eyes were wide and her cheeks a trifle paler than usual. It was the only argument that could have convinced her, but her distress was so obvious that Ramses couldn't refrain from protesting. That's a low, underhanded trick, father. The children are amply protected. Any guard can be circumvented, his mother said, and Charla is too inclined to trust a friendly face. 
Nefret, I believe we must let them go, and that we must remain, on the remote chance that this is a trick to get us all out of the house. Emerson's jaw dropped. She was one step ahead of him, as usual. Now, see here, everybody, he began. Oh, I don't believe for a moment that any such thing will happen, she said soothingly. In fact, she was half hoping it would. Her hands were clenched, as if around the handle of a weapon, and her lips were curved in a little smile. Do you go on, then, you and Ramses, and for pity's sake, don't behave foolishly? That didn't work out the way I expected, Emerson muttered, as he and Ramses started toward the river bank. You don't think there's a chance? No, father, I don't. Let's get this over. Dowd's son, Sabir, took them across to the east bank. Emerson told him to wait, and they started for the rendezvous point, by the entrance to the Temple of Luxor. The gate was closed, but a nearby light showed the form of the man they had been told to expect, wearing a galabilla with a distinctive red-striped scarf over his shoulders. As soon as he was sure they had spotted him, looking away from the temple. "'Shall we take him?' Ramses asked. "'No, no. He can't be the only one involved. Wait till we can get our hands on the rest of them.' Emerson's teeth closed with a snap. They followed the flitting form of their guide through the streets of the tourist areas, past the Luxor Hotel, where coloured lanterns swung from the trees of the garden and into the back alleys of the city. Ramses moved closer to his father. This is beginning to look like a bad idea, he said softly. Quite the contrary. Emerson didn't bother to lower his voice. The more insalubrious the surroundings, the greater the chance that something interesting will occur. Are you armed? Me? Good God, no. Why should I be? He stumbled. Ramses caught him by the arm. His eyesight was better than his father's, and there was very little light here. The form ahead of them was as insubstantial as a shadow, vanishing and reappearing whenever a ray of moonlight found its way into the narrow alleyway. Then it seemed to fade into the darkness and was gone. Emerson came to a halt. Where's he got to? Ramses took his torch from his pocket. Its beam failed to locate their guide or anyone else. The buildings on either side were those of small shops, closed for the night. Some had living quarters above, but no lights showed. The windows and doors were barred. But just ahead, a shape of blackness indicated an open door. Ah, said Emerson, and plunged ahead before Ramses could stop him. He caught Emerson up at the door and pointed his torch into the room beyond. At first he saw nothing to cause alarm. A counter, shelves holding tinned and packaged food, boxes of wilting lettuce and dried lentils, open bags of staples such as flour and sugar, a few stools. The door slammed into his back and propelled him against Emerson, who staggered forward into the room, knocking over a stool. Stop there, ordered a voice in Arabic. Put out the light. Ramses didn't bother to turn round. He could sense their presence behind him. Two men. No, three. And the door had closed with a depressingly solid sound. Don't switch it off, Emerson ordered. No, sir, said Ramses, who'd had no intention of doing so. There were three more men behind the counter. They were muffled in long, enveloping robes and the scarves wound round their heads and faces concealed everything except their eyes. One of them flinched and raised a hand to his brow as the torch beam found him. Turn it off, he repeated. Here is light enough. He struck a match and lit a lamp, an earthenware bowl filled with oil with a floating wick. Carrying it, he came out from behind the counter, staying at a safe distance, and motioned them to one side. No, Ramses inquired in English. We may as well find out what this is all about. No sense in starting a row if we don't have to. Backing away, Emerson went on in Arabic. Is it money you want? The leader spat on the floor. We have been paid. We want information. No harm will come to you if you tell us. The fellow wasn't a good strategist, Ramses thought. He and his father were in a better position with their backs against the wall or rather, against the motley collection of goods that hung from hooks or filled various sacks. The six confronted them in a rough semicircle. No sign of a firearm, but all six had knives. How do I know I can trust you not to harm us? Emerson asked. His voice quavered a little. 
Ramses smiled to himself. The man must be a fool if he believed the father of curses could be so easily intimidated. He wasn't a fool, nor were the others. They stood their ground, and the leader's voice hardened. Do not play games with me. Where is he? Who? Emerson inquired curiously. You know. Speak, or my knife will drink your heart's blood. Now that is nonsense, Emerson declared. What good would that do you? The leader's laugh was probably meant to sound sinister. He would come to avenge you, and then he would be at my mercy. Emerson let out a snort of amusement. Feet apart, hands in his pockets, he seemed perfectly at ease. You sound like my wife. I might consider an exchange of information. Who paid you to lure us here? One of the men plucked urgently at the sleeve of the leader. Ramses, whose hearing was excellent, understood a few words of the whispered comment. He will not fool's errand. The other henchmen shared his doubts. They began backing away. They were all now between the Emersons and the door. One last chance, the leader said. Will you speak? Certainly not, said Emerson, tiring of the game. He took his hands out of his pockets. They were empty, but nonetheless lethal for that, as all men in Egypt knew. Ramses drew his knife, prepared to get between his father and the leader. Before he could move, the man flung the lamp onto the floor. The pottery shell smashed, spraying oil. Flames leaped up, feeding on the spilled oil and the scraps of paper and other debris. Their assailants piled out the door, yelling in alarm. The leader was the last to go. Burn, then, he shouted, melodramatic to the last. If you change your mind, call out and we will free you. The door slammed. Chapter Two From Manuscript H Continued Ramses jumped back away from the flames, licking at his feet. The fire was between them and the door. He didn't doubt it was locked or barred in some way, and he didn't believe for a moment that their attackers would hang about long enough to reply to a call for help. Shall we go? he asked. <clears throat> said Emerson. His face was a devilish mask of black shadow and flickering red light. Can't let the place burn, can we? Your mother would not approve of such irresponsible behavior. As he spoke, he picked up one of the half-filled sacks and upended its contents onto the fire. Ramses opened his mouth to protest and then realized that, of course, Emerson had selected the one substance available that would smother the fire without feeding it. Salt. A cloud of acrid-smelling smoke arose. A few last flickering flames awoke crystalline sparkles in the white heap. Coughing and swearing, Emerson stamped out the flames, leaving the room in darkness except for the beam of Ramsay's torch. We must make certain the shopkeeper and his family haven't been harmed, he said, and led the way toward the back of the shop. A curtained doorway behind the counter led to a storage room and a narrow flight of stairs. The rooms on the first floor were unoccupied except for one whose door was held fast by a wooden wedge. Emerson pulled it out and opened the door, to be greeted by wails and shrieks from a group of people huddled together in the far corner. It is I, the father of curses, Emerson bellowed over the uproar. He took Ramsay's hand and turned the torch onto his own face. You are safe. The evil men have gone. It took a while to calm the terrified family, man and wife, aged grandmother, and six children. Emerson had to take the old lady by the shoulders and shake her before she stopped screeching. Gently, father, Ramsay said in alarm. Ah, said Grandma, subsiding. It is indeed the strong hands of the father of curses. Alhamdulillah, he has saved us. They knew nothing of the men who had burst into the shop as it was closing and herded them upstairs. The intruders had threatened to cut their throats if they called out or tried to escape. Relief changed to groans when they saw the mess in the shop. A full bag of salt, the owner groaned. It was worth ten pounds. The bag had only been half full, and it wasn't worth a tenth of the price he had mentioned, but Emerson dispensed coins with a lavish hand. 
On the whole, the family had probably made a profit from the affair, as their smiling faces indicated. As Ramses had expected, there was no sign of their attackers. Roused by the disturbance, the neighbors had turned out to help and lingered to find out what was going on. Several of them claimed to have seen sinister figures, robed in black, like a fritz, running away from the shop. The descriptions included long fangs and burning red eyes. In other words, no one had seen anyone. Emerson handed out more coins to the wide-eyed children in the crowd and patted a few on the head. They were unable to escape their admirers until the shopkeeper and grandma had finished telling everyone about the hideous dangers from which they had been saved by the father of curses and the brother of demons. Ramses had never been entirely certain whether this Egyptian epithet was meant as a compliment. After assuring the audience that the evil men would not return, they made their way back to the river. Damn, said Emerson. Did you get a good enough look at any of them to be able to recognize him again? One of them had a scar on his jaw. I saw it when the scarf slipped. But I doubt they'll stay around to be identified. They're a ruthless lot. Do you think they'd actually have let the place burn with those poor devils locked in upstairs? My dear boy, you exaggerate. The family could have got out the window at any time, and the fire was no more than a distraction to keep us from following them. If they had meant us harm, they'd have jumped us as soon as we entered the room. Six to two are reasonably good odds. All in all, I would say they were among the less competent of the opponents we have encountered over the years. You know who they're after, don't you? One name leaps to mind, Emerson admitted. What the devil do you suppose he's been up to? This ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Between concern for her husband and fear for the children, Nefret was understandably uneasy. I prescribed a glass of warm milk and would have slipped a little laudanum into it if she hadn't been watching me closely. Really, I said, it was too bad of Emerson to imply there was danger to the children. I should be with them, Nefret murmured. If you pop into their room at this hour, you will alarm them unnecessarily. The dog is outside their window, and I sent Jamad to stand in the corridor. Now, come to the sitting room. There is no use trying to sleep until they get back. No one else was asleep. The servants knew what was going on. They always do. Fatima hovered, offering food and a variety of drinks. Nefret was finally persuaded to drink her milk, nicely seasoned with cardamom and nutmeg. Has Ramses discussed the idea of your spending the winter in Cairo? I asked, in an attempt to turn her thoughts to a less worrisome subject. Nefret nodded. She had, at my urging, assumed a comfortable dressing gown and slippers. I myself lifted her feet onto a hassock and put a pillow behind her. She smiled faintly and pushed a loosened lock of golden hair away from her face. Yes, we talked about it. He's torn, Mother. And so am I. We love Luxor and our house and the family. But I begin to wonder whether we might be better off. Safer, you mean. It is true that we seem to attract unprincipled persons. I sipped my whiskey. Warm milk is all very well for some, but there is nothing like a whiskey and soda for calming the nerves. The minutes pass slowly when one is concerned for loved ones. I made an effort. We discussed various candidates for the staff and agreed that two in particular stood out, Miss Malro and a young Egyptian, Naji Farid. Nefret made an effort too, but as the slow seconds ticked by, she fell silent, her golden head bowed. Fatima dozed in her chair. I was not at all drowsy. Having finished my whiskey, I rose and tiptoed out of the room. The veranda was dark, the door barred on the inside. I stood there for a time, looking out across the stretch of moon-silvered sand. Nothing moved along the road to the river. Then I became aware of an indistinct form just outside, half concealed by the twining roses. The sharp turn of my head brought an immediate response. It is I, said Akim. Selim, I whispered, what are you doing here? Standing guard, said, why did you not send for me? Fatima did, I suppose. Yes, I'm sorry you were disturbed. It was unnecessary. He replied with one of his father's favorite adages, there is no harm in protecting oneself from that which does not exist, said. 
It would bring shame upon us if we failed to keep you safe. You have never failed us. You may as well be comfortable, Selim. Come in and keep me company. I unbarred the door. He slipped soundlessly in. In the dim starlight, I saw the gleam of the knife at his belt. We sat in companionable silence, waiting until a faint sound turned our eyes toward the door of the house. At the sight of the white form in the doorway, Selim let out a stifled cry. "'It is only Nefret,' I said. "'Dear girl, I had hoped you were asleep.' "'Selim?' she peered at him through the darkness. "'I might have expected you would be here. It's all right. They'll be home soon.' I didn't ask how she knew— Dearly though I loved her, I found Nefret a bit uncanny at times. Since they were children, she had always known when Ramses was in imminent danger. A fear, a feeling, a nightmare, as she had once put it. So strong was that bond that it had never misled her, and I had seen it demonstrated often enough to believe in it, as I believed in my dreams of Abdallah. She sat quietly, hands folded in her lap, and eyes turned to the screened window beside her. My eyes were not as keen as they once had been. I was the last to see the two tall forms coming with long strides along the road. They are unharmed, Selim said, with a sigh of relief. Ah, there you are, said Emerson, looking in. Selim, too. Excellent. Let us have some light, eh? And perhaps a refreshing drop of whiskey. We deserve it, I believe. You weren't worried, were you? Ramses asked, putting his arm round his wife. Oh, not at all, she replied, and slipped away from him in order to help Fatima light the lamps. Ramses looked at her uncertainly and then went into the house, returning with the drinks tray. Everything all right here? Emerson asked, settling himself in a comfortable chair and stretching his legs. There is not a stranger within half a mile, Selim replied, stroking his beard. We made certain of that. You had no trouble? Oh, not at all, I said, echoing the fret. Emerson, what have you done to your new boots? And the bottoms of your trousers are scorched, and I'll tell you all about it if you stop fussing, Peabody. He took the glass Ramses handed him, nodded his thanks, and launched into his tail. No one was hurt, he finished. And the damage was minimal. Not a bad night's work. Taken all in all. You let them get away, I said. Emerson gave me a reproachful look. Now, Peabody, don't be critical. We couldn't go after the bastards until we were certain there was no danger to the place or its occupants. I beg your pardon, Emerson, I said. You are quite right. It's a pity you didn't recognize any of them. I wouldn't say it was a good night's work. If you'll forgive me, said my husband, with excessive politeness, you are missing the point, Peabody. We learned something very important tonight. We now know what these fellows are after. Or should I say, who? You should say, whom, Emerson. No one spoke the name aloud, but we all knew whom he meant. Of all our acquaintances, the one most likely to attract the attentions of unprincipled persons was Emerson's half-brother, Seth, better known by his nom de cream of Sethos. He had, before I reformed him, been in charge of a criminal network of antiquitous thieves. He had assured me he had long since abandoned that profession, but he might not have been able to resist temptation if a prize fell in his way. Were the prize great enough, a rival might be after him. His current role as an agent of British intelligence might also have led him into danger. The Secret Service is part of a dark and murky underworld, whose occupants are not bound by the ordinary rules of society. Selim was one of the few who knew Sethos's identity and occupation. He had encountered Emerson's renegade brother under circumstances that made it impossible to conceal the truth from him, even if we had not had complete confidence in his discretion. His handsome features set in a thoughtful frown, he said, So, what has he done to anger these people, and who are they? That is the matter in a nutshell, Selim, I agreed. 
Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to either question. There is another question, said Selim, pleased at my compliment. Why would they think he had come here? Now that is a point I hadn't considered, I admitted. He has friends and bolt holes all over the Middle East. He wouldn't lead enemies to us, Nefret said. Not unless he was desperate, Ramses muttered. Nefret gave him a quick look. It seems to me, she snapped, that this discussion is getting out of hand. It's all conjecture, including the assumption that he is the man these people are after. It is the most reasonable assumption, Ramses said. He and his uncle had never got on. Father is right, Nefret. Our encounter tonight made it clear these people are looking not for an object, but for a man, not one of us, nor one of our friends. Their whereabouts are known. Who else could it be? Nefret bowed her head. She would have defended Sethos, for whom she had a certain weakness, but the reasoning was compelling. I was under the impression that you and he kept in touch, Emerson, I said. Don't you know where he is? I haven't heard from or about him for months, Emerson said. Then I suggest you endeavor to find out what has become of him, a wire to his superior, that Mr. Smith. Brace girdle boy's dragon, Ramses corrected. I can't be bothered to remember that absurd name, I said. His alias is unimaginative, but easier to pronounce. You might also telegraph Margaret, Emerson. Surely Sethos's wife must know where he is. I don't know where she is either, Emerson grumbled. It's the damnedest marriage I've ever seen. Margaret, off to one corner of the world, covering a news story, and he in another corner, doing God knows what. They've been married less than a year. They were uh, together for several years before their marriage, I said. Margaret is deservedly proud of the success she has achieved in her journalistic career, and his present occupation is not one a wife can share. He wouldn't allow it, Nefret said. It would be too dangerous for her and for him, and wouldn't the Official Secrets Act prohibit him from confiding in her? We can but try, I said, rising. I will wire her and Mr. Smith first thing tomorrow. Go to bed, Fatima. We will tidy up in the morning. Good night, Selim, and thank you. Sending the wires would serve another purpose, or at least I hoped it would. Those who were on the trail of Sethos would not hesitate to bribe the clerks at the telegraph office. If they learned we were ignorant of Sethos's whereabouts, they might turn their attention elsewhere. Emerson pooh-poohed this idea as soon as I mentioned it, which I did the following morning at breakfast. You underestimate their persistence and their intelligence, I believe, he said, cutting savagely into his bacon. The men we encountered were ordinary thugs, but there is a cleverer mind behind this. There must be. We may be able to prove he has not communicated with us thus far. But what's to prevent him from doing so in the future? He certainly wouldn't be fool enough to telegraph us. He is fully aware of the fact that the clerks gossip with all of Luxor. He had made a point, and I was prompt to admit it. The replies to our wires were unsatisfactory. The telegram to Mr. Smith had been carefully couched, referring to Sethos as our mutual friend. Smith's answer was brief and to the point. Have no idea, do you? Margaret's newspaper, the Morning Mirror, informed us she was on assignment and could not be reached. That sounds ominous, I remarked. You don't suppose she's running around with the Bolsheviks, do you? It would be like her, Ramses said. The woman will stop at nothing in pursuit of a story. Remember the time she sallied into Hayil and was taken prisoner by the Rashid? I detect a certain note of vexation in Mr. Smith's reply, I said, studying the brief message. I don't detect anything, except that he's unable or unwilling to give us information, Emerson growled. We've come to a dead end, and I, for one, intend to forget the whole business. He tossed his napkin onto the table and rose. Who is coming to the valley with me? No one, Emerson. The Vandergelts arrived this morning, and we're going to meet the train. Yes, my dear, you too. There was quite a crowd waiting at the station. Gullabillas flapped and turbans bobbed up and down. Cyrus was a generous employer and very popular. 
When the train stopped and his smiling face appeared at the window, a cheer arose. Cyrus swept off his fine Panama hat and bowed in response. Winter spent in Egypt's sunny clime had turned our American friend's face lined and leathery, and his sandy hair and goatee were sprinkled with silver. But he jumped out of the train with the agility of a young man. Though without formal training in archaeology, unlike other wealthy individuals who sponsored excavations as a form of amusement, Cyrus was no dilettante. He had always worked side by side with his crew and listened respectfully to the advice of my distinguished spouse. Turning, he offered his hand to his wife, Catherine. I observed that she had gained a bit more weight. Her cheeks were pink with heat, and her green eyes looked tired. Her son, Bertie, followed her, his somewhat plain features transformed by the affability of his smile. He immediately offered an arm to Jumana, the other member of Cyrus's staff, but the girl hopped lithely out without giving him so much as a glance of thanks. A typical Egyptian beauty with melting dark eyes and delicate features, she was as ambitious as she was attractive. Bertie had been in love with her for years, but had not succeeded in winning her heart. Good to have you back, Emerson declared, wringing Cyrus's hand. Good to be back, said Cyrus, drawing a deep breath. What have you been up to? Any fresh corpses, Amelia? You will have your little joke, Cyrus. We don't have a murder every season. Name one, Cyrus countered with a grin. There have been a few odd occurrences. Never mind, said Emerson, sharply. I declined Catherine's invitation to a late luncheon, wishing to give our friends time to rest after the long, dusty train ride. We will see you this evening, if you feel up to it, I proposed. Emerson cleared his throat. We're dining with Carter tonight, Peabody. Howard? I turned to stare at him. I didn't know he was in Luxor. Got in yesterday, Emerson said, looking off into the distance and shuffling his feet. I was unaware of that. He asked us to dine this evening? Yes, most kind. I accept it, of course. Emerson added hastily, Subject to your approval, my dear. That's all right, Cyrus said, with a concerned look at his wife, who was leaning on his arm. Cat could do the day arrest. We'll see you tomorrow. We escorted the Vandergelds to their carriage and waved them off. Emerson disdains any form of transport, except the motor car, so we set off on foot toward the dock. The weather was cooler, and the sky a trifle overcast. I regretted having assumed a proper morning frock instead of my comfortable trousers and coat. The styles of that year were lighter and less cumbersome than the garments of my youth, with their trailing skirts and awkward bustles. But my shoes pinched, and the heels were too high for easy walking. However, I do not allow discomfort to distract me, and I at once began to query Emerson. How is it that you were aware of Howard's arrival before I learned of it? Why didn't you tell me he had asked us to dine? I just did, said Emerson. Take my arm, my dear. Those shoes are really not suitable for such rough surfaces. I like your frock, though. New, is it? It was, but Emerson would have said the same about any garment, I assumed, since he never paid the least attention to what I was wearing. Before I could pursue my questioning, he turned his head and addressed a remark to Nefret, who was walking behind us arm in arm with Ramses. You are both included in the invitation. Carter was particularly insistent that you join us, Nefret. I believe he still admires you. In a perfectly gentlemanly manner, of course. Nefret laughed. Howard is a perfect gentleman, despite what certain British snobs say about him. I've heard that he's become attached to another lady, though. You referred to Lord Carnarvon's daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, I presume, I said. From what I've heard, the attachment is rather more on her part. However, I never indulge in vulgar gossip of that nature. Howard's house, which he called Castle Carter, was at the northern end of Dra Abul Naga, close to the road that led into the Valley of the Kings. I sometimes wondered whether the name was an attempt to imitate Cyrus Vandergelt, whose elegant and capacious home was known to all in Luxor 
as the castle. Howard did not get on well with Cyrus, who had often outbid him for the unusual antiquities he hoped to acquire for his patron, Lord Carnarvon. Ramsay suggested that Howard was rather referring to the old saying about an Englishman's home being his castle. Ramsay's has a more kindly nature than I. Howard had designed and built the house himself, with the financial assistance of Lord Carnarvon. The location was not attractive, being only barren ground without trees or grass, but the structure was pleasant enough, quite in the Arab style, with a domed hall in the centre and high-arched windows in the dining and sleeping rooms. Howard greeted us warmly, which did not dispel my suspicion that the invitation had not been his idea but Emerson's. We took drinks in the domed reception hall. It was simply but comfortably furnished, with low chairs and settees and brass tables. Howard introduced us to his new pet, a little yellow canary. Nefret, who shared Howard's fondness for animals, went at once to the cage and chirped at the pretty creature. It tilted its head and chirped back. Charming, I said. Emerson grunted. I hope it meets a happier fate than some of your other pets, Carter. What with feral cats and hawks. Oh, I shan't let it out of its cage, Howard said. He put his finger into the cage. The canary hopped onto it and let out a melodious trill. He added, The men say it is a bird of good omen. A golden bird foretells a golden discovery this season. We went into the dining room, and Emerson, who felt he had wasted enough time on the amenities, asked what luck Howard had had in the antiquities shops of Cairo. Howard shrugged. Not much. I hope to do better here in Luxor. He took a spoonful of soup and made a face. I must apologize for my cook. He hasn't the skill of your marman. The meal was, in fact, rather bad. The soup over-seasoned, the beef tough, the vegetables stewed to mush. Naturally, I did not say so. After dinner, Howard showed us his acquisitions. One was rather charming, a cosmetic pot consisting of seven joined cylinders, each of which had contained a different variety of paint for face and hands. Howard shrugged my admiration aside. It isn't the sort of thing that would excite his lordship. Do you happen to know of any artifacts at the Luxor dealers? Anything Vandergelt hasn't already got his hands on? He added, somewhat sourly. Mr. Vandergelt only arrived this morning, so you may be able to get in ahead of him, Ramses replied with a smile. However, we haven't heard of anything unusual. I'll go round to Mohasib's first thing in the morning, Howard said. So, you don't mean to start work immediately? Emerson asked. Howard didn't miss the implicit criticism. I see no reason for haste. His lordship will not be out for several more weeks, and it won't take us long to clear that small section. And then what? Emerson asked. Howard motioned to the hovering attendant to refill his wine glass. That will be up to his lordship. Some persons might have accepted this evasion and not pursued the subject. Not Emerson. Do you hope to persuade him into continuing in the East Valley? If Tutankhamun isn't in my little triangle... He must be somewhere, Howard declared. Not necessarily, Emerson said. That is, not necessarily in the East Valley. He immediately looked as if he regretted having said so much, adding, His is not the only royal tomb we haven't located. But his is the one I'm after, Howard said. He leaned forward, planting his elbows on the table. A vulgar habit which, I am sorry to say, was shared by my husband, who did the same. "'You know that, Emerson, old chap,' Howard went on. "'You told me last year, didn't you, that I ought to keep on looking. "'Appreciate your advice, your help.' "'Emerson, who had done his best to send Howard to another part of the valley, "'had the decency to look embarrassed. "'It'll be empty like all the rest,' Howard said sadly, "'if it's there.' "'From the bird in the adjoining room came a ripple of song.' The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses was not surprised that his father should dismiss the search for Sethos, to quote his mother. She had a penchant for colourful phrases. 
Emerson was obsessed. Why he believed that Carter would find a tomb in the unpromising little triangle of ground, Ramses did not know. Perhaps he had no real evidence, only a feeling, a hunch. But as Ramses knew, the greatest excavators develop an instinct for discovery. It had happened over and over again, especially to the untrained but phenomenally successful tomb robbers of Luxor. Emerson's instincts were as great as theirs. He had to control himself, fuming, while Howard Carter made the rounds of the Luxor dealers. At Cyrus's urging, he agreed to open their own excavation in the West Valley. But his heart wasn't in it. Instead of badgering the men who were finishing the clearance of the Tomb of Ai, where they had worked the year before, he wandered round the far end of the West Valley with Bertie and Jumana in tow. He was looking for new tomb entrances. He didn't find any. They heard nothing more from the men who had lured them to the shop. The more Ramses thought about it, the more he was inclined to agree with his father. It had been a singularly inept and pointless ambush. The men must have been strangers, since no local man would believe the father of curses could be so easily intimidated. Selim had been unable to find any trace of them, and his contacts were extensive. The gatekeeper reported no inquisitive strangers. The dog didn't bark in the night time. But then she wouldn't, Ramses thought, unless someone approached the children's window. Amira was the possessor of a very pretentious doghouse, designed by David. Charla had assisted him, so the house had a minaret, a veranda, and carpets throughout. The dog had refused to sleep in it, though, until they moved it under the children's window. The apparent absence of activity didn't reassure Ramses. During his war years, he had acquired a sort of sixth sense about being watched. It was a necessary survival trait, and he knew the watchers were out there somewhere. The ambush might have been a feint, a crude attempt to distract them from more subtle methods. He didn't like uncertainty, and there were too many unsettled problems. They were in the West Valley on sufferance, since technically it was part of Carnarvon's concession. If they did find any new tombs, Carnarvon was sure to take over, especially if his excavation in the East Valley came up empty. There had been no further discussion about Nefret and him moving to Cairo for the winter. But he knew his mother had not abandoned the scheme. And where the devil was Sethos? He didn't suppose his mother would put up with this state of affairs for long. She brought matters to a head one evening when the Vandergelds were dining with them. The cook had prepared all Emerson's favorite dishes, and he had almost finished his post-prandial whiskey and soda before his wife cleared her throat portentously. "'I have a few things to discuss with you, Emerson,' No, my friends, don't go. We've nothing to hide from you. She believes I will behave better with you here, Emerson explained. Replete and relaxed, he was in an affable mood, his pipe in one hand and his glass in the other. Very well, Peabody, have at me. The affability lasted only until she mentioned her intention of hiring new staff. Emerson sputtered and glared, when she went on to inform him that the younger Emersons planned to spend the winter in Cairo, Ramses braced himself for an explosion. Emerson's reaction was worse. His massive form seemed to shrink. "'Is this what you want, my boy?' he asked, in faltering tones. "'No, sir. That is, we haven't really... that is...' He gave Nefret a helpless look. She came to sit on the arm of Emerson's chair and put her arm round his bowed shoulders. We've talked of it, Father, but we haven't come to a decision. It's up to you, of course. Emerson fumbled for a handkerchief and blew his nose loudly. I shall miss the kiddies. Now that, Ramses thought, was a bit too much. Emerson's emotions were completely sincere, but instead of shouting, he was using guile to get his own way. "'Shame on you, Emerson,' said his wife coldly. Cyrus, who hadn't ventured to speak until then, said tentatively, "'If you are my opinion.' "'I don't,' said Emerson, forgetting his role. "'I do,' said his wife. "'We are all in this together when it comes to our plans for the remainder of this season, and for seasons to come. "'It is agreed, is it not, that we wish to continue the arrangement that has proved so successful, "'combining our forces into a single group?' "'Nothing would please me more,' 
Cyrus exclaimed. It would only be making it official. I'm no Egyptologist, and I would be more than happy to have Emerson take over as director. <clears throat> said Emerson. Well, excellent, said his wife briskly. We cannot continue in the West Valley indefinitely. It was a temporary arrangement in any case. We must settle on another site and add to our staff. I'll tell you what we need, said Cyrus. An artist. I don't suppose Mr. or Mrs. Davies would be available? No, no, Emerson said. Not a chance. They have other commitments. But David... Also has other commitments, said his wife, in a tone that brooked no argument. What about that young French woman, Mademoiselle Malraux? She had done it again. Emerson became so involved in arguing about details that he tacitly conceded her point. She made two of her little lists, one of sites they should consider and another of potential staff members. I shall just pop up to Cairo tomorrow, then, she announced. What for? Emerson demanded suspiciously. In a tone of exaggerated patience, she replied, to interview possible staff members, inform Monsieur Lacour of our new arrangement, and ask his advice about another site. Unless you would prefer to go in my stead? Faced with several chores he detested, plus abandoning his surveillance of Howard Carter, Emerson gave in without a struggle, as she had known he would. Ramses managed to get a word alone with her after the Vandergelts had left. You aren't going to look at houses for us, are you? I doubt there'll be time, she replied, studying her lists. I don't want to be away too long. Try to prevent your father from bullying hard. Yes, mother. You've something else on your mental list, haven't you? She looked up at him, her face grave. We are still under surveillance. I've been keeping an eye out. Haven't seen anything suspicious. But you have felt it. So have I. One develops certain instincts. One does, Ramses agreed. He couldn't help asking the question. Have you dreamed of Abdullah lately? You've always scoffed at those dreams. Now, mother, I never have. Nor had he. Not in so many words. When she first spoke of those unusual, vivid dreams of their former rice, he had been happy she believed in their reality. For they comforted her. Abdallah had sacrificed his life to save hers, but the bond between them had already been strong. She and the old Egyptian had come to care for each other in a way he would once have believed impossible, considering the differences in their backgrounds and beliefs. Gratitude and strong affection the denial of loss might reasonably account for her need to believe the people she had loved were not gone from her forever. He couldn't say precisely when he had begun to share her faith in her dreams. Perhaps it was the sheer strength of her belief. I will certainly ask him about Sethos when next I see him, she said, straight-faced. Until I do, I will have to rely on less reliable sources. I mean to call on Mr. Smith while I'm in Cairo. He wouldn't confide information in a telegram, but a face-to-face -face interview may be more productive. Ramses didn't doubt that. She had her methods. Shall I give him your regards? she asked. She knew how he felt about Smith, who exemplified to him the faults of the intelligence services. They didn't give a damn about how many lives they destroyed in the pursuit of their self-defined duty. He had hated every second of the time he spent working for them. No he said. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I had a busy day in Cairo, one that taxed even my energy. I hadn't made an appointment with Monsieur Lacour, but I did not anticipate any difficulty in seeing him, and so it proved. I think he was so relieved to find himself dealing with me instead of with Emerson that he would have agreed to anything I asked. But in fact, he and Emerson were on reasonably good terms these days. Emerson could not be said to be on excellent terms with very many Egyptologists. We had preserved for the museum some of its greatest treasures, risking our own lives in the process, and Lacour was not ungrateful. He was a distinguished-looking man, with white hair and beard, so meticulous in his habits that people said he made lists of lists. An excellent idea, in my opinion. He bowed me into his office with the utmost courtesy, 
and for a while we chatted of generalities, including the director's recent statement about the partage, or division, of artefacts discovered by foreign expeditions. Some arrogant excavators behave as if the entire land of Egypt were their own personal preserve, Laco declared. His beard bristled. I intend to tighten the laws so that the great majority of objects remain as they should in Egypt. Emerson is in full agreement with you, sir, I said truthfully. You may count on his support, and mine, of course. After that, Monsieur Lacour would have acceded to my slightest wish. My next appointments were with the young persons I was considering as potential staff members. I had selected two for further consideration. Having spoken at greater length with Mademoiselle Malraux and observed Nefret's warm reception of the girl, I had decided my initial reservations were unfounded. She was a vivacious little creature, bubbling with enthusiasm, but one's initial impression of prettiness was based on her manner rather than the regularity of her features. And there was something a little unnerving about her eyes. The blue pupils were entirely surrounded by milky white— so that she appeared to be in a permanent state of surprise or alarm. However, physiognomy is not an accurate indicator of character, and the portfolio she had brought impressed me. An archaeological artist has different qualifications from those of a painter. He or she must be capable not only of accurate copying, but of a certain feeling for the techniques and beliefs of the culture. I was particularly struck with a watercolour she had done of the head of a mummy in the Louvre. My other candidate was the opposite of Mademoiselle in almost every way, and a contradiction in himself. He had one of the jolliest faces I had ever beheld, round-cheeked, smiling, eyes beaming goodwill. One would have expected such a cheery-looking man to bubble as Mademoiselle did, but Naji Farid appeared to be very shy. He sat with eyes lowered and spoke only when he was spoken to in a soft, melodious voice. However, what he said when he did speak displayed his familiarity with the methods of excavation, and I did not object to taciturnity. It would be a pleasant change. By mid-afternoon, I had completed all my tasks save one, and had every expectation of being able to catch the evening express, as I had planned. However, tracking down Mr. Brace Girdle Boy's Dragon, a.k.a. Mr. Smith, proved to be more difficult than I had expected. He had once given me a private telephone number, but when I rang it, a woman's voice informed me, in Arabic, that they did not accept lady customers. Not being entirely certain what to make of that, I did not pursue the matter. My next step was to go through the Ministry of Public Works, which was Brace Girdle Boys Dragon's cover position. It took some time to work my way through the bureaucratic muddle, and when I was finally connected with his assistant, the hour was late, and I had become exasperated. Inform him that Mrs. Emerson will be at the turf club at five o'clock, and that if he does not meet me, he will deeply regret it. I have always found that unspecific threats are the most effective. The victim's imagination supplies consequences more terrifying than any I could carry out. I was also fairly certain, from the assistant's occasional silences, that Bracegirdle Boyce Dragon was in the office. However, he hadn't the courage to speak directly to me. Not the turf club, Mrs. Emerson. The young man sounded as if he were quoting. They have not yet recovered from your last visit. Take tea at Groppy's at five. I was ready for a refreshing cup of tea and one of Groppy's excellent pastries. The ambience was certainly more pleasant than the aggressive masculinity of the turf club. Lamps with crimson shades cast a soft glow, and footsteps were muted by Persian rugs. Scarcely had I seated myself when a low voice greeted me by name. I looked up to see not Smith's long nose and pointed chin, but the countenance of a younger man. With a forehead so high, his features appeared to have been squeezed into the lower half of his face and miniaturized. A softly rounded chin, a button of a nose, and a mouth as sweetly curved as that of a pretty girl. Mrs. Emerson, is it not? My name is Weatherby. We spoke earlier today. May I join you? 
By all means, I said, and then you may explain why your superior sent you instead of coming himself. Mr. Weatherby edged himself into a chair. He thought it better that he not be seen tete-a-tete -tete with you at the present time. I am completely in his confidence, ma'am, and will report directly to him. Hmm, I said. Very well. I must catch the evening express, so just listen and don't interrupt. My description of Emerson and Ramsay's encounter with the arsonists caused him to purse his lips. Why were we not informed of this earlier? I asked you to refrain from interrupting me. Why did your employer not respond more informatively to Emerson's telegram? His reply was the simple truth, Mrs. Emerson. We have no idea where the individual in question may be, and we are as anxious as you to locate him. So you agree that the attackers were searching for um, that individual? It seems likely, Weatherby said cautiously. Lowering his voice and glancing over his shoulder, he went on. It has been almost six weeks since his last report. And he was at that time where? It goes against the grain for anyone in the Secret Service to give up any information whatever. Reluctantly, he murmured, Syria. Doing what? Now, really, Mrs. Emerson, you cannot expect me to answer that. The Official Secrets Act. Such an unnecessary nuisance, these rules. Answer this, then. Who might his adversaries be? God only knows, said Mr. Weatherby, in a burst of genuine feeling. You ought to be in a position to hazard a guess, since you know the nature of his mission. I persisted. I know what he was supposed to be doing, Mrs. Emerson. And you will say no more? I see. I glanced at my lapel watch. I haven't time to continue the conversation, Mr. Weatherby. You've been singularly unhelpful. Believe me, Mrs. Emerson. Yes, yes, if it were up to you. Please remind Mr. Smith that he once offered to do anything possible to assist me or my family. We are in need of that assistance. I don't like to be spied on and harassed. The rosebud mouth broadened into a smile. I don't blame you, Weatherby said. I believe I can safely promise that my superior will take steps to relieve you of that inconvenience. A few false trails... You will let us know if you should hear from the individual in question. If you will do the same for me, you have my word. For what that is worth, I thought. At least Mr. Weatherby had a sense of humour, which was more than I could say for Smith. Regretfully, I abandoned the remains of my apricot tart, leaving Mr. Weatherby to pay the bill. I arrived at the railway station in good time. All in all, it had been a profitable day, and after a leisurely meal in the dining car... I sought my swaying couch in the consciousness of duty well done. I have never understood why I should dream of Abdullah at such irregular and seemingly unrelated occasions, nor why I always saw him as a young man, black-bearded and vigorous, instead of as the white-haired patriarch he had been at the time of his death. He scarcely ever turned up when I had a particular reason for wanting to consult him, and his remarks were, for the most part, enigmatic. Sometimes he reassured me when I was worried. Sometimes he dropped vague hints that only made sense when it was too late to act on them. Often he scolded me for behaving foolishly. It would have been nice to receive more practical advice. After all, when one has a close acquaintance on the other side, where all is known and understood... One has a right, in my opinion, to expect a helpful suggestion or two. However, it was enough just to see and hear him, to know that, in some way and in some dimension, he continued to exist. He was waiting for me at the usual place and time, the cliffs above Deir el-Bahri at Luxor, at sunrise. He seemed to be in an affable mood, for he greeted me with a smile instead of a scowl, and for a few moments we stood side by side, looking out over the valley, watching the light flow across river and fields and desert, until it brightened the colonnades of Hatshepsut's temple below us. So, I said, no dead bodies this year, Abdullah. It was an old joke between us. Abdullah grinned. Not yet, he said. Whose? I did not expect an answer, nor did I receive one. There is always a dead body. 
There was the faintest show of emotion, a suggestion of moisture in his dark eyes, when he added, Last time, it was almost yours, Sid. Oh, that was months ago, I said dismissively. Have you any news for me? Abdallah stroked his beard. Hmm, you will soon have a visitor, whom you expect and do not wish to see. And Emerson will be proved right when he hoped he would be wrong. It was a more informative answer than I usually got, even though it did sound as if Abdallah had been prompted by a spiritualist medium. I took it for granted that the unwanted visitor must be Sethos. The second tidbit could only refer to... Aha! I exclaimed. So there is a new royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings? I told you there was. You told me there were two. I did, said Abdallah agreeably. Where... Never mind, you won't tell me, will you? What about the attack on Ramses and Emerson? Are they still in danger from those people? They were never in danger. It was a foolish gesture, made by foolish men. What men? Their names would mean nothing to you. They have gone back whence they came. Who sent them? Will there be others like them? I have told you, said Abdallah, with exaggerated patience, that the future is not set in stone. Your actions affect events. The actions of others also do so. Ah, I said, interestedly. So we do have free will. That subject has been debated by philosophers down the ages. I will not debate it, Sid. As I expected, I turned to face him. Is all well with you, my dear old friend? How could it be otherwise? His broad chest rose as he drew a deep breath of the fresh morning air. May it be well with you and those we love till we next meet, Sit. Without a farewell, he walked away, along the path that led to the valley. It was always so. Emerson was at the station when the train pulled into Luxor next morning. I did not see him at first, since he was sitting cross-legged on the platform, engaged in animated conversation with several of the porters. Seeing me at the window, he hurried to help me down the steps. I came on the chance that you might be on this train, he explained. Chance indeed, I told you I would be. Dust off your trousers, Emerson. Where is your hat? Emerson brushed vaguely at the oily stains on his trousers and ignored the question to which he probably did not know the answer. I had sometimes wondered whether it was his habit of going about bareheaded in the noonday sun that had kept his handsome black hair so thick and untouched by grey, except for two picturesque white streaks at the temples. I knew he didn't employ any variety of hair colouring since I would have found it, and I kept my own little bottle well hidden. Taking my arm, he said, What luck? Luck had nothing to do with it. Everything worked out as I anticipated. <laughs> said Emerson. What about you? Emerson took my valise from the porter and led me toward the carriages that waited for customers. Carter starts work tomorrow. Good gad, Emerson. Is that all you can think of? Evidently it was. He asked no further questions and did not even protest when I said I would wait to make my full report to the assembled group that evening. Travel by train leaves one dusty and rumpled. After Emerson had gone off to the West Valley, I enjoyed a nice long soak in my tub, washed my hair, and applied just a bit of colouring, and assumed comfortable garments. I spent the rest of the day on the veranda, putting my notes in order and watching, without appearing to do so, for unfamiliar persons. We were accustomed to seeing the villagers around and about the house, for Fatima and the others of our household staff had kin all over the West Bank, and these individuals were in the habit of dropping in for gossip and a meal. I had no objection to this arrangement, nor to Fatima's habit of feeding many of the local beggars. Like that of Islam, our faith tells us to share our bounty with those whom, for reasons of his own, the Almighty has not favoured. 
and these individuals often possessed interesting information, which they passed on to Fatima, and she passed on to me, thus verifying the undeniable fact that virtue has its rewards. I had got to know most of the beggars, by sight at least. Some were considered holy men. One of them wandered past the veranda that afternoon, a ragged fellow with a long grey beard and a stick that supported his bent frame. He gave me a vague smile and a murmured blessing, which I acknowledged with a bow before he went on toward the kitchen. He could not be considered unfamiliar, since I had seen him often before. The same applied to the child who came up the road some time later. I kept an eye on him, since some of the lads tried to sneak into the stable yard to admire the motor car and remove bits of it. But he squatted down some distance away and stayed there. I had asked Fatima to serve tea early. My intuition was correct. Ramses and Nefret were the first to arrive. With the rest close behind them, Cyrus, Bertie, Jumana, Selim and Daoud, and, after a brief interval, Emerson himself. I plunged at once into my report, since I knew I would not be able to make myself heard once the children joined us. I have seen Mademoiselle Malraux's portfolio, which was first rate. Both she and Mr. Farid impressed me with their qualifications. So you hired him? Cyrus inquired. "'Gracious, no, I would never do that without your approval and that of Emerson.' "'If they suit you, Amelia, they're fine with me,' Cyrus declared. "'Emerson?' Emerson started and spilled his tea. "'What?' "'Oh, yes, certainly, my dear.' "'I was pleased to hear this, since I had informed both young Egyptologists that we would take them on.' Monsieur Lacour has been most accommodating, I continued. He offered us several sites, the royal mortuary temples along the cultivation, with the exception of Medinet Habu. There's nothing left of them, Cyrus protested. Just heaps of rubble. Kindly allow me to finish, Cyrus. The far western valleys, where the tombs of Hatshepsut and the three princesses were found, and the site of Toad, south of here. Too far away, Cyrus said promptly. There will be time to consider these possibilities, I concluded. Monsieur Lacour wishes us to finish this season in the West Valley. From the gleam in Cyrus's eyes when I mentioned tombs, I knew what his choice would be. Emerson said vaguely, Yes, yes, Peabody, well done. We will um, consider the possibilities. The appearance of the dear little children put an end to the discussion. They went straight for their grandfather, both talking at once. Under cover of their sweet but penetrating voices, Ramses said softly, Did you see Smith? He sent his assistant, Mr. Weatherby, to meet with me, instead of coming himself. Weatherby? Ramses frowned slightly. Do you know him? No. He must be new since my time. Did he explain why Smith snubbed you? In the intelligence business, a snub is not a snub, but excessive caution. According to Weatherby, his superior did not feel it advisable for us to be seen together. The department still has not heard from Sethos. Ramsey's raised eyebrows indicated a strong degree of scepticism. I believe he was telling the truth about that, I said. He did say that Sethos was in Syria when last heard from, but that is about all I got out of him except that he promised he, Smith, rather, would take steps to draw any possible watchers away from us. Laying a few false trails was how he put it. Not very satisfactory, Ramses muttered. Oh, and he also said he would inform us if and when he heard from Sethos, providing we do the same. I agreed, of course. Of course, said Ramses. He turned away to greet his son, who offered him a somewhat battered biscuit. I brought you this, father, since Chala is about to eat the rest of them. That was good of you, Ramses said. He sat down. The little boy leaned against his knee, and Ramses ate the biscuit, with appropriate murmurs of appreciation. Then David John said, Remind me if you will be so good, father. Who was Tutankhamun? I smiled to myself. David John did not like to admit ignorance of archaeological matters. This was his oblique method of obtaining information on a subject he knew little or nothing about.
His ignorance was not surprising, since he was only five years old, and Tutankhamun was one of the most obscure of all Egyptian pharaohs. Ramses looked startled. Why do you ask, David John? Grandpapa believes his tomb is in the Valley of the Kings. He would like to find it. I'm sure he would, Ramses said. It is true that Tutankhamun's is one of the few royal tombs that has never been found. But he was not an important king, David John. He ruled at the end of the 18th dynasty, succeeding his father-in-law, who may also have been his father. You have heard of Akhenaten. The heretic, said David John promptly. His blue eyes shone. A fascinating figure. His wife was Nefertiti, and he had six daughters. He forbade the worship of the old gods and founded a new city, Amana, dedicated to his sole god, the Aten. One might call him the first monotheist. Well done, I said. David John must have been reading Mr. Breasted's history. Like his father, he was appallingly precocious in certain areas, and he had learned to read at a very young age. Akhenaten's reforms did not endure, however, I continued. After his death, the court went back to the worship of the old gods and abandoned Amarna. Tutankhaten, as he was originally called, changed his name to Tutankhamun. His wife, one of Akhenaten's daughters, changed hers as well, to incorporate the name of the god Amun, whose worship had been forbidden by her father. David John nodded emphatically. From Ankh Essen Pa'aten to Ankh Essen Amen. Good gad, I said involuntarily. Uh, again, well done. That is about all we know of Tutankhamun, David John. Few monuments of his have survived. Then if his tomb were to be found... That is most unlikely, I said. Your grandfather has got a bee in his... Uh, bonnet? said David John. A metaphor. I understand. I shall ask him about it. He returned to Emerson, and I said, Really, Ramses, I am beginning to worry about the boy. He rattled off those polysyllabic names as readily as he does that of his sister. He can't be any worse than I was, Ramses said with a smile. I could only hope he was right. It was shortly after midnight in the early hours of November the 4th, I've good reason to remember that date, that I awoke to find Emerson gone from my side. Emerson wakes with a great deal of grunting and tossing about. For him to vanish as silently as a spirit aroused the direst of forebodings. Without stopping to assume dressing gown and slippers, I snatched up my parasol and ran out of the room. The sound of low voices led me to the veranda. The moon had set, but the stars were bright enough to enable me to make out the stalwart form of my spouse in muttered conversation with a much smaller figure. I heard Emerson say in Arabic, "'You're certain?' "'Yes, Father of Curses. The voice was a high-pitched treble, that of a young boy. The sight of me wrung a small scream from him, but he stood his ground. Emerson glanced over his shoulder. "'Ah, Peabody, what are you doing with that parasol?' I lowered the weapon, feeling a trifle foolish. "'Is there news of... of him?' I cried. "'Quietly,' Emerson hissed. "'Who are you talking about?' "'Oh, him. No.' He went on in Arabic. "'Good lad, here.' He fished in the pocket of his trousers, his only garment, and the jingle of coins brought a flash of white teeth from the child. "'Wait,' Emerson said. We will return together. Curse you, Emerson, I said, trotting after him as he hurried back to our sleeping chamber. What is going on if it's not about him? Emerson took me by the shoulders. Peabody, he said in a low, strained voice. They have found a stone-cut step. A thrill of electrical intensity ran through my limbs. I understood who better what that phrase betokened. A step, carved out of the stone, could mean only one thing. A tomb. And where else could it be but at the spot Emerson had been haunting for days? I exclaimed, 
I am coming with you. I cannot wait for you, Peabody. However, his attempts to assume his garments were slowed by excitement and by his habit of strewing his clothing all over the room when he retires. It took him a while to find his boots, which were under the bed. By that time, I had slipped into my trousers and shirt and coat, which were where I had neatly arranged them earlier. I am driving the motor car, said Emerson, giving me a defiant look. If he had thought that would deter me, he was mistaken. It is impossible to explain, to those who have not experienced it, the all-consuming passion of archaeological discovery. To be actually on the spot when such a discovery is made, to be among the first, to behold with one's own eyes an unknown tomb. Well... I could not blame Emerson for stealing a march on Hard Carter. It was not good form, but it was understandable. However, I prefer not to drive in the motor car with Emerson, particularly when he is in a hurry. So I said, the car makes a frightful racket, Emerson. I presume this expedition is not one you wish to advertise? <laughs> said Emerson. He added more emphatically, Bah, make haste then. He dashed out. I knew he would have to wake Jamad, who was not at his best in the middle of the night, and get the horses saddled. So I finished my toilette, fastening on my hat and buckling my belt of tools, canteen, brandy flask, sewing kit, torch, knife, round my waist. When I reached the stable, Emerson's gelding was ready, and Emerson and Jamad were saddling my mare. A gentle creature I had named Eva, after my gentle sister-in-law. Some of the more spirited Arabians objected to the jangle of objects on my belt. The child greeted me with a bow and a wide grin. I recognized him now, and my suspicions were confirmed. He was one of Howard's water boys, the same one I had seen waiting outside the house. Waiting, I did not doubt, for Emerson. This is really too bad of you, Emerson, I said. What underhanded scheme have you got in mind? Emerson seized me round the waist and tossed me onto the mare. Mounting in his turn, he reached down and hauled the boy up onto the saddle in front of him. It was Osme here who found the step, he said. At your instigation? I cannot imagine, said Emerson, in a reproachful voice, why you should leap to the conclusion that I am up to no good. I only want to have a quick look to make sure Osme hasn't let his imagination run away with him. It would be too bad to raise Carter's hopes and then see them dashed. Howard would be touched by your concern, Emerson. Emerson did not reply. Emerson would soon have forged ahead had I not kept shouting at him. Concern for me, I feel certain, encouraged him to moderate his pace. I am not the most skilled of horsewomen. At least there was no one abroad at that hour. When we turned onto the road that led to the valley, the cliffs on either side cut off what little light there had been, and at my emphatic suggestion, Emerson slowed his steed to a walk. Cyrus Vandergelt's castle loomed up against the stars, illumined like a veritable palace by flickering torches at the doors and in the courtyard, for Cyrus was extravagant with lighting. Howard Carter's house had been a dark huddle on the hillside when we passed it, and I had heard a chortle of satisfaction from Emerson. Howard was not yet awake, nor would he be, I expected, for several hours. The entrance to the valley was closed, naturally. We left the horses outside the barricade. Emerson jumped nimbly over it and lifted first me and then Asmi over. The valley is somewhat eerie at night, as silent and deserted as it must have been in the days when the pharaohs lay undisturbed in their deep-dug sepulchres, "'surrounded by uncounted wealth. "'High overhead, the brilliant stars of Egypt "'shone diamond-bright against the black velvet sky. "'But we walked through shadows. "'There had been guards in ancient times, as there were now, "'when a reverberating snore broke the silence. "'I thought that those ancient guards "'probably had shirked their duties in favour of sleep, "'as often as did their modern counterparts.' Rounding a curve in the path, we reached the area we sought, and I ventured to switch on my torch. Hard hadn't bothered to station a guard near his sight. Why should he, when he had found nothing except some wretched workmen's huts? Well done, Peabody, said Emerson, taking the torch from me. Now, Asmin, 
show me the step. The remains of the huts had been removed the previous day, but there was a good three feet of soil and rubble remaining over the bedrock. Asmi indicated a depression less than two feet long and a foot wide. I put the sand back, father of curses, he said in a thrilling whisper, so that you could be the one to find it. Emerson handed me the torch, dropped to his hands and knees, and began digging like a mole, throwing the sand out behind him. His large calloused hands were efficient tools. It was not long before he let out a muffled swear word and held up a bleeding finger. It was not a request for sympathy, but confirmation of Asmi's claim. He had scraped his finger on a hard rock surface, the same colour as the sand that almost covered it. We all banged our heads together, trying to see down into the hole. Sand kept trickling back into it, but before Emerson stopped, we all saw the straight edge of what had to be a ledge or step. Emerson sat back on his heels. I waited for him to speak, but he remained silent. Dig it out! Dig it out! the boy urged. No. Emerson rose slowly to his feet. I haven't the right to do so. Isn't it a little late for such scruples? I inquired. Archaeological fever had gripped me, and I was as anxious as Asmi to enlarge that enticing hole. Refill it, Emerson ordered, in the same quiet, even voice. He took me by the elbow and raised me from the squatting position I had assumed. Asmi groaned. Again. Again. But Emerson, I cried, it may be only a natural feature or the start of an unfinished cutting. Don't you want to make sure? I haven't the right, Emerson repeated. In fact, he went on, I hadn't the right to do this much, and it would not be prudent to admit that I had. Asmi, you must allow Rice Ginnegar to take the credit for finding this, as he will do so in any case. I shall see you are properly rewarded. There. That will do. Emerson sat down on the low retaining wall at the nearby entrance to the tomb of Ramses the Sixth, and invited me to join him. The pre-dawn chill was bitter. Emerson drew me close and put an arm round my shoulders. Have a sip of your brandy, Peabody, to ward off the cold. The brandy, as you well know, is for medicinal purposes only. If you had given me time, I would have brought a thermos of coffee. Perhaps I was unnecessarily hasty, Emerson admitted. But you understand, Peabody. Yes, my dear, I do. How did you know precisely where to look? Yesterday, after the last of the huts was cleared away, I observed something that caught my attention. The soil lies differently over a concavity. Not much of a difference unless one is looking for it. But I was looking for it, you see. I couldn't be absolutely certain, Emerson said, modestly. So I pointed the spot out to Asmi. He waited until the guards had settled down for the night before he began digging. He's small, and he knows every nook and cranny in the valley. Nobody spotted him. He then reported to me. A shiver ran through me, part excitement, part cold. Curse it, said Emerson. One would have supposed that by this time our presence would have been noted. Asmi, see if you can rouse one of the guards and tell him the father of curses wants coffee. Asmi scampered off. The sky had begun to lighten before he returned with two men whom Emerson hailed by name. You sleep soundly, Ibrahim, Ishak. What sort of guards are you to allow us to enter the valley unchallenged? The older of the two, a wiry chap with a grizzled beard, salaamed. We knew it was you and the Sitakim, father of Corsus, so we left you to do as you wished. That shows excellent judgment, said Emerson, with a smug smile. Haven't you made your morning coffee? As we always do, father of Corsus, the younger man said. Ali Muhammad will bring it when it is ready. We had our... Their coffee, very black and sweet and hot. Neither of the men ventured to ask what the devil we were doing there at such an hour, 
although the younger of the two kept looking curiously at the half-filled hole. Conversation was general and somewhat scurrilous. Ali Mohammed expressed doubts as to the virtue of one of the village wives, and Ishak reported that Daib ibn Simsa was said to have found a new tomb back in the Wadi el Sikke. Nothing to do with him, Ishak, of course. Finally, our hosts left, having been properly thanked by Emerson. They would never have accepted payment for their hospitality, but an exchange of gifts was only good manners. The sky turned from soft grey to pale blue. The sun had risen above the eastern cliffs, but in the depths of the valley the shadows clustered. Emerson waxed impatient, fidgeting and muttering. Eventually we heard voices, and along came Howard's crew, led by his rice. They greeted us without evidencing surprise. Clearly they'd been told of our presence. Rais Ahmed Girigar was one of the most respected foremen in Luxor, and was made of sterner stuff than the others. Fixing Emerson with a respectful but steady eye, he asked whether Carter Effendi was expecting us. No, said Emerson. We want to surprise him. Then you, I think, will have a greater surprise for him. Look there. Howard did not turn up for another hour. His procrastination prompted a number of caustic remarks from Emerson, who was always at the site as soon as his men. But to do Howard justice, the removal of the remaining debris was a task well within the skill of his experienced foreman. The rice had finished clearing the first stair, and he and Emerson had arrived at an understanding by the time Howard arrived, swinging his stick. The men fell silent when they heard him approach. Howard didn't see us at first. We had tactfully retreated into the background. "'Why have you stopped work?' he demanded of Girigar. The moment was one of high drama. Instead of replying, the rais made a sweeping gesture, directing Howard's attention to the step. British phlegm went up in smoke, together with dignity. Howard turned pale, then red, and fell to his knees. I doubt he was praying. He only wanted a closer look. But for the first time, I fully realized how much such a discovery would mean to him. And I remembered something he had once said about the excavations carried on by the American Theodore Davis. It don't seem right that he should find one tomb after another when there's been nothing for his lordship. Or for Howard Carter, whose career was dependent on the goodwill of a patron. Good Lord, he gasped. When? How? We found it almost at once, Effendi. As soon as we began digging, then we stopped and waited for you. Yes, yes. Howard got to his feet and dusted off the knees of his trousers. Quite right. Get on with the job, then. It may not be anything. I think it is, though, said Emerson. Howard jumped. What the devil? Oh. Good morning, Mrs. Emerson. Um, how long have you been here? We decided on an early morning ride, you see, said Emerson evasively. When we arrived, Rice Girigar had just made his great discovery, so we were unable to resist hanging about to see what developed. Don't mind, do you? Here, Peabody, take a seat. The seat was a camp stool, gallantly produced by the Rice. I took it and smiled at Howard, who'd been left with no way of getting rid of us, short of a blunt dismissal. I really would not have blamed Howard for cursing Emerson, who stood at Howard's shoulder and kept giving orders to the men— but before long, Howard was too absorbed to feel resentment. The usual debris still overlay the steps, however many there might be, and the cutting itself. The men worked with a will, as anxious as we, to see what lay below. But the work seemed to progress with agonizing slowness. Howard was, I must do him credit, a careful excavator, and with Emerson looming over him, he was not tempted to neglect proper standards. As the morning went on, the crowd round the excavation increased. Most of the guards and dragomen, curious tourists, 
The latter did not linger, for there was nothing much to see, but some of the Egyptians remained to watch. They knew, as the tourists did not, what those stone-cut steps might mean, and I was sorry to see among the watchers the villainous countenance of Daib el Simsa, one of Gunnar's most notorious tomb robbers. The sun was high, and we were all sticky with dust and perspiration when we were joined by another group, Cyrus and Bertie Vandergelt, Jumana and Ramses and Nefret. We heard, said Cyrus. Looking good, is it? It's too early to say, Howard replied cautiously. We brought a luncheon basket, Nefret said. Won't you stop and rest for a bit? Her sympathetic smile brought home to Howard how disheveled he looked, his tired and angle and his garments covered with dust. It also prevented him from protesting our presence, but in fact there was nothing he could do about it. The tomb of Ramses the Sixth was the nearest shelter, but it was popular with tourists. Emerson soon took care of that difficulty. The tomb is temporarily closed, he informed the guard on duty. Get them out of there, Mahmoud, and don't let anyone else in until we've left. Cyrus had also brought refreshments, so we had a nice little private luncheon. Speculation was rife. Was it a finished tomb, or only the beginning of one? Was it royal, or the smaller sepulchre of a nobleman? Was the entrance still sealed, or had it been breached in ancient times? We all knew that the former possibility was too much to hope for. But hope, dear reader, does not rest on logic. Only Ramses remained his usual silent self. By the end of the workday, we were still uncertain as to what we, Howard, I should say, had found. Lest the reader wonder why, allow me to remind him or her of how such tombs were constructed. Steps were cut down into the bedrock at the base of the cliff, within a descending stairwell, and when the desired depth was reached, a squared-off doorway gave entrance to the corridors and chambers of the sepulchre itself. This doorway must be well below the level of the topmost steps, since there had been no sign of it as yet, and detritus lay deep over the area. Almost thirteen feet down to bedrock in some places, Howard kept on until growing darkness made careful work impossible. Emerson would have gone on beyond that time, had I not tactfully reminded him that the decision was not his to make. He was extremely restless that night, mumbling and throwing himself from side to side, until I threatened to expel him from our chamber. If I had not protested, Emerson would have headed for the valley at dawn next morning. When interrogated, he had to admit that by his calculations... It would take another day of hard work to clear the entire cutting. We ought at least pretend to be casual visitors, I informed him. Howard will not take it amiss if we drop by on our way home from the West Valley. But if you push him too far... Curse it, Emerson shouted. See here, Peabody. Mother is right, Ramses said. What? Emerson stared at him. Oh, well, if you think so... I wished Ramses had not interfered. We'd had the beginning of a nice little argument developing. Our morning's work in the West Valley was a waste of time, though. Neither Emerson nor Cyrus could concentrate, and the former was, for once, the first to suggest that we stop for the day. Exhibiting the delicacy which was so characteristic of him, Cyrus refused Emerson's invitation to call on Howard. He did not, as he might have done, point out that it wasn't Emerson's tomb. I feel kind of funny about hanging around, he explained. Why? Emerson asked, in honest bafflement. Well, Carter didn't ask me. He didn't ask us either, I said. But that will not deter my husband. Come to dinner this evening, Cyrus, and we will tell you what went on. Nefret had decided to spend the morning at a clinic, so it was just the three of us, Emerson, Ramses, and I, who wended our way to the East Valley. Emerson had underestimated the zeal of Howard's crew. We arrived on the scene in time to see that the rubbish above the steps had been removed. Howard gave us only an abstracted greeting before urging his men to proceed. 
There was no thought of stopping now, and no possibility of leaving. One by one, the descending stairs were exposed as the cutting deepened. The sun was low in the west when the level of the twelfth step was reached, and there before us was the top of a doorway blocked with plastered stones. Howard sat down suddenly on the ground and wiped his forehead with his sleeve, too overwrought to take out his handkerchief. I can't stand the suspense, he groaned. Is the blocking intact? Are there seals on the plaster? This was as good as an invitation to Emerson, who probably wouldn't have waited for one anyhow. Howard tottered after him as he descended the steps. I can't see, Howard muttered. It's too dark down here. The exposed section seems to be solid. Keep your hands off the plaster, said Emerson curtly. Peabody, toss down a candle. I handed Ramses my torch. He had courteously refrained from comment or suggestion, feeling, I suppose, that his father was doing enough of both. But I knew the dear lad was as eager as we to inspect the doorway. With a smile at me, he descended in his turn. The rest of us crowded round the opening, breathlessly awaiting a report. It came at last, in the form of a groan from Howard. My heart sank. And then Ramsay's even voice called up, Plastered stone blocks. There are several seals stamped in the plaster. The seals of the necropolis. The jackal and the nine kneeling captives. No cartouche? I asked. Not here, but the lower part of the doorway is still hidden by rubble. I must see, Howard cried. I must see what is behind that door. It will take several more hours to finish clearing the rubble from the stairwell, Ramsay said coolly, and it's getting dark. I must see, Howard repeated. I must. Some of the plaster at the top has fallen away, said Emerson. It was the first time he'd spoken since Ramsay's went down with a light, and it was clear to me that he was having some difficulty speaking calmly. There appears to be a wooden lintel behind it. Peabody, I don't suppose you have such a thing as a drill on that belt of tools? I regret to say I do not, Emerson. I will make certain to carry one in future. Good God, said Emerson whether in response to my comment or in general, I cannot say. With Ramsay's knife and an awl provided by the crew, a small hole was drilled through the beam. The wood was old and dry, but very thick, so it took a while. It was like being spectators at a play, sightless spectators, since we were dependent on the reports of the actors instead of our own eyes. The suspense was not lessened thereby, it hadn't occurred to anyone, even Emerson, to object to Howard's mutilation of the lintel. Only a mind completely lacking in imagination could have resisted the temptation to look beyond that blocked doorway. Ramses was the first to ascend the stairs. Well, I cried. He gestured toward Howard, who had followed him, with Emerson close on Howard's heels. Well, Howard, I demanded, what's there? Rubble. Howard held the torch, which wavered about. The space beyond the door is entirely filled with stones and chips from floor to ceiling. But surely that is good news, I said. If the passage beyond, it must be a passageway, is closed, the tomb has been all these years undisturbed. Yes, I suppose so, Howard said flatly. I... To tell you the truth, Mrs. Emerson, I am so worn down with suspense and excitement I'm incapable of thinking. It has been quite a day, I said sympathetically. You ought to go home and rest. Emerson said only... Mm. Howard's bowed shoulders straightened. Not before I have filled in the excavation. Filled it in? But surely, in fairness to Lord Carnarvon, I must do so. He will want to be present when we take down the door. But that will mean a delay of weeks, I cried. How can you bear to wait? In fairness to his lordship, I must, Howard repeated. Emerson said, hmm. This grunt was particularly expressive. If Emerson had been allowed to take over the concession, there would have been no delay. 
On the other hand, if Emerson had been in charge, Howard would have been relegated to a subordinate role, and the glory, if glory there should be, would be Emerson's. It may have been this realization that consoled Howard. He sounded almost cheerful when he directed his crew to begin filling in the stairwell. We will leave you to it then, I said. Congratulations, Howard. A bit premature, perhaps, said Emerson. The necropolis seals indicate that it was the burial of a person of importance. But the dimensions of the stairwell are not those of a royal tomb. Never mind, I said, giving Emerson a little nudge with my elbow. It is a tomb, and it has not been entered for thousands of years. Just think, Howard, you have stolen a march on our tomb-robbing friends from Gournay. They are only too often the first to find a new tomb. You are babbling, Peabody, said Emerson, taking me by the arm. Time we went home. Didn't you ask the Vandergelts to dine this evening? Speaking of tomb robbers, Carter, two of the Ibn Simsas were among the spectators this afternoon. Hope springs eternal in the breasts of those bastards. I saw them too, said Howard, somewhat huffily. They can hope all they like, but there isn't a chance they can dig through the fill in the stairwell and the corridor without being caught in the act. <clears throat> Thus, Emerson conceded the point. Will you join us for dinner, Howard, after you've finished here? I asked. No, thank you, ma'am. It is most kind, but I'm going straight to bed. As you so neatly put it, this has been quite a day. The tourists had departed, and ours were the only horses left in the donkey park. Emerson helped me to mount. And as we rode slowly homeward, I said, Emerson, you have done nothing except grunt today. Not true, said Emerson, stung. I gave Carter a good deal of useful advice. Discouraging is the adjective I would choose. Howard has made a remarkable discovery, and the signs are propitious. Why can't you admit it? <laughs> said Emerson. Chapter 3 By the following afternoon, the contents of the cable Carter had dispatched to Lord Carnarvon was known to all the informed citizens of Luxor. Foremost among these was Dowd, who quoted the cable to us verbatim. At last have made wonderful discovery in the valley... A magnificent tomb with seals intact. How does he know it's magnificent? Emerson grumbled when Dowd reported this to him. There will be much gold, said Dowd, with complete conviction. The golden bird of Mr. Carter is an omen of good luck. This was the common opinion in Luxor. Even Emerson admitted there was no need to place extra guards at the tomb. Its entrance had been filled in and the passage was still blocked. Even if they bribed the guards, they would have to finish the whole job in a single night. Anyhow, he added morosely, we still don't know what is down there. The tomb may be empty. Quite right, I agreed. Since there is nothing to be done until Lord Carnarvon arrives, perhaps you will consider turning your attention to our work. Shall I invite Mademoiselle Malraux and Mr. Farid to visit us here, or will you go to Cairo to interview them? Emerson gave me a blank look. Who? I reminded him of the identity of the persons I had mentioned. His eyes narrowed suspiciously. A woman and an Egyptian, he said. I was under the impression that we would seek the most qualified persons and not be influenced by your socialist theories. The word socialist is ill-chosen, Emerson. If you are referring to my sentiments on the subject of discrimination against females and non-Europeans, I got them from you. <clears throat> said Emerson, stroking his chin. These young people are at least as well qualified as their competitors, I went on, warming to the subject, and less likely to find employment in a profession which, like most, is dominated by arrogant men. I'm only proposing to level the playing field in whatever small... Oh, bah! Emerson threw up his hands. Have it your own way, Peabody. You always do. But, he added, frowning fiercely, I insist upon the right to make the final decisions. I will go to Cairo myself. 
I had known he would. There was nothing to be done with his, Howard's, I should say, precious tomb until Lord Carnarvon arrived, and Emerson could think of little else. He was a perfect nuisance on the dig, emerging from periods of frowning abstraction to shout contradictory orders at everyone. Furthermore, the mere fact of his interviewing the pair meant that he had agreed in principle to the enlargement of our staff. I had already arranged with Cyrus that they should be housed at the castle. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Insofar as Ramses was concerned, it was a relief to have his father out of the way for a few days. It wasn't easy to get on with one's own work, even when Emerson was in a cooperative frame of mind, and for the past few days he had been hard to deal with. The French Institute staff would be arriving shortly to take over at the workman's village of Der el Medina, and Ramses wanted to finish the translation of the papyri they had found the year before. Cyrus amiably agreed that he wasn't needed in the West Valley. Ramses had already made copies of the texts in I's tomb. They would have to be collated with the photographs Nefret and Selim had taken, but that job could wait. He was alone in the house that day, except for the servants, so it ought to have been easy to concentrate. But his mind wandered, from memories of the man who had been his amiable and murderous assistant, to the voices of his children playing in the garden, to the great cat of Ray, who was determined to recline on the delicate papyrus scraps laid out on the table. "'Go and bully the dog,' Ramses said, carrying the cat to the window. Once there, he lingered, enjoying the fresh air and the vividly coloured blossoms along the path that led from the main house to the one his family occupied. His mother had proceeded with the construction of the latter without bothering to consult them in advance, but he had to admit it suited their requirements and was far enough away so that they weren't often bothered by unannounced visits. The children had their own quarters, and a set of rooms had been set aside for Nefret's clinic. From where he stood, he could see its entrance, shaded by tamarisk trees with a bench under them for waiting patients. He was about to force himself back to work, when someone moved along the path. It was Fatima, wearing her self-decreed uniform of black robe and head veil, but she was acting oddly, moving at an undignified trot and glancing frequently over her shoulder. She reached the door of the clinic, cast a final, comprehensive glance round, and went in. Nefret was in the West Valley with Cyrus. Fatima knew that. If she was in need of medical attention, why hadn't she mentioned it to Nefret at breakfast? Nefret always kept the clinic door locked, but Fatima, as head housekeeper, had a full set of keys. Surely she had better sense than to dose herself. More curious than concerned, Ramses decided he had better ascertain the reason for her extraordinary behaviour. He walked along the edge of the path, stepping lightly. His mother's favourite roses, pink and white and crimson, had sprinkled the ground with a rain of petals. The tall spires of hollyhocks had been partially denuded by Charla, who made dollies out of the blossoms. The unopened bud, inserted into the base of an inverted blossom, did bear a faint resemblance to a turbaned lady in a full skirt. A long row of wilting ladies, pink, rose, yellow, and crimson, lay along the path. The door of the clinic was closed. He opened it. Fatima spun round with a little shriek, clutching something to her breast. She was standing in front of the open medicine cabinet. What's going on? Ramses asked. Are you ill? Fatima shook her head dumbly. Her round, plain face was the picture of guilt, mouth ajar, and eyes staring. I'm sorry I startled you, Ramses said gently. What are you looking for? Fatima burst into tears. He'd been afraid she would. He put his arm round her shaking shoulders, patted her, made soothing noises, and waited patiently until her sobs subsided into broken exclamations of self-reproach. She had deceived them. She had concealed the truth. She had done wrong. The object she clutched was a bottle containing pills of some sort. All at once, Ramses had what his mother would have called a foreboding or premonition. It was, in fact, a sudden coming together of miscellaneous bits of knowledge. Fatima did not resist when he took the bottle from her. Quinine. It's all right, he said. I understand. Where is he? 
They all knew Fatima fed the local beggars. Occasionally, one of these unfortunates was given a bed for a night or two, in a room in the servants' wing. They could always tell when this had happened, because Fatima scrubbed and disinfected the room the next day. Still sniffing, she led him to a small chamber next to her own comfortable quarters. She had put him to bed and drawn the curtains over the single window. The room was dim and stuffy. It smelled of carbolic and lye soap. Ramsay stood by the bed, looking down at the sleeping man. What he had looked like when he arrived at the house, Ramses could only guess. Fatima must have cleaned him up, for he was now beardless and pale, his prominent nose jutting up between hollow cheeks. For only the second time in his life, Ramses saw the basic Sethos, stripped of disguise, his features undistorted. His resemblance to Emerson was unnerving. It was like seeing his father, aged and ill and defenseless. How long has he been this way? Ramses asked. Last night he came, Fatima whispered. She was crying again. He was very sick with fever. Malaria, Ramses said. He's had it before. Did he send you to get the pills? When he woke this morning, she wiped her wet face. He wrote the word so I would know what to look for. He did not want you to know he was here. I did not have a chance to get away before now. I am sorry, Ramses. He's the one who should be sorry. He had no right to put you in this position. Oh, but he is my friend, and he needed my help. That would do it, Ramses thought. Sethos had gone out of his way to ingratiate himself with Fatima, treating her with the same courtly charm he bestowed on real ladies and paying her extravagant compliments. An appeal to her large sympathies would have tipped the scale of divided loyalties. Malaria wasn't curable. Once infected, the victim was subject to recurrent bouts whose onsets were unpredictable. Ramses tried to remember what Nefret had told him about the disease, when she had nursed Sethos through his first attack. In this form, the sufferer was coherent and fairly comfortable in the morning. In late afternoon, chills set in, to be followed by high fever and sometimes delirium. We'd better wake him up and get him to take this, Ramses said. He bent over Sethos, who was wearing one of Emerson's nightshirts, and shook him none too gently. Sethos opened his eyes. He showed no surprise at the sight of Ramses, though his expression was not welcoming. I didn't suppose she'd be able to hold out for long, he said, resignedly. She didn't tell me. I caught her stealing your quinine. Ramses opened the bottle. How much are you supposed to take? One grain, three times a day. I've been on the run for weeks. No chance to replenish my supplies. I will bring food, Fatima said, and bustled out. This was a filthy trick to play on her, Ramses said. Why didn't you come to father or me? A spark of unregenerate amusement lit the pale eyes and the sunken sockets. I didn't want the fret to get her hands on me when I was weak and helpless. I'm in no mood for humor. Give me credit for a faint residue of decency, then. I wouldn't have come near the place if I hadn't been laid low by this damned malaria. I heard... Oh, thank you, Fatima. That looks delicious. He pulled himself to a sitting position and took the tray from her. His hands weren't too steady. Was the afternoon onset starting already? Ramses had no way of knowing for sure, but Sethos could even use weakness as a defense. You heard what? Ramses asked. With a little cluck of distress, Fatima took the bowl of soup from the tray and began feeding her patient. Do not bother him, Ramses. He is falling sick again. Sethos obediently opened his mouth when she pushed the spoon against his lips. After he had swallowed, he said, I may as well wait to explain myself until my entire doting family is assembled. You will tell them I'm here, of course. Of course. You heard what? Open, Fatima ordered. Sethos grinned at Ramses. After he had finished most of the soup, he said weakly, I'm sorry, Fatima, it's very tasty, but I can't, I can't eat any more. 
he sank back on the pillow and closed his eyes. Ramses couldn't resist a parting shot. I'm going to fetch Nefret. Even that threat didn't get a response. A long shiver ran through Sethos's body. Fatima pulled another blanket over him. I will sit with him, Ramses, until Nefret comes. If not in order, it was a very strong suggestion. Ramses beat an ignominious retreat, swearing under his breath. Work was out of the question. He did not carry out his threat of going for Nefret. By the time he reached the West Valley, she and the others would be getting ready to close down for the day. He decided to make a quick survey of the premises. Sethos had got to the house without being intercepted, but he might have been followed. Jamad was enjoying his afternoon nap, stretched out on a pile of straw in one of the stalls. Ramses saddled Risha himself. He made a circuit of the house, going some distance into the desert before returning toward the river and skirting the edge of the cultivation. The scene was disarmingly peaceful. The fields were lined with egrets like a lacy white border. The farmers welcomed them, since they ate insects that might damage the crops. Ramses saw nothing to arouse misgivings. Maybe Smith had actually kept his promise to lead the watchers away. He got back in time to greet his mother and Nefret, who were accompanied by Selim and Daoud. They all settled down on the veranda, and Ramses was trying to think how to break the news to them, when the door of the house opened and Karim staggered out, balancing a loaded tray. A round-faced, unquenchably cheerful youth, he was the only so-called footman to survive Fatima's nagging. Ramses got to him in time to keep a pile of cups from sliding to the floor. Unabashed, Karim smiled proudly and managed to get the tray onto the table without further mishap. You see, we are ready for you, Sitakim, he announced. Where is Fatima? that lady inquired. You had better sit down, Ramses said. She's not ill, is she? Nefret asked anxiously. Her mother-in-law was quicker, or perhaps, Ramses thought, she had got the news in a dream from Abdullah. He's come, she said. Where is he? Ramses got rid of Karim by sending him to fetch the napkins he had forgotten. Sit down and have your tea first, he urged. Everything is under control. Ha! Huh? said his mother. But she did as he asked, pouring with a steady hand while he told them. The responses were varied. Selim's neat black beard parted in a white-toothed grin. He had enjoyed his earlier adventures with Sethos, whom he considered quite a dashing person. Daoud, holding his cup daintily in the palm of his big hand, only nodded. Very little surprised him. Malaria again? Nefret put her cup down and started to rise. Damn, I'd better go to him. He's had one dose of quinine, Ramses said. Don't go rushing off, darling. You look tired. What are we going to do about this development? His mother selected an iced biscuit from the plate. What can we do but accept it? Finish your tea, Nefret, and then we will have a little chat with... with our visitor. All of us, Selim asked, hopefully. Why not? When they crowded into the small, shadowy room, Sethos was awake. Splendid, he gasped, trying to keep his teeth from chattering. Dowd and Selim, too. Where's Emerson? Cairo, Nefret sat down on the edge of the bed. Open the curtains, Ramses. I need more light. Better not, Ramses said. I'll get a lamp. I will do it, Fatima said. She slipped out. She is ashamed, Selim declared, as she should be, to deceive the Sitakim. There was no damage done, said that lady coolly. At least I hope there wasn't. No one followed me, Sethos muttered. I wouldn't have come if I had thought. A violent fit of shivering ran through him. Fatima crept in, carrying a lamp, and Nefret said, Everybody out. You can't question him now. No, her mother-in-law agreed. But you are not going to sit with him. I will do that. I beg you will not argue, Nefret. I know precisely what to do. Go and tidy up the tea with the children, and get Karim to make a fresh pot. Karim! Fatima let out a gasp of horror. Did he serve the tea? It is not time. Oh, 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 it is my fault. Did he break any of the beautiful dishes? Not yet, 
Ramses said. Go and take charge, Fatima, his mother said. You can join me here later. Fatima twisted her hands together. You're not angry with me, said Hakim. Not very. A forgiving smile took the sting out of the words. Run along. Remembering the usual course of the disease, Ramses knew it would be morning before they could get any sense out of Sethos, even supposing he was inclined to tell the truth. If his mother had hoped Sethos would wax confidential while alone with her, she was disappointed. When Fatima relieved her and she joined the others on the veranda, her lips were tightly set, and she indulged in an extra glass of whiskey. Remember, she said, when Dawood and Selim were ready to leave, no one must know he's here. Yes, Sitakim, said Dawood. He considered his reply, decided it was somewhat ambiguous, and to be on the safe side added, I hear and obey. He'll tell Khadija, Nefret said, after their friends had left. Her mother-in-law smiled. Dawood's wife, a massively dignified woman of Nubian extraction, was one of their closest friends and a natural-born healer. He thinks of her as part of himself. She will understand the situation and keep her own counsel. They spent the rest of the afternoon entertaining the twins and trying to keep the great cat of Ray from abusing the dog. Over dinner they engaged in futile but irresistible speculation. How was Emerson going to react? How could they keep Sethos's presence a secret? Would Karim manage to serve the soup without spilling it? Nefret insisted on having another look at Sethos after dinner, but was then persuaded to go to bed and leave the nursing to Ramses and his mother. Sethos was in the next stage of malaria, burning with fever and semi-comatose. When the fever broke later that night, they had to change the sheets— his mother modestly turned her back while Ramses got Sethos into a dry nightshirt. His arm is bandaged, he said. Was he injured? His mother said over her shoulder, A bullet graze. It's become infected. I must change the bandage. Is he, um, covered? Yes. The bullet had ripped out a sizable strip of flesh. It looked ugly, inflamed, and oozing. Sethos twitched and muttered while she disinfected it and replaced the bandage, but did not waken. Ramses succeeded in sending her off to bed once the patient was cool and comfortable. "'Call me if there is any change,' was her last order. "'There won't be. Good night, mother.' He extinguished the lamp and made himself as comfortable as possible in an overstuffed chair brought from Fatima's room. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he kept his eyes on the shaded window. No movement, except for the swaying of the fabric in the night breeze. He considered the afternoon's activities, wondering if there was anything else he could or should do. The trouble was that most of their questions could only be answered by Sethos. Should they notify Smith? And if so, how? What about Margaret? Sethos might know how to reach her. They sure as hell didn't. Ramses had had a long heart-to-heart -heart talk with Karim, and he felt sure he had put the fear of God and the father of curses into that inveterate gossip. Dawood was also an expert gossip, but he was a man of his word, and he had sworn not to speak of the presence of a stranger. Fatima wasn't likely to talk. None of the other servants was currently sleeping at the house. They would find out about Fatima's patient next day, though, and eventually one of them would mention that Fatima had taken in another beggar. He could only hope that Sethos's pursuers were off on another trail, or that they would fail to put two and two together. He slept lightly, knowing that any unusual noise would bring him to full wakefulness. Once a rustle of the bedclothes roused him, when he bent over his uncle, Sethos was sound asleep, or pretending to be, his breathing slow and even, Resisting the impulse to shake him, Ramses pulled the blankets up to his chin and returned to his cramped chair. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I woke just before dawn. The memory of the previous day's events rushed into my mind, dispelling any temptation to further slumber. Without pausing to dress, I assumed a comfortable dressing gown and went through the courtyard to the servant's wing. Ramses woke when I opened the door. Seeing me, he relaxed 
yawned, and rubbed his eyes. You look very uncomfortable, dear boy, I said. I am, he rose and stretched stiffened limbs. He hasn't stirred. He is awake, I said. Go and have a wash and some food, my dear. I heard Fatima moving about in the kitchen. Sethos waited until Ramses had gone before he rolled over and addressed me. What, no chaperone? What would Emerson say if he found us like this? You in that very fetching dressing gown, and me... Not a sight to inspire amorous feelings in a female. You sound very chipper. Are you hungry? That's the way malaria works, as you know. He stretched luxuriously. Ah, there is Fatima with my breakfast. Enjoy it, I said. Why don't you go and enjoy yours? I have a few questions, Amelia, dear. I can't eat and talk at the same time. Ramses and the fret will want to be present when you interrogate me. So why don't we wait until... I only wanted to ask about your grandson. We haven't heard from Mariam for a while. He hadn't expected such a harmless question. His eyes narrowed. Then he shrugged. As you know, my daughter and I are not on the best of terms these days. I disapproved of her choice of a husband and was foolish enough to tell her so. I don't understand what you have against Mr. Bennett. He is a respectable man with an excellent reputation. You had him investigated, did you? Naturally. I didn't trust you to do it without prejudice. Are you sure you aren't jealous? Sethos put his fork down. You are spoiling my appetite, Amelia. Painful truths often have that effect. You feel you have been supplanted with daughter and grandson. It is only natural that you should feel resentment. Are you always right? Sethos said with sudden violence. Mariam and I had become friends after years of estrangement, and I scarcely know the little boy. Whose fault is that? I had seldom seen his countenance so unguarded. It was not a pretty sight. Anger tightened his mouth and lit sparks in the strange pale eyes that could be brown or green or grey. I had obviously struck not one nerve, but a bundle of them. Well, we will leave that for a future time, I said, rising. Have a good breakfast. I cannot say that I enjoyed mine. Maman's food was as good as always, but watching Karim stumble in and out, dropping boiled eggs and spilling coffee, tried nerves already on edge. I hadn't realized relations between Sethos and his child had become so strained. It was primarily his fault, of course. He had made some attempt to look after the girl, but her mother, his former mistress, hated Sethos as much as he detested her. And after Bertha's death... Mariam blamed her father and left him to join the group of criminals Bertha had founded. The birth of Mariam's son and her subsequent reformation had reconciled father and daughter. Now, Sethos had made a mess of that, too. It was just like him. I added another item to my mental list of things to do. Fatima is with her beggar, Karim announced. I know, I said. She has a good heart. Is he a holy man? Karim inquired. Nefret took the coffee pot from him. Very holy, she said. He wishes to be left alone in order to meditate and recover. We paid Sethos the courtesy of waiting until he had had time to breakfast and tidy up before we returned to his room. Though, in the opinion of several of us, it was a courtesy he did not deserve. We found him sitting up in bed. Pillows plumped and blankets smoothed, holding a coffee cup. Fatima and his breakfast tray had discreetly vanished. As I might have expected, he went on the offensive before any of us could speak. I feel naked without some sort of disguise, he grumbled. Ramses, can you oblige? It was not an unreasonable request. Though unshaven and hollow-cheeked, Without her suit adornment, he was the image of Emerson, even to the cleft in his chin. "'What were you wearing when you arrived?' I asked, sitting down on the side of the bed. "'A voluminous, if somewhat wispy, grey beard, and a patchwork galabia. Fatima wouldn't let me have them back.' "'Ah, the old beggar disguise,' I said. "'She has probably burned it.' 
There were a few insects inhabiting the beard, Sethos admitted. Authenticity is very important in... Never mind. Ramses will see to it, I said. Later. Start talking, if you please. What about? Ramses emitted a growling noise, as his father was wont to do when exasperated. What have you done? Who is after your blood? Quite a lot of people, I expect, was the cheerful reply. He caught Nefret's eyes and looked a trifle shamefaced. It's rather a long story. We have all morning, I replied, settling myself in the overstuffed chair with a pad of paper on my knee and a pencil in my hand. You all know, Sethos began. Then he stopped speaking and eyed me askance. Amelia, what are you doing? Taking notes, of course. Thanks to those notes and my excellent memory, I am able to give the reader an accurate account of his long and rather rambling explanation. You all know what the situation in the Middle East is like since the war. The great powers have carved up the parts of the Ottoman Empire to suit themselves. France won't give up her interests in Syria. Britain has a mandate over Palestine. And Gertie Bell and her crowd have cobbled together a new kingdom of Iraq from an unholy mixture of warring factions, with a king none of them wanted on the throne and a British commissioner in actual charge. The Kurds were promised independence, but Gertie won't let them have it, since Iraq, without Mosul and its oil, can't stand. That old fox Ibn Saud is arguing about borders and hoping for control over Syria. If that weren't bad enough, Britain, under pressure from the Zionists, has come out in favor of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The Arabs are afraid the Zionists will take their land. The Jews are divided between Zionists and those who oppose a temporal state. The Arab League demands the independence Lawrence promised them. And Fuad of Egypt is playing backstairs politics in the old Ottoman style. There have been rumors about... The hesitation was so brief, only one who knew Sethos well would have noticed it. About a shadowy group that is bent on stirring up mischief for reasons that remain obscure. Not a difficult task, given the situation. I was sent to Baghdad and Damascus to see what I could find out. By the way, he added with genuine feeling, the archaeological sites are being torn to pieces. There's no control over illicit digging, and some marvellous pieces are being sold to collectors. Ramsay's black eyebrows drew together. So you decided to rescue some of them? And you're being hunted by competitors? If I had done, it would have been an act of rescue, Sethos retorted. But as it happens, the um, object I made off with was not an antiquity. I found it in the private files of a certain official in Baghdad. Don't be coy, Ramses said. Who? The name would mean nothing to you. He stays out of the public eye, and not many people know that he is a kind of deus ex machina, a player behind the scenes. I had to take the damn thing rather than copy it, because it was in code and my time was limited. If it was in code, how did you know it was worth stealing? Because it was in code, Sethos said, with exaggerated patience, and in a locked file that required all my talents to open. One doesn't go to all that trouble with linen lists. Go on, Ramses said between his teeth. I knew its absence would be noted. In fact, Sethos admitted, my departure from the scene was not without incident. So I wasn't surprised when I ran into a spot of trouble at the railway station the following day. What did surprise me was that I recognized the drunken coffee seller who tried to push me under the train. He works for the department that used to be headed by your old friend, Cartwright. British intelligence, Ramses exclaimed. Why would they try to kill you? Precisely what I asked myself. I had, like a loyal little spy, intended to take the damn thing back to Cairo and hand it over. That incident put a damper on my zeal. It was obvious I'd been under surveillance the whole time, or they wouldn't have been able to get on my trail so quickly. That's a standard technique, Ramses said, his lip curling. They don't trust anybody. I am well aware of that. Still, that assumption that I might put the confounded thing up for sale rather than turn it in struck me as a trifle unkind. 
Instead of taking the Cairo train, I slipped out and returned later, in time to catch a train to Damascus. It was there that the second attack occurred, and I barely got away from three ugly fellows with long knives, who were almost certainly not hired by our lot. You might have been followed from Baghdad, I suggested. Not by our chap. Sethos's smile was not pretty. I left him under the train. Nefret put her hand to her mouth. Sethos's smile vanished. I didn't set out to kill him, Nefret. He'd have pitched me onto the track if I hadn't slipped out of his grasp. It put him off balance and, well, to make a long story short, after several further incidents, I was forced to the conclusion that I had become an object of interest to a number of different groups. I made it to Egypt, but I didn't dare go near headquarters. They might be after me too, or there might be a traitor in the organization. I thought I'd got everyone off my trail by the time I reached Luxor. And then I heard of Ramsey's and Emerson's encounter at the greengrocer's. So I went off again, as far as Aswan, and wandered conspicuously around town until I attracted attention. That's when I got this. He touched his arm. Since then I've been moving rapidly, doubling back on my trail and keeping a wary eye out. For the past few days, I've been holed up in the cellar of a ruined shack in Cebu al-Karim. Felt this coming on last night, and decided to come here. It's very touching, Ramses said, that you should seek out your loved ones. Nefret frowned at him. Sethos said coolly, I had a more practical reason. I can't make plans. I can't trust anyone until I know what's in that document. You're good at codes and ciphers. Ramses remained silent. Watching him, Sethos went on. I hadn't intended to come to the house. That's the truth, whether you believe it or not. I was about to communicate with you indirectly and ask for a meeting in a neutral spot when I fell ill. I don't believe I was followed here, but, well, the damage is done. Whatever this document contains, some people want it very badly. Badly enough to come after you again if they can't find me. I cleared my throat. If you will forgive me for saying so, that is the most preposterous story I have ever heard. Sethos's haggard face broadened in a grin. I take that as a compliment, Amelia. You have heard a good many preposterous stories over the years. But really, I exclaimed, this one is straight out of sensational fiction. Secret societies, shadowy organizations, a mysterious document obtained from an individual you can't or won't name. You'll have to do better than that, my friend, if you want our cooperation. Still smiling, Sethos looked from me to Ramses. Whether he meant to or not, the latter said slowly, he has us over a barrel. Where is the damned document? In the cellar, I mentioned, hidden under a dead dog. Nefret winced, and Sethos said, It was already conveniently dead, Nefret. I'd better go after it, then, before someone else does. Ramses rose. Take Dowd and sell him. Sethos leaned back and closed his eyes. And try to think of a reasonable excuse for being there, in case someone sees you. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Offhand, Ramses couldn't think of a reasonable excuse for visiting the poor little village, much less the ruined house. He was furious with his uncle, and Selim's delight at participating in the venture annoyed him even more. Was everyone except his father and him under Sethos's spell? The village was one of several that bordered the cultivation south of the temple of Seti I. As they rode toward it, Selim said, We are looking for tombs, yes? There aren't any in that area. Who can say? Dawood inquired. He was riding Emerson's gelding, the only horse in the stable that was up to his weight. He speaks the truth, Selim said. We heard a rumor, eh? That is not hard to believe. There are always rumors of tombs. I suppose so, Ramses said grudgingly. He ought to have thought of that excuse himself. It was Sethos's fault for getting him too angry to think straight but it was unfair of him to take out his ill humor on Selim. While we look for tombs, Daud will go into the house and find the paper, Selim said. You'd leave the dead dog to him, Ramses asked with a smile. I do not mind, 
Daoud said placidly. What does it look like, this paper? Their arrival brought the villagers out in full force. Most of the men were working in the fields, so their audience consisted of women, small children, and the usual livestock, plus a few doddering old men. When Ramses asked about new tombs, they were deluged with information from everybody except the livestock. Ramses knew he was the chief attraction. This sad little place was seldom visited by foreigners, and the visit of a member of the family of the Father of Curses was an event that would be talked about for days. He and Selim made their way through a tumble of toddlers and barking dogs, led by the old gentleman who had appointed himself guide, and trailed by the rest of the local citizens. The noise level was high. There were a few tombs in the rocky surroundings, all small and empty, except for thick layers of trash. They spent more time examining them than the wretched places merited, and then started back. Daoud was waiting with the horses. His large, amiable face wore a smile, and his hand was in the breast of his robe. Not until they were well away from the village did Ramses ask, You found it? Yes. Handing over a small packet, sealed all round with heavy tape, he added, It was buried deep. The dog was a joke, I think. There were only bones. Typical, Ramses muttered. Open it, Selim urged. Ramses was curious, too. Drawing his knife, he slit the tape and pulled back the rubberized fabric. Inside, between pieces of pasteboard, were two sheets of folded paper. There are no words on the paper, Selim said, leaning closer. What does it mean? Is it what you wanted? Want? Hell no. I don't want the damn thing. But I guess I'm stuck with it. The symbols were numbers, dozens of them. The only codes and ciphers with which he was familiar used letters of the alphabet. Bloody hell, Ramses said. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. On the Wednesday, we were in receipt of a telegram from Emerson announcing his arrival the following morning. That was all it said. I would have appreciated a trifle more information, something along the lines of have hired new staff or have not hired new staff, but I was only too familiar with Emerson's disinclination to spend good money on telegrams. Sethos's condition had improved. According to Nefret, he would be out of the woods in another day or two. Ramses had supplied him with a rather raggedy grizzled beard and enough putty to sculpt a new nose. Sethos seemed to enjoy playing with the latter. Over the course of the day, the contours of his nose changed from retroussé to hooked to concave. I hadn't realized how drastically the shape of a nasal appendage can alter one's appearance. My own experiments with the putty were not successful. The cursed stuff wouldn't stick. I decided there must be some trick to it and determined to ask Ramses at a later time. I was unable to extract any additional information out of Sethos, even when I showed him the little list I had made. You have absolutely no idea who is involved in this shadowy organization of yours? Smiling his irritating smile, he read the list aloud. The French, the Zionists, the anti-Zionists, Ibn Saud, Faisal of Iraq, the British Secret Service, Sharif Hussein, Gertrude, Gertrude Bell... Come now, Amelia. I know you and she don't get on, but... I do not approve of women who claim the privileges of men for themselves but deny them to other women. She is a confirmed anti-feminist with a monumental ego. She fancies herself a kingmaker. Such people consider that the end justifies the means. It could be any of them, or all of them, or none of them, Sethos said, tacitly accepting my judgment of Miss Bell. Not a very comforting conclusion, I must say. Did you discuss your list with Ramses? I am thoroughly conversant with the present political situation, I replied. I never lie, unless it is absolutely necessary. It is even more volatile than your initial summary suggested, since Ibn Saud defeated his chief rival, the Rashid ad Hayil. I know, I know, Sethos said, somewhat abstractedly. Hayil is where you and Margaret first met, isn't it? Where is she now? Sethoff started. You do have an unnerving habit of jumping from one subject to another, he complained. I don't know where she is. What would you do with the address if you had it? 
You surely didn't intend to inform her I was with you, or issue an urgent summons to Luxor. You might as well stand in the sook and shout the news aloud. Would she not wish to be by your side when danger threatened? I asked. My dear Amelia, you are such a romantic. I'll tell you what will fetch her, though. If that tomb of Carter's turns out to be big news, she'll be the first on the spot. He was playing the same trick on me, but I decided not to challenge the change of subject. Who told you about the tomb? Ramses? Ramses is avoiding me these days. Hadn't you noticed? No, it was Selim. He and Dawood believe the omens are propitious. The golden bird, I said with a sniff. It is only Howard's canary. That was Dawood. Selim isn't superstitious. From his description, I'd say Carter may have come upon something interesting. He moved restlessly. I'd love to have a look for myself. When can I get up? Not until Emerson arrives. You aren't afraid I'll bolt, are you? You aren't fool enough to try that. We must find a new identity for you and work out some explanation for your presence. The dying beggar won't serve much longer. I have a few ideas, Sethos said pensively. I'm sure you do. Try to control your extravagant imagination. Emerson will be here tomorrow, and then we will have a council of war. I am afire with anticipation at the prospect. Emerson had hired the two new staff members, and what is more, he had brought them with him. We were all at home that morning. Nefret had patience, and Ramses was still struggling with Sethos's mystery document. I sent Fatima to summon Ramses and greeted the newcomers. As I told you, Peabody, they suit our requirements admirably, said Emerson. I trust their rooms are ready. As I told you, Emerson, they will be staying with Cyrus, I replied. My temper was firmly under control. I did not even mention the fact that Emerson had neglected to tell me they were coming with him. I will notify Catherine at once that they are here. If you would like to freshen up, Mademoiselle Malraux, Fatima, will show you to the guest room and supply anything you need. Oh, please, Mrs. Emerson, do not be so formal. The girl's eyes widened alarmingly, but I decided she was only attempting to indicate goodwill. I hope you, all of you, will call me Suzanne. A murmur from Mr. Farid included a pair of syllables that sounded like a name. Suzanne and Naji, then, I said with a smile. Having dealt with the immediate problems caused by Emerson's lack of consideration, I invited the young people to join us for luncheon, it being almost time for that meal. My motives were part hospitality, part cowardice. I had given some consideration as to how to break the news of his brother's presence to Emerson, and had come to the conclusion that there really was no way of doing it tactfully. This enabled me to delay the revelation a little longer. The young lady bubbled with Gallic enthusiasm about the house and its arrangements. I had glimpses of a beautiful garden, Mrs. Emerson. May I hope for a stroll later? I am exceedingly fond of flowers. You will have ample time to enjoy the garden in the weeks to come, I replied. I am sorry we were unable to ask you to stay with us, but we are constantly in and out of one another's houses, and Mr. Vandergelt's home is much more elegant than ours. "'What's the news from Cairo?' Ramses asked, knowing Emerson was about to tell us anyhow. "'Carter is there, and Carnarvon is on his way,' said Emerson. "'As far as he was concerned, there was only one matter of interest in Cairo. "'By chance, I happened to run into Carter. But "'What did you say, Peabody?' "'Nothing, my dear. Do go on.' "'That's all,' Emerson said grumpily. "'except that Carter has been calling on all his friends, "'dropping veiled hints and looking mysterious when they ask questions. "'Fine way to keep his discovery a secret.' "'Why should he?' I asked. "'The wire he sent Lord Carnarvon was known to all of Luxor, "'and I expect his lordship has confided in a number of his friends, "'who have confided in their friends. "'There is no keeping such things secret. "'The archaeological community is abuzz with rumours,' Suzanne said. Is it true, Mrs. Emerson, that Mr. Carter has found a new, unrobbed tomb? The professor wouldn't tell us anything. Said I wouldn't, Emerson grunted, attacking his food with vigor. I keep to my word. 
Nudgy, who had spoken very little, looked up. His English was excellent, with only the slightest trace of an Egyptian accent. The word had got round before your arrival, sir. You have nothing with which to reproach yourself. But you have actually seen the tomb, Suzanne exclaimed, her eyes popping. Please tell us. It can't be kept secret for long, can it? I only hope Howard has not raised Lord Carnarvon's expectations too high, I replied. Then... Seeing no reason to remain discreet when Howard and Carnarvon had not done so, I went on. Thus far, he has found a sealed doorway, with what appears to be a blocked passage behind it. The signs are hopeful, but one never knows, does one? I expect we won't have to wait long, though. Carnarvon will surely wish to press on to Luxor as soon as possible. Ramsay said to his father, Calendar is here. Picky calendar. What the devil for? He's no Egyptologist. But he is a trusted friend of Carter's. I believe he's been instructed to prepare for Carnarvon's arrival. Emerson scowled darkly. I knew what he was thinking. I always do. He had offered his services, which had not been accepted. It was a snub, and I felt for him, all the more since he was due for an even more painful shock. We had just finished luncheon when the reply to my note to Catherine came, expressing her pleasure at receiving the two new members of our staff and inviting us to dine that evening. She had sent the Vandergelt's carriage for them and their luggage. We will see you tonight at dinner, I said. No, Emerson, there is no need for you to accompany them. They will want to have a little rest this afternoon. I thought we might go on to the valley, said Emerson, trying to detach my grip on his arm. They will want to see. Not this afternoon, Emerson. Hearing something in my tone, Emerson objected no further. After the carriage had driven off, he turned to me. You have all been behaving very oddly, he said, looking from one of us to the other. What has happened? Sit down, father, Nefret said. Good gad, Emerson cried in anguished tones. Not one of the kiddies. Now stop that, Emerson. I said severely. Do you suppose we would all be so calm if something had happened to one of the children? No, guess again. Emerson dropped into a chair. The tomb has been robbed, he said, in a hollow voice. Pecky Calendar is no more use than... At least you put the children before the tomb, I snapped. Allow me to remind you once again that it is not your tomb. Guess again. Emerson's noble brow furrowed. Give me a hint. Confound you, Emerson, I began. How can you have forgotten? Not so loud, mother. Nefret, who'd been struggling with laughter, sat on the arm of Emerson's chair and put a finger to his lips. We have a guest, father. The... Oh, dear, how can I put this? The person who inspired your adventure at the shop. The fire, the bag of salt, the... As comprehension gradually dawned, her dainty finger proved inadequate to the task. Hell and damnation, Emerson shouted. Has that bust? Has he had the effrontery to come here? He was ill, Nefret said. Please, father, don't fly off the handle. And keep your voice down, I added. How successful we have been in concealing his presence, I cannot say. But there is nothing to be gained by shouting it from the rooftops. Emerson could not get up without dislodging Nefret. He squirmed a bit, but she stayed firmly in place. Oh, bah, he said in a strangled voice. Ramses, would you care to explain how this came about? No, Peabody, not you. You are inclined to digress, and I want a succinct, informative account without commentary. He got it. In my opinion, Ramses might have elaborated a trifle more. However, my attempts to add colour to the narrative were ignored by all parties. When Ramses had finished, Emerson sat in silence for a time, stroking his prominent chin. That is the most preposterous story I've ever heard, he said at last. That was my initial reaction, I admitted. And I feel sure Sethos hasn't told us all he knows. However, this is a preposterous world, Emerson, and some persons will stop at nothing to gain their ends. Emerson could not deny this. We had encountered a number of such persons, and history had preserved the names of many others.
this mysterious paper, he said. Have you succeeded in deciphering it? Ramses shook his head. It's really not my field of expertise, father. You need not apologize, my boy. Very well. You can get up now and fret. My temper is firmly under control. I want to see him. Now. Naturally, I went with Emerson. He appeared to be in a reasonable state of mind, but there was no telling how long it would last if his brother provoked him, which he was almost certain to do. Sethos was sitting up in bed, reading. He greeted Emerson effusively, but without surprise. I heard you were back, he exclaimed. Who were the two people who came with you? His attempt at insouciance did not deceive Emerson, for the beard and the silly nose failed to conceal the hollowness of his cheeks and his sickly complexion. Fatima told you, I suppose, Emerson said gruffly. The two newcomers are members of our staff, Egyptologists, well known to me. Um, how are you feeling? Much better. It is good of you to ask. Mm -hmm. Said Emerson. What the devil are we to do with you, eh? That sounds more like you, said Sethos. I'll be out of here as soon as Nefret gives me leave. Emerson sat down heavily on the side of the narrow bed. Where will you go? I'll stay in touch. Damn right you will, said Emerson. Curse it. You can't simply stroll out the front door. Your adversaries aren't all fools. If they discover you have been here, they will assume we have your confounded sacred message, or a copy of it. Sethos's eyes fell. What do you suggest? he asked meekly. Emerson studied him with suspicion. Meekness was not one of Sethos's normal traits. You will need a new persona, he said. The role that comes to mind is one you've played before. It is known that we are taking on additional staff. Brilliant, Sethos exclaimed. Who shall I be then? Petrie? Alan Gardner? Control yourself, I said firmly. You cannot take on the identity of a well-known person. You had better be a philologist. You can spend your time with Ramses, ostensibly working on the papyri from Dare and Medina, and avoiding situations that could betray your ignorance of archaeological technique. I'm not all that ignorant, Sethos said indignantly. We can work out the details later, said Emerson. The most important thing is that the elderly beggar must go. Little did we know, but he already had, into a more distant realm. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Cyrus was delighted with the additions to his staff. Some of the others were less enthusiastic. When they met at dinner that night, Jumana was unnaturally silent. Ramses couldn't decide which of the newcomers she resented. She was cool, verging on brusque with both of them. Bertie flirted clumsily with Suzanne, and Catherine smiled benignly upon them. She would have been delighted to see Bertie turn his attentions from Jumana to a respectable European girl. Bertie did have a gift for falling in love with women of whom his mother disapproved. For a while, he had taken a fancy to Sethos's illegitimate daughter, whose criminal past did not recommend her as a daughter-in-law. Presumably, Mariam's engagement to a dull but respectable merchant had put an end to that. They had all been surprised at the announcement. Bennett was middle-aged, plain and dull. Mariam's background was not precisely respectable— However, as Ramsay's mother was fond of saying, love is unpredictable. To dull Mr. Bennett, Mariam must represent youth, charm, romance, and after her exotic life, Mariam might look forward to a bit of boredom. Now we can make progress, Cyrus declared, motioning his butler to refill the wine glasses. As soon as we finish clearing the burial chamber of I's tomb, Mamselle can start copying the paintings and Bertie can draw up a final plan. First thing tomorrow morning, eh? Is that all right with you, Emerson? What? said Emerson, staring. His wife frowned at him. Emerson feels, as do I, that we ought to allow our new friends a day of sightseeing before they begin work. It has been some time since they were in Luxor, I believe. I have never been, said Suzanne, and I would love to see the places I've read about... Deir el-Bahri, the Valley of the Kings, Deir el-Medina, and all the rest. If you don't mind, Mr. Vandergelt. Fine, fine, said Cyrus. The Sitter Kim's word was law to him. 
Good, said that lady. Why don't you all join us for breakfast, and we will decide upon an itinerary? The Emersons did not keep a carriage. It was pure perversity on Emerson's part. He clung to the hope that his wife would accept the motor car as a substitute, which Ramses doubted she ever would. When she nagged her husband, Emerson pointed out that Cyrus's carriage was always at their disposal, as was the case that night. On the return trip, no one spoke for a time. Only the distant howl of a jackal broke the stillness. Ramses put his arm round his wife. The crisp night breeze blew a strand of her hair across his face, and starlight turned the landscape into patterns of iron grey and silver. He thought of Cairo, the stench of rubbish, the fetid air, the crowded noisy streets. Shut away in their walled compounds, the foreign residents avoided these discomforts. He wouldn't, though, and neither would Nifret. The hospital she had founded was in one of the foulest parts of the city, near the infamous Red Blind District. She had walked those vile streets many times, unafraid and unmolested, but he had always hated the thought of her doing so. Nifret, half asleep against his shoulder, stirred and spoke. I think the newcomers are going to work out well. Hmm said her mother-in-law, seated across from them. I confess to having some misgivings. You're the one who wanted to take them on, Ramses said. Professionally, they suit admirably, but I did not consider fully the social ramifications. Nefret chuckled. Betty was only flirting with Suzanne to make Jemana jealous. Jemana is jealous, but not of Betty, Ramses said. She's afraid she will take second place to Suzanne. Cyrus really ought to give her an official title and position. She's earned it. I agree, his mother said. You must speak to him about it, Emerson. What? It was still early when they reached the house to find Selim on the veranda, drinking coffee. A bit late for a call, isn't it? said Emerson. Don't be rude, said his wife. It isn't late. I suggested we leave the castle early because we have an important matter to settle tonight. What? said Emerson. For a moment, Ramses thought his mother was going to fly at her oblivious husband. Sethos, she hissed through her teeth. It was a name made for hissing. Oh, said Emerson, fingering his chin. Selim, who usually enjoyed their exchanges, remained grave. I have news, Sitakim, he said. I knew something had happened, she exclaimed. What? The old man is dead. The beggar. Emerson sat up straighter. What beggar? How? When? The old man's body had been found that evening behind a wall of the cemetery. How long it had been there, no one knew. The spot was not often visited. Selim had been among the first to hear of it. He had gone at once to examine the body. There was no mark of violence, no wound. I could tell because he had been stripped of his clothing. Why would anyone do that? Nefret asked in surprise. He owned nothing. He had nothing of value. He might have done it himself, Ramses said. Sometimes he did. He would walk about naked, talking to himself or to God, until a kind person took charge of him. Selim nodded. It is possible. His few pieces of clothing had not been taken away. They lay on the ground next to him. With a sidelong look at Nefret, he added, I did use he died in the night. The stiffness had gone from his feet and legs. As experts know, the process of rigor mortis is affected by many variables, including the temperature and the victim's physical condition. However, it was a reasonable deduction for Selim to make. He rather fancied himself as a detective. An excellent deduction, Selim, Nefret said. I suppose he's been buried? No, no, monsieur. He is here. They had laid him out, as reverently as possible, on a table in the garden shed, covered with a clean white sheet. Fatima sat by him. The lamplight reddened the tears on her cheeks. I wanted to wash the body, but Selim would not let me, she murmured. Good thinking, Selim, Ramses said. Nefret lowered the sheet. It was a scene straight out of Doré, or one of the illustrators who specialized in Gothic horrors, the shifting light and elusive shadows and the naked body, skeletally thin and pallid. Ancient dirt lay encrusted in the wrinkled flesh. 
A louse crawled out of the wispy grey hair. Normally one of the most fastidious of women, Nefret went over the body with professional detachment. Fatima let out little cries of protest. He is filthy and covered with insects, Normisur. Let me do that. It's all right, Fatima, Nefret said. Rigor is well advanced. No wounds on the face or skull. The poor man is covered with bruises and scrapes. Fatima, hand me that damn cloth. I want a better look at his throat. He was always falling and running into hard things. God be merciful to him, Fatima murmured. There are bruises on his neck, but no worse than the ones on the rest of his body, Nefret reported. It wouldn't take much to send a feeble old man like that into cardiac arrest, Ramsay's mother remarked. Oh, bah, said her husband, now fully attentive. You're always looking for signs of murder, Peabody. She limited her response to an evil look. But Ramses knew exactly what she was thinking. The poor old man's death couldn't have come at a more fortuitous time for them and Sethos. Selim cleared his throat. I told the men who brought him here that he had run away from you, and that you could help him, he said. Nefret, scrubbing her hands with the soap and water Fatima had supplied, turned to stare at him. Help him from being dead? her mother-in-law inquired caustically. He was ice-cold and stiff, wasn't he? They believe you can do magic, said Selim, scratching his beard. He should have been buried tonight, but they believed me when I said... He stuck there, unnerved by her sarcasm, and Ramses came to his rescue. You did right, Selim. The precise time of death is open to question. By the time the news spreads, people will confuse Fatima's patient with the old holy man, who will be unquestionably dead... This is the perfect moment for our guest to reappear in a new identity. That is what I thought, Selim declared. Let's have a little chat with um, him, said Emerson, heading for the door. Over his shoulder, he added, Ramses, fetch the whiskey. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. When our guests arrived for breakfast, we introduced them to the latest member of the staff. Sethos had reverted to his Antony Bisinghurst role. Ramses had supplied him with a dashing black moustache and dye to turn his pale face a healthy tan. He had also supplied him with clothes, for they were almost of a size. He was proving to be a cursed inconvenience in every way. We would have to order new garments for Ramses, since his wardrobe hadn't been extensive to begin with. A slow grin spread across Cyrus's face when he recognized Bisinghurst. Bertie and Jumana were also acquainted with him and with his true identity and had been sworn to secrecy. Poor Bertie, not the cleverest of individuals, hardly spoke a word, so fearful was he of saying the wrong thing. His silence caused no remark, since he hardly ever got a word in when the rest of us were conversing. Jumana's dark eyes shone with pleasure when... Tony bent over her hand. She had obviously been attracted to him when they last met, and, as was his habit, he had been at his most dashing and courtly. Perhaps she preferred older men. If that was the case, Bertie was doubly disadvantaged. No one could have called the poor boy dashing. Cyrus managed to have a word alone with me as we prepared to leave the house. Concern had replaced his amusement. "'What's up, Amelia?' That fella never appears unless there's trouble brewing. I will tell you about it another time, I replied, wondering what the devil I could tell him. It better not be Carter's Toomey's after, Cyrus muttered. Emerson will skin him alive if he tries any tricks. We went first to Deir el-Bahri, where the Metropolitan Museum crew was working, and then made the circuit of other temples before turning toward the Valley of the Kings. It was of necessity a cursory tour, but by the time we reached the entrance to the valley, anticipation had mounted. The persuasive air of suppressed excitement, I am sensitive to such things, surprised me. Clearly the word of a great discovery had spread, not as yet, to the general public, but among those who had a professional interest in such matters. I glanced at Sethos, who was walking beside me. He looked tired but alert. A new and ugly suspicion had taken root, seeded by Cyrus's remark. 
What evidence had we of the truth of Sethos's story? Only a mysterious document, which could not be deciphered, and his own word. The attacks on him and on us might have been made by rivals in the antiquities game. If he had returned to his old profession, Carter's tomb would present interesting possibilities. The tomb itself was something of an anticlimax. There was nothing to see except a pile of rubble that filled the stairwell and concealed the steps. After a glance, Suzanne raised her shoulders in an elegant Gallic shrug and joined the tourists entering the tomb of Ramses VI. Bertie trailed after her, and Jumana offered to show Naji some of the more interesting tombs. The rest of us stood staring as if hypnotized at the heaped-up debris. No signs of digging, Emerson muttered after a time. Even the experienced tomb robbers of Gona wouldn't tackle that, said Sethos, hands in his pockets and eyes intent. If any of them have illegal intentions, they'll wait until the stairs are clear, and the passageway, if it is a passageway, is open. Is that what you would do? Ramses inquired, his voice carefully neutral. It is what any sensible individual would do. Why go through all that hard manual labor, with very little chance of doing it unobserved, when you aren't certain that it would be worth the effort? The tomb robbers of Gono were not always sensible, but Sethos was. Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn arrived in Luxor on the 23rd. We were in the West Valley, completing the clearance of I's burial chamber. All of us except Sethos and Daoud. Sethos had shown signs of fatigue, so I had insisted he rest. Daoud ought to have been with us. The fact that Emerson did not ask about him ought to have given me a hint about his activities. When he turned up, we heard him coming long before he appeared, his large sandals rhythmically slapping the ground. "'They have gone to the tomb,' he panted, straight from the train. "'Well, of course,' said Emerson. "'Who could blame them?' "'Is it Lord Carnarvon and his daughter of whom you speak?' I asked. "'See here, Emerson, I won't have you herring off to the East Valley today.' "'Why would I do that?' Emerson gave me a look of injured innocence. After a moment, he added, "'Tomorrow will be soon enough. "'It will take several days to clear the steps again.' "'There was no restraining him, and I will admit to the reader "'that my interest was almost as keen as his.' After two weeks of uncertainty, we were within a few days of learning the truth. I could only imagine the state Howard must be in. Really, we owed it to him to express our support and friendship, particularly if, as was likely, the tomb proved to be empty. I did manage to convince Emerson he should wait until a reasonable hour next morning, pointing out that it would not be proper to anticipate the arrival of Lord Carnarvon, who would probably not be early. However, I had underestimated Carnarvon's zeal. When we arrived, Ramses and Nefret, Sethos, Emerson, and I, he and Lady Evelyn were on the scene, watching the workmen remove the debris under Howard's direction. George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert, 5th Earl of Carnarvon, was of medium height and slight build, with features which one could only call unmemorable. His eyes were pale, and his complexion, marred by the scars of smallpox, unhealthy. He had not been a well man since a serious motor accident some years earlier, though wintering in Egypt had improved his health and aroused his interest in Egyptology. I had met the young lady once before and found her somewhat silly and frivolous, a typical example of the young female aristocrat, but I had to admit she knew how to dress. Her skirt was mid-calf length, and her laced shoes had low heels. However, they had been dyed saffron to match her sports suit, and she wore a jaunty bow at her throat, of the same brown as her stylish toque. "'We drop by to welcome you back to Luxor,' said Emerson, wringing Carnarvon's hand, "'and congratulate you.' "'You'll think it looks promising, then?' Carnarvon asked eagerly. "'Too soon to tell,' Emerson said. "'You haven't uncovered the lower part of the door yet.' "'Don't be such a killjoy, Professor Emerson,' the young lady exclaimed. "'It's all so frightfully thrilling. Pops is frightfully bucked up.' She squeezed her father's arm. Emerson winced. He detests coy nicknames. 
That is right, I said. Always look on the bright side. Is there anything we can do to assist? Our son, as you know, is expert in the Egyptian language. Howard came forward, and Lady Evelyn turned a bright, admiring smile on him. Howard swelled up like a pouter pigeon. I believe I can claim to have the ability to carry out a proper excavation. However, if any more seals turn up, a second opinion would be useful. He nodded at Ramses, who said gravely, I would be happy to be of use, naturally. Emerson was peering down into the pit. You won't reach the bottom of the stairs before later this afternoon. How do you know how many steps there are? Lady Evelyn inquired pertly. Emerson shrugged away the question as he would have shrugged off a fly. Glancing at him, Howard said, The professor bases his appraisal on the apparent dimension of the doorway, Evelyn. It is standardized in tombs of this period. Isn't that right, sir? <clears throat> said Emerson. His hands flexed, as if aching to grasp a tool. No one was rude enough to tell us to go away. Nothing short of a direct order could have accomplished it, and Emerson would have ignored even that. We had waited for weeks to learn whether the doorway had been breached and what lay beyond it. We stood round the edge of the stairwell, watching with pent breath as step after step came into view. Down below, the shape of the doorway lengthened, but it was impossible to make out details owing to the lack of light. Finally, Rais Girigar called out, Sixteen steps, Mudir. The door is clear. Emerson was quivering like a hunting dog, waiting to be released. He controlled himself, however, and so Howard was the first to descend. Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn were next. A mumble of conversation followed, broken by the young lady's cries of excitement. Then Howard came back up. Oh, dear, I said. You don't look at all pleased, Howard. Don't tell me there are signs of forced entry. A hole. It was filled in afterward. But that is encouraging news, Carter, Ramsay said. If the tomb had been completely looted, the necropolis priests would not have bothered to close up the hole and stamp their seals all over the door. Are there any other seals? Dozens of them, Carnarvon gasped. His daughter helped him up the stairs. Hundreds. Carter couldn't read them. I should explain, in Howard's defence, that the seals to which Carnarvon referred had been stamped into the wet plaster after it was spread across the stones of the doorway. The passage of time, and perhaps the hastiness of the ancient workers, had wrought considerable damage on these impressions. Crumbling and broken, they were not easy to decipher, especially by a man in a considerable state of excitement. Nefret hastened to Carnarvon, and took his other arm. Sit down here in the shade, sir. Yes, do, perhaps. Lady Evelyn looked doubtfully at Nefret. You're a doctor, they tell me. Is he all right? It's just excitement, I think, Nefret said, with a reassuring smile. I can't rest until I know what their seals read, Carnarvon insisted. Is it a king's name? Whose name? Ramses, said Emerson. Relieve his lordship's mind, if you please. Yes, sir, Ramsay said. Unless Mr. Carter would rather... No, no, Carter said. That is, yes, come along. They went down together. Knowing his father was about to burst, Ramses reported his findings in a loud, clear voice. There are signs of entry at the top of the doorway. An uneven, roughly oval gap which has been blocked up again and resealed. There are more necropolis seals, the jackal and the nine kneeling captives, and a number of cartouches. A cry from Lord Carnarvon was echoed by one from Emerson. Whose? they shouted. Most of them are illegible, or nearly so. But they appear to be the same name. Carter said something in a low voice, a question to judge by the inflection. I agree, Ramsay said loudly. That is definitely a neb sign, and at the top, a sun disk. Neb keperure, Emerson said. Possibly, Ramsay said cautiously. Not Tutankhamun, Lady Evelyn asked. Neb keperure is Tutankhamun, I said. Chapter 4
For a few minutes, the silence was absolute. Had we indeed found the missing tomb of that shadowy monarch, the last of his line, the successor of the great heretic Akhnaten? When Howard and Ramses came up the stairs, Carnarvon burst out, "'The doorway must be dismantled immediately.' "'That would be inadvisable, sir,' Ramses said, "'for Howard seemed incapable of speech. "'We must preserve the seals if we can "'so that they can be studied in detail. "'That will take a while. "'Anyhow, according to protocol, "'an inspector of the Antiquities Department should be present. "'I presume you notified Mr. Engelbach "'that you would clear the stairwell today?' "'Howard nodded dumbly. "'Then where is he?' Carnarvon demanded. Why hasn't he had the courtesy to respond promptly to my message? He is a very busy man, I said. He has all of Upper Egypt in his jurisdiction, but I'm sure he'll be along soon. The febrile colour in his lordship's cheeks faded, leaving him pale and shaking. Nefret lifted his limp hand and placed her fingers on his wrist. I would advise you to get your father to bed, Lady Evelyn. He is somewhat agitated, but a good night's nice rest should set him right. No, no, Carnarvon said. I'll wait for Engelbach. We had to wait another half hour. I confess I began to share Lord Carnarvon's frustration. One would have supposed the mere existence of a hitherto unknown tomb would have aroused the interest of the chief inspector for Upper Egypt, which included the Valley of the Kings. But when Engelbach finally turned up, Accompanied by Ibrahim Effendi, his lieutenant, he shook hands all round before even looking at the cleared stairs. He was at that time in his mid-thirties. We had known him since he began his career in archaeology, and we had always been on good terms. He was not on such good terms with Howard, whom he greeted somewhat cavalierly. "'So, what are we here?' he asked of Emerson. Glancing at Emerson as if for support, Howard said— the lower strata of rubble from the stairwell contains potsherds and inscribed scraps. Ramses has... Uh, we've found the name of Tutankhamun, but also those of several other pharaohs, including Akhnaten. A cache, then, Engelbach said coolly, containing several burials. Or the remains of them, said Emerson. Those broken pieces suggest the tomb was robbed in antiquity, and that a number of objects were removed before the necropolis priests resealed it. Engelbach nodded thoughtfully. Like KV-55. Let's have a look, then. He remained watching while the men cleared the last few feet of debris from the bottom of the stairwell. Additional scraps of funerary equipment were found, a certain sign that some objects had been removed from the tomb before the steps were filled in. After inspecting these and the seals on the door, Engelbach glanced at his watch. I must be off. You will, of course, notify me as you proceed. Let us hope, he added with a sharp look at Howard, that this discovery won't be botched, as was the excavation of KV-55. Botched it unquestionably had been by the elderly American dilettante Theodore Davis, whose dictatorial control had made it virtually impossible for his archaeological assistant to follow the rules of proper excavation. We had been helpless observers of the havoc wrought by Davis, the mention of whose name still brought a snarl from Emerson. He was equally incensed with the inspector of the time, Arthur Weigel, who had been far less strict with the old American than he ought to have been. Rex Engelbach wouldn't make that mistake. You can count on Carter to do the job right, Emerson said fairly. I feel certain he appreciates your advice, Professor, said Engelbach. I didn't feel at all certain about it. Emerson's compliment had left Howard unmoved. He bit his lip and looked daggers at the inspector. Engelbach tipped his hat politely to the ladies and went off. Well, said Emerson, rubbing his hands together, there are several more hours of daylight left. Shall we get at it? By all means, Carter cried, too excited to resent Emerson's bland assumption of participation. I am surprised at you, said I, having been in receipt of a pointed look from Ramses. Both of you, there is not enough light for proper photography, and removing the blocks without damaging the seals will take time. Bah, exclaimed Emerson. That is um, quite right, Peabody. Curse it, he added morosely. 
Accepting the fact that nothing more could be done that day, Carnarvon agreed to go home and was led off by Lady Evelyn. The rest of us followed his example. I am surprised at Rex Engelbach's disinterest, I said, as Emerson and I left the valley. He was rather rude to Howard, I thought. Snobbery, said Emerson. He looks down on Carter because of his lower-class origins, and so do many other Egyptologists. He'd rather someone else made a great discovery. After a moment, he added grudgingly, The excavation couldn't be in better hands. Except yours, I thought. I gave the arm I held an affectionate squeeze in silent acknowledgement of his nobility of character. Howard was something of an amateur photographer himself, but on this occasion he was happy to accept the services of Nefret and Selim. We were all on hand early the following morning, and the job was well underway when Lord Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn arrived. Every square inch of the doorway was photographed, and then the blocking stones were taken down one by one with the greatest possible care. The men at once began removing the stone chips that filled the passage beyond. Its dimensions were obviously those of a passage, not a chamber. But since its length was unknown, it was impossible to determine how long this process would take. As the afternoon wore on, additional disquieting evidences of disturbance appeared. Scraps of pottery and of leather, the remnants of bags brought by the thieves to carry away valuable oils in the lowest levels. At sunset, there was no end in sight, and Howard decided to stop for the day. We were all on hand the following morning, and so was Mr. Callender, Howard's friend. Whence he had acquired the name of Pecky, I did not know. Absurd nicknames would seem to be a British failing. He was an engineer and architect, not an Egyptologist, and Emerson greeted him with a certain reserve. If he is an example of the assistance Carter intends to employ, I do not approve, my husband muttered to me. Howard is not dependent on your approval, I reminded him. Do not be premature, Emerson. We do not yet know what sort of assistance may be required. Hour after hour, the basket men carried up their loads. The corridor lengthened. Fifteen feet, twenty feet, twenty-five. At last, in mid-afternoon, the top of another sealed doorway appeared. The clearance was halted while Ramses and Howard examined what they could see of the door. It's like the outer door, Ramses reported. It has been breached at least twice, and the openings refilled and resealed. Never mind, Howard said, wiping the dust from his perspiring face. Let's get the entire door exposed. The weary men went back to work. What's he so cheerful about? I asked Emerson. Hands in his pockets, eyes intent on the cutting, Emerson said, The contents of an unrobbed tomb belong in their entirety to the Antiquities Department. It took a while for that to dawn on him. Ah, oh, I see. So if this tomb has been entered... The discoverers may expect a division of the remaining contents. The next hour dragged interminably. Howard stood by, smoking one cigarette after another. At last, the entire doorway was exposed. Carter and Carnarvon went down, accompanied by Lady Evelyn and Mr. Callender. No one else was invited, but I felt it my duty to follow. In my opinion, Howard was on the verge of nervous collapse. And Carnarvon was an even worse case. They might require immediate medical attention. Beyond the light entering from the stairwell, the descending corridor was extremely dark. I crept along, feeling my way with a hand resting on the wall. Ahead I could see the lights of electric torches moving to and fro. Then Howard's voice, soft, but amplified by echoes, reached me. There's empty space beyond... "'as far as the iron testing rod reaches. "'So he had drilled a hole in the door. "'I stopped, my hand resting on the wall, my heart beating fast. "'I hoped Howard would have sense enough to use a candle "'to test for noxious air before widening the hole. "'A mutter of conversation, of which I heard only a few words, "'indicated that he had. "'It was followed by the sound of metal rubbing against stone. "'He was enlarging the hole.' 
A period of silence followed. Then came Carnarvon's voice, sharpened by suspense. Well, can you see anything? I crept a little closer, trying to move quietly. I could make out their shapes, crowded close to the doorway. Callender's bulky form almost hid the slimmer frame of Lady Evelyn. The other men stood next to them, so close that they resembled the shape of a single, monstrous creature. Well, Carnarvon repeated. Here, let me look. I think he gave Howard a shove. Howard fell back, and Carnarvon took his place. A loud, wordless cry from Carnarvon finally aroused a response from Howard. Wonderful! Marvellous things! Wonderful things! I blush to admit that I so lost control of myself as to exclaim, What? However, my voice was drowned out by those of the others. Lady Evelyn had replaced her father and was emitting little shrieks. Calendar kept bellowing, as I had. What? What? Carter and Carnarvon uttered broken ejaculations of disbelief. Then came that magic word. Gold. It came from Lord Carnarvon. He was again looking in the hole, describing to the others in incoherent phrases what he saw. I listened for a few minutes and then crept quietly up the corridor. It was some time before Howard and the others returned to the top of the stairs. All the world knows what they saw through that small hole, but the first impression was so overwhelming and, let me add, the view so limited that it is no wonder their description was confused. Howard kept repeating, "'Wonderful things! Marvellous things!' Lady Evelyn embraced her father and Howard alternately, and once hugged Ramses, I think by mistake. Eyes glazed, Carnarvon could only murmur the word gold over and over. When Emerson asked politely if we might have a look for ourselves, I don't believe Lord Carnarvon heard him. Nor do I believe Emerson would have heard a refusal. Emerson and I, Nefret and Ramses, therefore proceeded. We took it in turn to peer through the small opening, passing the torch from hand to hand. At first glance, it looked like Ali Baba's cave, filled with a bewildering jumble of gleaming objects. It took a while for the eye to sort them out and for the trained mind to interpret them. From that first look, I remember only the huge funerary couch, with the head of some fabulous beast, gilded and painted, on which rested various objects. Under it were piled boxes and pots. The others had their turns. When we went up, Howard turned to Emerson with an eager, Well, remarkable, said Emerson, stroking his chin. You've months of work ahead of you, Carter. More, if there are other rooms beyond this one. He was the calmest of us all. Even Ramsay's normally composed countenance betrayed the wonder he felt. Lord Carnarvon had collapsed into a camp chair and was being fanned by his daughter. There must be other rooms, Howard exclaimed. There is another doorway. I saw it, said Emerson. Naturally, you will notify Engelbach before you do anything more. Howard's bow tie was askew, his shirt streaked with dust, his hair standing on end. Yes, he said. Yes, notify. Tomorrow, we will be happy to join you, said Emerson graciously. At Howard's order, a wooden grill had been set in place at the beginning of the entrance corridor. We watched him close the padlock and then rode homeward. When we neared the house to see its hospitable lights shining through the gathering dusk, Emerson roused himself from a brown study. I hope Fatima has put dinner back. I could do with a whiskey and soda. It isn't that late, I said. So much has happened that the day seemed longer than usual. We had missed tea. I deduced that the children had been taken off to bed, since the dog was not couchant in front of the door to the veranda. However, the seats in that room were occupied. Sethos was there, of course, his countenance bland as ever. Nor was I surprised to see Cyrus. With his customary delicacy, he had refrained from intruding on Howard's activities, but I knew he would be burning with curiosity. The others were there too, Suzanne and Naji, Bertie and Jumana. You'll have to excuse us, Cyrus said sheepishly. 
We've been hearing rumors about a room piled high with gold. Already? Nefret exclaimed. You need not apologize, I said, clasping his hand warmly. Emerson, will you serve the whiskey? I then launched into a tale that held my audience spellbound. He's found it then, Naji exclaimed. Tutankhamun, not a cash. So it would appear, Ramses replied. He had taken a seat next to Nefret. I was able to make out a few cartouches on various objects. They were all those of Tutankhamun and his wife. That was more than I'd been able to make out, but Ramses's keen eyesight and remarkable memory were legendary in Egypt. At Cyrus's request, he drew a rough sketch of what he had seen through the small opening, explaining as he went along. Directly opposite the door was a funerary couch in the shape of the Hathor cow. Piled on top of it were an ordinary bed with animal legs, a wicker chair, several stools, and a wooden box— under it were a number of white-painted ovoid boxes, probably containing food offerings, and in front of them two rectangular wooden boxes and a pair of what seems to be footstools. To the right I made out the tail of what may be another funerary couch, and to the left the head of a third, in the shape of a hippopotamus. I'm not much of an artist, he finished modestly. The place was in complete disarray. Emerson had lit his pipe. Now he took it from between his teeth. The tomb was robbed, right enough. The thieves tossed the objects about, looking for small valuables. The priests who set the place in order afterward were in a hurry. We knew the tomb had been robbed at least once, I said. The golden statuette we found last year and the confession of the thief prove that. Twice, Ramses said. There is evidence of at least two breaches in the door. They couldn't have stolen any large objects if the holes were the size you describe, Cyrus said shrewdly. What an incredible find. Even if the tomb was robbed, most of the funerary goods are still there. When's Carter taking the inner door down? Tomorrow, I believe, I said. I sure admire his patience, Cyrus said, shaking his head. I'd have been at it all night. I would give anything to be there, Suzanne exclaimed. The lamps swung in a sudden puff of wind, sending strange shadows across the intent faces. No one answered Suzanne's implied request. But Jumana turned her head to look at the other young woman. If Suzanne got into that tomb before she did, there would be trouble, and to spare. Bertie cleared his throat and looked hopeful, but dared venture no further. After his first ejaculation of wonder, Naji had relapsed into silence. Fatima came to the doorway, or rather, since I knew she'd been eavesdropping, she showed herself in the doorway. Dinner is served, she announced. Will you stay? I asked Cyrus. No, no, we've imposed enough already. Will we see you in the West Valley tomorrow, Emerson? What? said Emerson. I doubt it, I said, but you may be sure we will keep you informed. Dinner was a silent meal. We were all tired, even Emerson, who sat hunched over his plate and who had to be reminded from time to time to put food in his mouth. For once, Sethos spoke very little. His abstracted expression reawakened suspicions I had tried to dismiss. There was something on his mind, something of which he preferred not to speak. Instead of joining us for coffee in the sitting room, Nefret excused herself. I'm awfully tired, and I want to look in on the twins. Allow me to see you home, Ramses said, offering his arm. She laughed a little and yawned. There's no need, darling. I'm going straight to bed. Ramses said something in a low voice. She laughed again. Thank you, kind sir. I smiled to myself and thought how nice it was to see them so devoted. Ramses had not allowed the thrill of the tomb to let him forget his familial obligations. They went out arm in arm, his dark head bent devotedly toward her. The little by-play passed right by Emerson. He did not even respond to Nefret's soft good night. I attempted a few conversational advances, getting no more response than Nefret had, and then decided to abandon indirection. What is it now? I demanded. Your preoccupation arouses the direst of suspicions, Emerson. I do hope you're not planning something underhanded. 
if you have some idea of breaking into that tomb. Slowly, like a hunched vulture spreading folded wings, Emerson straightened his shoulders and got to his feet. The look he fixed on me was so dreadful, my tongue froze. My unpredictable brother-in-law burst out laughing. It took you long enough, I must say. I was afraid I would have to mention the possibility myself. You did, I cried, as realization dawned. They will wait until the passage is cleared, you said. Good heavens! Not a possibility, Emerson muttered. A probability. They will. Of course they will. And they may not be the only ones. She did go straight to bed, said Ramses in the doorway. So I decided to come back for... Is something wrong? Emerson whirled on him. Come with me, at once. Accustomed though he was to his eccentricities, this order caused Ramsay's dark eyes to widen and his heavy brows to rise. Where? The valley, of course. Emerson pushed past him. Hurry! Wait for me, I cried, dropping my embroidery. Grinning, Sethos rose to his feet. Wait for me, I repeated, this time to Ramsay's. Emerson had left. I dashed down the corridor to my room. My belongings were in perfect order, as always, so I was able to lay my hands on the objects I wanted without delay. My parasol, of course, and two electric torches. There was not time for a change of clothing, nor even for the assumption of my useful belt of tools. It took a certain amount of adjustment, because of the tendency of the objects hanging from it to become entangled. Hoping I would not need it, I hastened back to the sitting room. Sethos and Ramses had obeyed my order to wait. Does this mean what I think it does? Ramses demanded. Yes, perhaps. Cursed if I know, I said, rendered incoherent by confusion. Sethos had spoken of robbers attacking the tomb. Had Emerson been referring to another group of intruders? A distant bellow from Emerson propelled us into rapid motion. He isn't planning to break into the tomb, I panted trotting to keep up with Ramsay's long strides. At least I don't think so. I more or less accused him of it, and he said, he said something like, of course they will, and so may others. Damnation, said Ramses. Why didn't I think of that? Sethos cleared his throat in a pointed manner. We were soon mounted and on our way. I must have made a pretty picture riding astride with the skirts of my frock hitched up to my knees and my hair coming loose from its pins. I didn't allow these minor inconveniences to distract me, for I was preoccupied with what might lie ahead of us. I hadn't thought of it either, and I ought to have done. Of course Carter and his patron would return to the tomb under the cloak of darkness and break into the enticing chamber. Whether they had the right to do so was questionable. By Emerson's rigid standards, no one would have set foot in that room until every angle of it had been photographed and every precaution taken to avoid damage to the artifacts. However, I could understand why Carter and Carnarvon might violate the spirit, if not the letter of their concession. Few archaeologists could have resisted. And they might not be the only ones. By now, every man in Gorner would have heard that magical word, gold. Indeed, Cyrus had said as much earlier that day. Tonight might be their best chance. There was nothing to prevent a break-in except the wooden grill and a single layer of stone blocks. An experienced tomb robber, of which there were many on the West Bank, could get through both in a quarter of an hour. Ramses slowed Risha and fell back to ride beside me. Are you all right, mother? I spat out a mouthful of hair. Surely Howard posted guards. Ramses shrugged. His meaning was clear, at least to his mother, who was accustomed to his taciturnity. Offered a share of the treasure, few men could have remained faithful to their duty, especially men whose wage was a few piastres a day. When the valley was closed to tourists, the barrier at the entrance was up. It now stood ajar, and the donkey park, which ought to have been empty, held several horses and donkeys. Emerson's theory was confirmed— with a vehement oath, he dashed through the opening. The moon was a silver sliver, but the bright stars of Egypt shed a ghostly radiance. I had removed my heeled evening slippers so that my progress was silent and cursed painful. Ramses, on my right, walked as silently as a cat, and Sethos, politely holding my left arm, made little more noise. 
Why we bothered to move quietly, I do not know, for the running feet of Emerson, well in advance, crashed like the hooves of a charging bull. A louder crash followed, mingled with the inarticulate roars of Emerson and a higher-pitched scream. My scream was louder. I had stepped on a sharp stone. Hopping and lurching, I pulled away from Ramses. Hurry! Your father's in trouble. Go on, Sethos said calmly. I've got her. His arm encircled my waist and guided me forward. Rounding a spur of rock, we beheld a horrifying scene. The tomb of Tutankhamun lay before us on the right side of the path. From its entrance came a dim glow. A squirming, shifting shape occupied the space in front of the steps. It resolved itself into the mighty form of Emerson, rising like Hercules from the fray and holding a slighter, still squirming form at arm's length. "'Sorry, Peabody, for taking so long,' said my husband apologetically. "'Bastard at a knife. I trust you weren't worried.' "'Ramses!' I shouted. "'Where are you?' "'Here, mother.' He emerged from the black shadows next to the tomb, with another wriggling miscreant in his grip. "'I fear Daib has got away. He's a nimble chap.' "'Ah,' I said, relieved to see husband and son unscathed. "'The Ibn Simsas.' "'They were hiding in the rocks above the tomb,' said Emerson, giving his captive a shake that made his head snap back. "'Where are the guards?' I asked. "'Never mind that,' said Emerson. "'What I want to know is—' The glow from the mouth of the tomb strengthened, heralding the arrival of Howard Carter, torch in hand. Its wavering beam framed the former combatants in a theatrical glow. Emerson, disheveled and scowling, his captive even more disheveled, robe torn and turban askew. I recognized the scarred face of Farhat, the oldest and most unprincipled of the Ibn Simsas. He had realized who his captor was, and he had stopped struggling. Howard's face was a mask of bewilderment. What the devil is going on here? he demanded. Bluster would get you nowhere, Carter, Emerson growled. What the devil are you doing here? I've every right to be here, Howard said, drawing himself up. That remains to be seen, said Emerson. I suppose the other co-conspirators are in the tomb chamber. Tell them to get up here. It's safe enough now. You damn fool, Carter. Didn't it occur to you that you were risking not only your professional reputation, but your patron's safety? These lads were lying in wait, and they are not known for patience. Lord Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn came up in time to hear the end of this speech. They were followed by the other co-conspirator, Pecky Callender. See here, Emerson, he panted. No, you see here, Emerson rounded on him. See Farhat ibn Simsa, to be precise. For all you know, there could be a hopeful thief behind every rock in the valley. You ought not have come here without a dozen guards. But then there would have been witnesses to your illegal entry, wouldn't there? Lord Carnarvon had got his breath back. He drew himself up to his full height and looked down his nose at Emerson, every inch the British aristocrat. I can't say I care for your turn, Professor Emerson, he drawled. I can't say I give a curse, said Emerson. Emerson, I murmured. My gentle warning had no effect. Emerson had worked himself up into a state of righteous rage. I presume you removed enough of the blocking stones to enter the tomb chamber. How much damage did you do? And what did you take? Carnarvon offered his arm to his daughter. You have no right to question me, sir. I bid you good night. Emerson pointed an accusing finger. His voice rolled like that of an outraged god. Your pockets are bulging, Lord Carnarvon. Ramses and I managed to stop him before he went in pursuit of Carnarvon, who was retreating with as much haste as his dignity allowed. I verily believe Emerson would have searched the fellow, which would have led to serious trouble. The damage was bad enough. Once at a safe distance, Carnarvon turned. You are persona non grata here, Professor. Stay away from the tomb. Do not presume on my goodwill again. He walked off, followed by Carter and Callender, and by Emerson's vehement curses. Now you've done it, 
I said, relaxing my hold. We'll never be allowed in the tomb again. His little outbursts generally refresh Emerson. Displaying his large, white teeth in a jovial smile, he said, In that case, we may as well make the most of the present opportunity. We left the Ibn Simsa brothers, bound securely with strips cut from their garments, after relieving them of various sharp instruments. In his confusion, and I believe guilt, Howard had not even remembered to lock the wooden grill. As we made our way down the corridor, I said to Emerson, "'You ought not have cursed Lord Carnarvon, Emerson.' "'Bah,' said Emerson. "'He was already out of temper with me. "'You threatened him with everything from dying of the pox "'to being devoured by demons in the afterlife.' "'Emerson emitted a loud groan. "'It was not caused by remorse, "'but by the sight visible in the beam of his torch, "'a gaping hole, several feet square, "'at the bottom of the blocked door.' "'You were prepared for that, surely,' said the cool voice of Sethos behind us. "'I hoped I was wrong,' muttered Emerson. "'Be fair, Emerson,' said his brother. "'What Egyptologist could have resisted?' "'I do not require a lecture from you,' said Emerson. "'He shone his torch into the opening and moved it slowly from side to side. "'The full wonder of the chamber was disclosed in a series of successive visions. "'It required some time for the eye to disentangle the strange shapes and sharp shadows, "'overlapping quartered circles that must be chariot wheels, Three great gilded funerary couches with grotesque animal heads "'laid end to end and piled with other objects. "'But what caught the eye and held it were two life-size statues that faced each other like guardians against the wall to the right. The exposed skin had been blackened with bitumen. The clothing and regal ornaments gleamed with guilt. On the brow of each figure, the royal Uraeus serpent reared its head, ready to strike any who threatened the king. Even Sethos, the imperturbable, was shaken. On hands and knees, he said, "'There's a drop of about two feet.' He turned, as if to lower himself down. Emerson caught him by the collar. There have been enough clumsy idiots tramping around in there. Go ahead, Ramses. Be careful where you step. It seems to me, I began, that as the smallest person present... Good gad, Peabody! If I can restrain myself, so can you, growled my husband. Ramses is light on his feet and agile as a cat. And not likely to pocket any small objects, said my brother-in-law. Not quite, sotto voce. Are you implying that I would? I demanded. I was referring to someone else, said Sethos. <laughs> said Emerson. Take the torch, Ramses. Ramses slipped carefully down and stood still for a moment, gazing around. There seems to be an opening on the far wall, under one of the funerary couches. We saw him stoop and look in. Good God! It's another room, packed full of incredible objects, and in even greater disorder than this one. That blank stretch of wall between the two statues, Emerson said. Have a closer look at it. Ramsay started in that direction and then paused as the beam of the torch framed a painted chest covered with miniature scenes as bright and precise as those in an illustrated codex. Ramses moved carefully round it, emitting low murmurs of admiration. "'Curtail, if you please, your aesthetic instincts,' Emerson growled. "'Look at that stretch of wall.' The truth dawned. It made even the discovery of a second room, filled with treasure, pale by comparison. What else could the noble figures guard except the body of the god-king himself? Did his burial chamber lie beyond that seemingly blank wall?' "'As usual, your instincts are correct, father,' Ramses reported. "'There's a doorway, blocked and plastered, with seals stamped all over it. "'It hasn't been breached.' "'Emerson shot back. "'Look behind the basket and the other objects piled against the wall. "'The basket to which Emerson referred was of good size, "'a circular basin shape atop a pile of withered reeds, "'gently using both hands.' Ramses removed the basket 
and pushed the reeds aside. There was no opening, but even at a distance one could see that an area several feet across, at the juncture of wall and floor, was of a different nature. The outer layer of plaster was missing. There was no mortar between the stones thus disclosed. It was clear that some of them had been removed and then hastily replaced. "'Blast and damn,' said Emerson. "'Carter. How do you know?' I asked. "'It might have been the ancient thieves.' "'The priests would have replastered the opening,' Emerson said. "'Since the damage has already been done, we may in good conscience repeat it. "'Take the loose stones out, Ramses, and have a look. What's in there?' After a moment, Ramses said in a hushed voice, it looks like a wall of solid gold. Emerson could contain himself no longer. Breathing hard, he lowered himself to the floor inside and picked his way to the north wall. Since he hadn't specifically forbidden me to do so, I followed. Peering through the newly opened space, I saw what seemed indeed to be a wall of gold, reaching almost to the ceiling, and leaving only a narrow corridor alongside. "'What is it?' I cried. "'A funerary shrine,' said Emerson, on hands and knees looking in. "'See the doors, and the wretches have been here too,' he added passionately. "'There are footprints in the dust.' "'Then we may also proceed,' I exclaimed. "'The opening is too small for me,' said Emerson. "'I will not enlarge it.' Emerson! My voice was scarcely louder than a whisper. Emerson turned his head and smiled at me. All right, Peabody, your turn. With painstaking care, I stepped down to the floor of the inner chamber, which was several feet lower than the other. Before me stood two great gilded doors adorned with decorative hieroglyphs on a background of blue faience. They were closed by a wooden bolt. I reported this to Emerson, who said, Open it. I don't doubt Carter already has. The bolt slid smoothly back, and the doors parted enough to allow me to see within. I can't make it out, I gasped. A framework, gilded, bits of brown, rotten cloth, sewn with gold rosettes. A canopy, said Emerson. The cloth was a funerary ball. What else? Another shrine, I think. Various objects on the floor, bows and sticks leaning against the walls. Someone has cleared a space in front of the doors of the second shrine. Carter, said Emerson, like a swear word. Did he open those doors too? I can't see. No, Emerson, he did not. The doors are closed in the usual way, with cords wound round the handles and a dab of mud over the knot. It's stamped with the necropolis seal and it is intact. He does have some scruples left, said Emerson. All right, come out of there, Peabody, and close the doors of the outer shrine. We will leave everything precisely as Carter left it. The walls are painted, said Ramses, also on hands and knees, his head twisted to see up. A funerary procession, I think, and the cartouches of Tutankhamun. So he's there, Emerson muttered. Still there, inside his coffins and his sarcophagus and the shrines, alone in the dark, as he has been for over three thousand years. This flight of fancy was so unlike my pragmatic husband that I looked at him in surprise. But I ought not to have been surprised. The sensitive poetic side of Emerson's nature is known to only a few, of which I am one. Perhaps he is with the gods he worshipped, I said softly. <clears throat> said Emerson. Which gods? The multitudinous pantheon of Egypt or the sole god Aten, in whose faith he was raised. Don't talk rubbish, Peabody. Emerson's poetic moods do not last long. 
The burial chamber contained one more surprise, a rectangular opening near the far corner, leading to a fourth room filled, like the two outer rooms, with a fabulous jumble of artifacts. Vision and brain were so overwhelmed that I remember only two objects, a reclining statue of Anubis, and behind it, a golden chest with an exquisite statue of a goddess extending protective arms across its side. It must be the canopic chest, I said, as Emerson helped me up. I could only see one statue, the most beautiful thing, Emerson. I had completely forgotten about Sethos, but Ramsay said not. He stood watching his uncle as the latter moved slowly around the outer chamber. Look here, Sethos said. Don't touch it, Ramsay snapped. It's been opened. Sethos indicated a small, gilded shrine. Here's where your statuette came from. By God, I think you're right, Ramses said. The interior of the box-like shape was empty, except for a wooden pedestal on whose base were the cartouches of Tutankhamun. There's room for another statuette next to it, Ramses said. Remember the thief's confession? That his friend took the image of the queen? Enough, Emerson said, in a subdued voice. His shoulders shifted uneasily. Naturally, I understood his feelings. I, too, had a sense of profanation, of intruding into a realm where we had no right to go. Framed by darkness, the monstrous heads of the funerary couches looked as if they might at any moment turn to stare accusingly at the invaders. Dust motes swam in the light, and from time to time we heard the smallest whisper of sound— an ominous sound, for it betokened the fall of a scrap of gold or bit of cloth disturbed by the entrance of air into the long sealed chamber. Following Emerson's orders, Ramses replaced the stones that had been taken from the entrance to the burial chamber. I held the torch, and I am not ashamed to admit my hand was a trifle unsteady. As I stood watching, the light caught the eyes of the Uraeus serpents on the royal brows, so that they seemed to blink and glare. Slowly, in a state of dreamlike disbelief, we made our way back along the passage and up the stairs. I hadn't realized how dead and musty the air and the tomb had been until I felt a cool breeze against my face. No one spoke. The wonder of what we had seen left us without words. The tomb had been robbed in antiquity, but enough was left to make the find unique. The first royal burial with most of its rich grave goods intact. Emerson was in the lead, Sethos and Ramses behind me. A sudden bellow from Emerson startled me so that I toppled backward against Ramses, who let out a pained grunt but kept his balance. Cursing, Sethos shoved Ramses, who pushed me, and we stumbled to the top of the stairs. Now what? I demanded breathlessly. Have the Ibn Simsas got away? At first it appeared that they had attempted to do so, for Emerson gripped a dark form which he was shaking as a terrier shakes a rat. Then I saw the miscreant brothers, still bound, and heard a plaintive voice gasp, I give up! I give up! Please, Professor! He must have bit his tongue, for the plea ended in a sharp scream. I recognized the voice, distorted though it was by pain and shortness of breath, and by the absence of the brogue that ordinarily marked his speech. "'Kevin!' I cried. "'Kevin O'Connell, what the devil are you doing here? "'I thought you were in London.' "'Language, language, Mrs. E,' said Kevin, "'his brogue firmly back in place. "'Emerson had stopped shaking him, and he was himself again. "'Where else would a journalist be but at the scene "'of what may be the greatest story of the year? "'Or the decade? Or—' "'Emerson gave his throat a final squeeze and dropped him. "'Kevin subsided onto the ground and wisely decided to stay there.' The Ibn Simsa brothers rolled over to make room for him, staring wide-eyed. Emerson drew a deep breath, but before he could express his ire, Ramsay's voice rang out. I turned. He was no longer behind me. Father, here's another one. Another bloody journalist, Emerson demanded. Better than that. Ramsay's rose into sight from behind the low retaining wall above the tomb, pulling another individual to his feet. Recognition was immediate. Starlight silvered a mane of white hair. Good gad, I cried. 
It is Sir Malcolm. What are you? Don't ask, said Emerson in a strangled voice. That question is becoming unbearably repetitive. How many others are lurking about? Come out, come out, wherever you are. His tone of voice turned this into an unmistakable threat. It got immediate results in the form of an apologetic cough in one voice and a bad word in another. Two forms emerged from the shadows near Tomb 55 across the way. Jumana, I exclaimed, having recognized that young person's voice. And Bertie. He followed me, Jumana said, giving Bertie a furious look. What? said Emerson, enunciating each word slowly. Brought you here. Bertie cringed. I, I, I tried to stop her. Do be quiet, Jumana said impatiently. She threw her slim shoulders back and smiled at Emerson. The same thing that brought you, Professor. I expect archaeological fever. You, said Emerson, in the same ominous voice, meant to creep into the tomb tonight. I thought someone would, said Jumana, unabashed. Tonight, while it lies open, I felt sure I could persuade one of the guards to let me in. She brushed her dark hair away from her brow in an exaggerated gesture of coquetry. I didn't doubt her assurance. Bertie wasn't the only man in Luxor who was infatuated by her dainty form and pretty face. I didn't expect there would be no guards at all, Jumana went on. That was a piece of luck, or it would have been if Bertie hadn't held me back. Goaded into speech, Bertie burst out. And if I hadn't, you would have walked into the arms of the Ibn Simsers. Sir Malcolm tried to free himself from Ramsay's grasp. Good evening, Miss Jumana, is it? I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, but I hope to improve. Ah, stop it, said Emerson, waving his fists. Stop it at once. This is not a social occasion. Here's another one said Sethos, appearing in his turn. He addressed the cringing figure next to him in his fluent Arabic. Fear us not, my friend. You were here only because your master ordered it. We mean you no harm. The unfortunate servant fell to his knees and tried to kiss Sethos's hand. Sethos snatched it away. Kneel only to God. Certainly not to that piece of scum, he added in English, for Sir Malcolm's benefit. Emerson was obviously in a quandary, trying to decide which intruder to curse first. Sir Malcolm saved him the trouble, pulling away from Ramses and straightening his rumpled garments. I will overlook this gratuitous attack from your son, he began. Damn decent of you, said Emerson, in the same well-bred drawl. I trust you do not expect me to overlook your gratuitous act of trespass. Kevin, who'd been listening with interest, finished smoothing his hair and reached into the breast pocket of his coat. I wouldn't if I were you, I said to him. Kevin grinned unrepentantly, but he put the little notebook back in his pocket. If I am trespassing, so are you, said Sir Malcolm. I overheard what Lord Carnarvon said earlier. We are in the same boat now, Professor, and it would be to your advantage as well as mine to reach an agreement. Emerson looked at me. In a conversational tone, he asked, Is the fellow determined to drive me to violence? Any lesser man would have lost his temper long before this. Everyone is here who ought not be here. No one is here who ought to be here. Curse it! The situation is turning to pure farce, and I feel myself beginning to... Do not give way, Emerson, I beg you. I directed a severe look at Sethos, who had covered his mouth with his hand in an attempt to stifle his laughter. Allow me to add a note of common sense. Kevin, you will come with us. Jumana and Bertie, too. Oh, but I haven't seen the tomb, Jumana cried. You wouldn't be so cruel after all the trouble I went to. Please, Professor... Um, said Emerson, deflating under the spell of her pleading voice. He is a perfect fool where women are concerned. Well, she doesn't deserve to be rewarded for her reckless behavior, Bertie exclaimed. I'd been about to say the same thing. A quick look won't hurt, I said. Go with her, Ramses. Just a look and come straight back. In that case, said Kevin eagerly. If she goes, Sir Malcolm began. 
No, I shouted. Good gad of all the effrontery. Now, Peabody, don't lose your temper, said Emerson. I am the only one allowed to do that. Sir Malcolm, I advise you to leave at once. I cannot always control Mrs. Emerson when she is in this exasperated state of mind. Very well, said that gentleman, with sudden meekness. I took a deep breath and then another. Don't think you can linger until we have departed, Sir Malcolm. The tomb will be guarded now. I would be delighted to oblige, said Sethos quickly. I don't doubt it, muttered Emerson. Stay, if you like, with me. Bertie had, of course, gone down the steps with Ramses and Jumana. They now returned, both men more or less dragging the girl between them. It wasn't long enough, she gasped. There was so much. I want one more. Bertie, let me go at once. She pulled free from him, but not from Ramses. Oh, no, you don't, he said. Jumana, don't try me too far. And, he added with an unwilling grin, as she leaned against him and gazed imploringly into his face, don't try that either. You've got your own way, and gone one up on Suzanne. That should be enough. Jumana chuckled. Emerson sighed. Jumana, go home at once with Bertie. Don't argue with him. Don't try to get away from him. Don't call him bad names, I said. Don't call him bad names, said Emerson, in some confusion. Um, um, I have made myself clear, haven't I, Jumana? Yes, sir. I will go straight back to the castle, and I will not call Bertie bad names. Good. Ramses, take your mother and that, that journalist back to the house. What about them, I asked, nudging one of the Ibn Simsa brothers with my foot. Oh, please, sit, he moaned. Let us go. We repent. We are reformed. Do not leave us for the jackals to eat. It's a tempting idea, said Emerson, scratching his chin. But against our principles, eh? Untie them, Ramses. We know where to find them if we want them. At the moment, they are only in the way. So are you, Sir Malcolm. Be off with you. In the end, it was Ramses who stayed with his father, and Sethos who escorted Kevin and me back to the donkey park, where we had left the horses. Sir Malcolm had already departed, with, I supposed, his unfortunate servant running along beside. Jumana and Bertie had come on foot and would return the same way. I had given the girl one of my little lectures, so I felt sure she would do as she was told. As we rode off, I could hear her and Bertie bickering in loud voices— but to give her credit, I did not hear any bad words. Kevin had come without argument. He knew Emerson well enough to recognize the futility of learning more from him. A whiskey and soda would certainly hit the spot, he said cheerfully. Don't count on it, I said. Over the years, you and the daily yell have caused me considerable embarrassment, Kevin. But, ma'am, remember the times. I approved a true friend in your times of need. His voice was as caressing as that of an Irish tenor. We will see, I said, if friendship takes precedence over journalism on this occasion. Insofar as I am concerned, you are guilty until proven innocent. I will confess to my readers that I did not finish recording the events I have described until several days later. I stick to the accuracy of the account, however. It was a night to remember, one of the most unforgettable of my life. Earlier excavations of the royal tombs had turned up only broken bits and pieces of the funerary equipment. Tantalizing hints of the exquisite originals. Tetisheri's tomb, which we had found, was a reburial. This was the first tomb that still contained the vast majority of the king's original equipment, more or less in situ. Imagination had conjured up glittering images of what once had been. This was the reality. The only one of us who slept through the entire night was Nefret, and when she and Ramses joined us at the breakfast table, her blue eyes were blazing with indignation. From his sheepish expression, I deduced that Ramses had borne the initial brunt of her reproaches, but there were plenty left for me and Emerson. Instead of returning Kevin's cheery greeting, she fixed him with an inimical scowl. "'Why is that man still here?' she demanded. "'Why haven't you sent him packing?' Kevin attempted to look hurt. His carrot-red hair was sprinkled with grey, and fine lines framed his blue eyes. 
but his freckles were as exuberant as ever. I haven't done anything, he protested. Our old friendship. He will be sent packing as soon as he has repeated to the rest of you what he told me last night, I said. It is of some importance, as I believe you will agree. How much has Ramsay's told you, Nefret? Some of it. She transferred her frown from Kevin to the plate of eggs Fatima had placed before her. I only woke half an hour ago. And half that time was spent calling me names, said Ramses. As I told her, we did not know when we left the house what we might run into. There was no time to... Let us not waste breath in futile recrimination and apology, I broke in. We agree, I believe, on the following story. First, that we will mention Carter and Carnarvon's illicit entry into the tomb to no one. We went there because we feared an attempt at robbery and discovered the Ibn Simsa brothers. Emerson and Ramses remained on guard in order to prevent additional attempts until Rais Girigar arrived this morning. Lie, you mean? Nefret demanded. I never prevaricate unless it is absolutely necessary, Nefret. In this case, it is simply a matter of omitting certain details. Carter and Carnarvon had no right to enter that tomb, but Scripture tells us not to judge our fellow men. Their own consciences must determine whether or not to confess. I hate it when you quote the cursed Bible, Emerson growled. I don't intend to give Carter away, but what about him? He gestured at Kevin with the fork on which he had impaled a piece of egg. He won't print anything. Ramses said. He wants to stay in Carnarvon's good graces. Quite right, Kevin agreed, wiping egg yolk off his crumpled cravat. Anyhow, I'd be risking a suit for libel if you lot refused to back me up. They can't charge me with anything except being in the valley after hours. I never got into the tomb. The same holds for Sir Malcolm, I fear, I said, regretfully. Whatever his intentions, he committed no act that could be considered trespass. Let us return to the point. Kevin has admitted that rumours of a great find have been circulating among his archaeological and journalistic connections for some weeks. Apparently Lord Carnarvon told various friends about Hard's telegram as soon as it arrived, and of course they told others. When Kevin learned that Arthur Merton of the Times had booked passage to Egypt, he took the next boat. You see what that means, don't you? Other journalists will follow, if they're not already on the way, Nefret exclaimed. Including Margaret Menton, said Kevin, his pleasant countenance taking on quite a threatening aspect. She's sharp as they come, and she'll stop at nothing to steal a march on me. I was not the only one who looked involuntarily at Sethos. Not a muscle twitched in his face. He had, of course, anticipated this and had realized what it might mean to him personally. She claims to be an old friend of yours, continued Kevin, who was, of course, unaware of the lady's relationship to Antony Bisinghurst. See here, you won't let anything slip to her, will you? I've known you all longer than she has. I won't let anything slip to anyone, including you, said Emerson. Have you finished breakfast? It's more than you deserve. Be off with you. Kevin rose with alacrity. The telegraph office should be open by now. He chortled. I'll be the first, even ahead of Merton. If you quote me or Mrs. Emerson, I will have your head on a platter, Emerson shouted after his retreating form. He won't dare, I said. He's still counting on our goodwill. In fact, I don't see how he can find anything to write about. He didn't get inside the tomb. He doesn't need facts, Emerson grumbled. He'll invent a pack of rubbish and fill it out with innuendo. Sethos patted his lips with his napkin and put it neatly on the table. I do hate to intrude on this discussion with my petty personal problems, but have any of you stopped to think what may ensue if Margaret comes here? She'll be badgering us for information, Emerson growled. Then his face changed. Oh, good gad! You mean... Her arrival may reawaken the suspicions of those who know she is the wife of their quarry, I said. We have been free of surveillance lately, but that may not last. Hell and damnation, said Nefret. She was thinking of the children. Can't we head her off? How? Ramses demanded. Any attempt to communicate with her will only arouse the interest we must avoid at all costs. I was watching Sethos, whose eyes were fixed on Nefret's worried face. 
I knew as surely as if he had spoken aloud what he meant to do. For the next few days, I kept a close eye on my brother-in-law. Though, to be honest, I hadn't decided what I would do if he made a conspicuous departure. He was torn, too, I believe, having decided to throw himself to the wolves in order to lead them away from us. He was in no hurry to do so. There was, of course, the possibility that even that sacrifice would not save us if his pursuers believed we had a copy of the mysterious document. Ramses had gone back to work on it, realizing, as Sethos and I did, that its solution might offer the answer to our problems. Everyone else was totally preoccupied with the new tomb. On the day following our little adventure there, the wall was removed, and Carter entered the outer chamber for, as he claimed, the first time. Neither he nor Carnarvon admitted to their nocturnal trespass. Inexplicably, Rex Engelbach declined to attend, sending his assistant Ibrahim in his place. The boatmen were kept busy ferrying tourists across to the West Bank. We knew from our own experience that Howard would be besieged by requests from people wanting to see the tomb. First, of course, came the formal viewings for officials of the government and the Antiquities Department. We were not included on either occasion. It was a deliberate snub, especially since Merton of the Times was among the second group of official visitors, the only journalist so favoured. I fancied I could hear Kevin's curses all the way from the valley. We got all the news, fresh off the press, as some might say, from Daoud. Emerson did not go near the East Valley. He was too proud to sue for favours. I was not, but he refused to allow me or anyone else to make overtures, not even Nefret, who had a way with gentlemen. Instead, Emerson put us all back to work in the West Valley, with a fervour that almost made up for his earlier disinterest. He's afraid Carnarvon will throw us out, said Cyrus. With Bertie and Jumana, we were taking a little rest in the shade of the shelter I had caused to be erected. It was very warm, and we'd been working hard that morning. Cyrus wrung out his goatee, which, like the rest of him, was soaked with perspiration, and then accepted a glass of cold tea. What the dickens did Emerson say to his lordship? I've heard a dozen different versions, each worse than the last. I sighed. I was afraid of that. Goodness, what a hotbed of gossip this place is. It was one of Emerson's characteristic diatribes, Cyrus, complete with curses. One cannot blame Carnarvon for being angry, especially in view of the fact that Emerson's accusations were probably true. They are saying that the professor accused Mr. Carter and the others of taking jewelry from the tomb, Jumana offered. They, they wouldn't do that, Bertie protested, his ingenuous face troubled. Jumana shook her head. You are so naive, Bertie. Bertie flushed, but before he could respond, Emerson appeared in the mouth of Eyes Tomb, arms akimbo and brow threatening. What are you doing there? he shouted. Get back to work. Bertie, you can start your measurements of the burial chamber now. The other three jumped up. I hadn't finished my tea, so I remained seated. Have you finished clearing the floor? I called. Do you expect me to carry the sarcophagus lid out single-handed? It was an outrageous complaint, since he had himself sent the men away for a rest. But Cyrus called, Coming! Coming right away! and trotted off. I took a final sip of tea, and with a nod of thanks, handed the glass to Cyrus's excellent servant, who was in charge of the refreshments. I didn't believe Lord Carnarvon would actually go so far as to evict us. Monsieur Lacour had confirmed our right to remain in the West Valley. But I was very vexed to hear that someone had spread the word about Emerson's curses. Carter and Carnarvon would not have dared to do so, since they would have had to admit entering the tomb illicitly. We could not accuse them without admitting our own presence, even if we had been disposed to behave dishonorably. The only other persons who had overheard the exchange were the tomb robbers and Sir Malcolm, and perhaps Kevin O'Connell and Bertie and Jumana. Some of them could not be trusted to hold their tongues, and for all we knew, other spectators had been there. At least the rumours were only that, unconfirmed and deniable. We became for a time very popular with visitors, who assumed, as any reasonable person might, that we were among Howard's confidants. When we disavowed special knowledge or influence, 
Some refused to believe us, and a few tried to bribe us. Emerson sent Wasim to the guardhouse with his antique rifle. Conspicuous among the ones who did not call were the members of the Metropolitan Museum crew at Deir el-Bahri. They had all been friends of ours for many years, and I was unable to account for their absence until Ramses offered an explanation. Carter has approached them for help. He needs all the expert assistance he can get, and he's had special relations with the Met for years. Special relations, bah, said Emerson. He's been selling them antiquities. They can afford to pay well, Ramsay said equably. And Carter is, after all, a dealer. No doubt the Metropolitan is hoping for a share of the artifacts in return for its help. It isn't surprising that they should avoid us now that we are in disfavor with Carnarvon. He had come to tea straight from the workroom, where he'd been closeted most of the afternoon. Emerson, who'd been sulking most of the afternoon, nodded glumly. They've got the experts he needs, he admitted. Burton for photography, Hauser and Hall as draftsmen. They say, he grimaced painfully at the fact that he'd been reduced to repeating rumors. They say Breasted will be asked to assist with the translations. Your old mentor, I said with a nod at Ramsay's. We ought to ask him to tea, don't you think? No, said Emerson. Don't you like him? asked Charla, who'd been occupied with the plate of biscuits. Your grandfather only means that Mr. Breasted will be very busy, I explained, before Emerson could reply with the truth. In his opinion, Breasted had never given Ramses the credit he deserved. Cheer up, Emerson. Things will quiet down once Hard has closed the tomb again. Why will he do that? asked Charla. "'leaning against her grandfather's knee. "'He patted her black curls, "'a familiarity she permitted from no one else. "'He cannot leave it open while he collects supplies and assistance,' "'I explained. "'He will need film, packing materials, and a hundred other things, "'and people who are experienced in working with delicate objects. "'He should ask Papa and Grandpapa to help, then. "'Go and, uh, and throw sticks for a mirror, Charla.' Outside, if you please. The dog, lying athwart the threshold, jumped up, barking. Charla rushed out, and they were soon locked in a fond embrace, which ended with both rolling about on the ground. David John's fair head was bent over a chessboard, with Sethos as his opponent. The boy had been taught the game the past summer by his uncle Walter. It was difficult to find reading material suitable for a juvenile mind. After finding David, John immersed in Dracula, his blonde hair virtually standing on end, Walter had proposed chess as an alternative. It had seemed like a good idea at the time. Charla's talents lay in other areas. Intimidation, for instance. Any luck? I asked of Ramses. Only in a negative sense. He came to take a cup from me and lowered his voice, though apparently absorbed in the game. David John had an unnerving ability to overhear what he was not supposed to hear. The commonest codes consist of letters of the alphabet, Ramses explained, rearranged according to some pre-established system, B for A, C for B, and so on. That's the simplest variation, and the simplest to crack. Even more complex substitution ciphers can be decoded fairly easily on the basis of letter frequency and repetition. In theory, one could set up a system using numbers instead of letters, but... Confound it, Mother, I'm no expert. I played with simple codes like the ones I've described when I was a child. But it was only a game. So there is no hope of deciphering the message? I asked. Ramses ran his fingers through his disheveled locks. I think... Mind you, it's only a guess that the numbers refer to a book or manuscript. The numbers can be broken into groups of threes, which would indicate the page of the book, the line on the page, and the word or letter in a line. Probably the word. Let's suppose that the manuscript Sethos found was the master copy. When other copies were dispatched to members of the organization, they already had the book in their possession. They would be able to read this message and any other that might be sent but we don't have it. How many millions of books do you suppose there are in this wide world? Surely there are some obvious choices, I said. Books one would find in most households. Oh, yes, the Bible and the Koran come to mind. Do you know how many different editions of each are in print? And before you can ask, he went on in mounting exasperation, 
It did occur to me that the numbers might be references to verses or surahs or chapters. In what language? Arabic? Hebrew? English? With a malevolent look at Sephos, he added, You ought to have examined the gentleman's bookshelves. There was no sensible reply to this unfair charge, and Sephos did not attempt to make one. With wrinkled brow he was studying the board. His queen seemed to be in imminent peril. "'It's late,' Nefret said, "'and Charles filthy. "'She's been rolling round on the ground with a mirror. "'Come, David John, you can finish your game tomorrow.' "'I have finished,' said David John, moving a piece. "'Checkmate, sir.' "'After the children had been removed, I said to Sethos, "'You shouldn't have let him win.' "'I didn't let him win,' said Sethos. "'The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. "'It could not be said that many of their seasons in Egypt had lacked distraction, "'but to Ramses this was one of the worst. "'Not only did they have a wanted fugitive hiding out with them, "'but the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb "'would bring half the world to the small town of Luxor.' There was no question of keeping the find a secret. It had been known and exaggerated by the citizens of Luxor almost from the first moment. Arthur Merton, the Times correspondent, had been allowed into the tomb on November the 30th and had wired his dispatch the same day. Representatives of the Cairo newspapers had begun to arrive. The hotels were full and some of the dragomen were wooing tourists by telling them about the great discovery and offering to show it to them. By December 3rd, there was nothing much to see, since Carter had refilled the tomb. But that didn't deter the curious. The sheer numbers of strangers provided perfect cover for assassins. If Sethos's adversaries hadn't become suspicious of Antony Bisinghurst by now, they weren't the professionals Ramses believed them to be. His premonitions turned out to be correct, but not in the way he expected. One night, shortly after the tomb had been refilled, they were sitting on the veranda after dinner when they heard hoofbeats approaching. Someone's in a hurry, Ramses said, going to the door. Good Lord, it's Bertie. What's wrong? Can Nefret come right away? Of course. Nefret rose without haste, her voice taking on its note of professional calm. Who is ill, Bertie? Your mother? No, thank God. That is... He removed his hat. Uh, "'Sorry, I'm afraid I rather lost my head. "'It's not a matter of life and death, I suppose, "'but he's an awful sight, covered with blood and... "'Cyrus?' Emerson demanded. "'Nudgy. He went over to Luxor this evening, "'and we were just starting to worry about him "'when he staggered in, covered with blood and... "'Let me get my medical bag,' Nefret said. "'I will start the motor car,' Emerson exclaimed. "'We will take the horses,' his wife said, "'putting her embroidery back in its bag. "'Now, Peabody, the motor car is in perfect condition. "'Selim and I had it out for a spin yesterday. "'The steering apparatus came loose. "'But the brakes worked,' Emerson said triumphantly. "'And Selim has repaired. "'No, Emerson, not in the dark and along that road.' "'Ramses slipped out. "'By the time the others reached the stables, "'he had roused Jamad and saddled Risha and Nefret's moonlight.' Nefret hurried in, bag in hand, while, at his mother's insistence, several other mounts, including hers, were being saddled. He had known it was a forlorn hope that she would remain behind. "'We'll go on ahead,' Nefret announced, with Bertie. "'Aren't you coming?' Ramses asked Sethos. Hands thrust into his pockets, he stared unenthusiastically at the mare Jamad was saddling, and then shrugged. Oh, "'I suppose I ought.' Ramses left them to it, following his wife out the open gate and along the road. Nefret set a rapid pace. The castle shone through the dark like a public monument, and the gates were open. Hastily dismounting, they hurried into the house where Cyrus was waiting. "'Sorry if we scared you,' he said. "'Cat says it's not as bad as it looked, but Bertie got worked up and—' "'Don't apologize, Cyrus,' Nefret said. "'Where is he?' Naji had been put to bed in his own room. Though Catherine had sponged off his face and bared chest, he was still a nasty sight. When he saw Nefret, he smiled apologetically. They should not have bothered you. Mrs. Vandergelt is a good nurse, and I'm not much hurt. You look like hell, 
Ramsay said, studying the bruises and cuts and the blood matted in his hair. What happened? Should he talk, Nefret? She had given the exposed parts of his body a quick inspection. Now she pulled down the sheet that covered him to the waist. He was wearing loose drawers, but he let out a cry of protest. I'll go. "'Catherine said tactfully. "'You mustn't mind Dr. Emerson, Naji. "'She's accustomed to this. "'Cyrus, or one of the male servants, "'must have helped him undress and change clothes,' Ramses thought. "'Brick red with embarrassment, Naji looked even younger than his real age, "'which was probably in the early twenties. "'But he swallowed and tried to pretend he was accustomed "'to being examined by a woman. "'I wa. Yes, of course. I understand.' Fortunately, Nefret had finished checking the lower part of his body before the rest of the party burst in. Nefret smoothly raised the sheet as Nudgy started convulsively. It could be worse, she reported, before her mother-in-law could demand details. He got a nasty thump on the head, but there's no sign of concussion. Looks as if someone went at him with a club and another someone with a knife. What happened? Emerson demanded, looming over the bed. Just a minute, father. Nefret stirred drops into a glass of water and held it to Naji's lips. Drink this. It will help the pain while I disinfect these cuts. I will assist, said her mother-in-law eagerly. Not necessary, mother. Naji let out a sigh of relief and let his head fall back on the pillow. Obviously the Sitakim terrified him even more than her formidable husband. I will tell you, father of curses, what little I know. I had gone to a coffee shop in Luxor, and when I started back toward the landing, two men attacked me. I do not know who they were. Their faces were covered, but I took them for ordinary thieves. At first I fought back, but I was losing, and no one answered my calls for help. So then I thought, if it is my money they want, let them take it. I fell on the ground. They went on kicking and pulling at my clothing, and I had visions of paradise and believed I would die. Then his brow furrowed. Then I thought I heard a far-off voice say, Fools! A man may increase his height, but not lessen it. It must have been a dream, for the words make no sense. Not to him, perhaps. Ramses looked at his uncle, standing silently in the corner. What happened then? Emerson asked. I fainted, Naji said simply. When I woke, no one was there, so I came here. I'm sorry, Mr. Vandergelt, that I was late. Cyrus patted him on the shoulder. Not your fault, my boy. How do you feel? Sleepy? He flinched a little as Nefret dabbed antiseptic on the head wound. The worst is over, she said. You should have been wearing your turban. They pulled it off. Naji let out a weak giggle. They pulled at my hair, too. It hurt. He had talked more that night than in the entire time they'd known him, Ramses thought. Talked sensibly, even glibly, as if he had thought his story out in advance. Sleep now, Nefret pulled the sheet up to the patient's chin. I will leave more medicine. You'll need it tomorrow morning because you will be stiff and sore. How is he? What happened to him? Suzanne was waiting outside the door. She had kept out of the way until then, and Ramses couldn't help thinking her inquiry sounded somewhat perfunctory. They assured her that the attack had been an ordinary attempt at robbery, and that Naji had not been much hurt. "'Can I do anything to help?' The question was directed at Cyrus, and accompanied by one of her sweetest smiles. Picturing Naji's face, if the girl was allowed to sit by his bedside, Ramses assured her that her assistance was not needed. They refused Cyrus's invitation to stay for a drink. He was eager to discuss the revelations of the evening, but it couldn't be done in the presence of Catherine and Suzanne. Ramses knew they would have to take Cyrus into their confidence before long. His mother had told him what Cyrus had said about Sethos. Whenever that fellow turns up, it means trouble. Ramses couldn't have agreed more. They had managed to put their old friend off so far, but Cyrus was too shrewd to miss that revealing statement Naji had overheard from his attackers. It could only mean that they had mistaken the young man for someone else, and given his check had passed, Sethos was the logical suspect. They held the horses to a walk so they could talk. Sethos edged close to his brother. Congratulations, said Emerson, who had observed this maneuver. Once again, an innocent took the beating meant for you. Sethos didn't bother to deny it. 
They're getting closer. Why did they pick on him? Because not even you could disguise yourself as a petite French woman, Nefret said. Then that only leaves Antony Bissinghurst, doesn't it? Not necessarily, Ramsay said grudgingly. He didn't at all mind seeing his uncle in a state of nerves. I wonder if attacks on male tourists have increased recently. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they had, Sethos said, cheering up. I could be anybody, even a tourist. Until Margaret turns up, Ramsay said. I can't imagine what's been keeping her. She may not have been in England when the rumours about the tomb began, Lefret said. She'll certainly have heard the news by now, Emerson said. Merton's article was in the Times on the 30th. If she left right away, she could be here any day now. Hmm, said his wife. What's that supposed to mean? Emerson demanded. It means that we will deal with Margaret when the time comes. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The day wasn't over. Dowd and Selim were waiting on the veranda. The former's face was grave. Now what? Emerson demanded. It took a great deal to wipe the smile from Dowd's face. Bad news, father of curses. We know about the attack on Najee. We've just come from there, Ramses said. He isn't much hurt. Dowd shook his head. Not that, Ramses. It is worse, much worse. You make it worse, Selim said emphatically. It was an accident, meaningless. For God's sake, Emerson shouted. What has happened? The golden bird, Daoud intoned. It has been eaten by a cobra, the defender of the pharaoh. It means death to those who invade his tomb. Chapter 5 From Manuscript H Continued Lord Carnarvon and his daughter left for Cairo and England on the 4th of December. Ramses happened to be in Luxor that day on business of his own, so he was privileged to see their procession sweep through town with all the fanfare of a royal progress, surrounded by admirers and followed by the press. Carnarvon passed him without a glance. Perhaps he didn't see me, Ramses thought charitably. Carter did see him. He raised one hand in a half-hearted salute before hurrying on. Carter followed his patron to Cairo two days later. According to Daoud, he was saddened by the loss of his bird, but refused to understand the dire implications, which were evident to every sensible individual. Bah, said Emerson. It was only a bird, and cobras are not uncommon. But the omen of the golden bird was true, Dowd replied. The golden tomb was found, and is not the cobra the symbol of the pharaoh? He has you there, father, said Ramses. So you should be grateful to God that you are not the one who found the tomb, Dowd said earnestly. He bade them a ceremonial farewell and went off in something of a hurry. It was almost time for sunset prayers. Ramses didn't doubt the entire Emerson family would be featured in those prayers. We'd better not tell him we've been inside the cursed, um, excuse me, place, he said. Not only the tomb, but the burial chamber itself, his mother remarked. Don't underestimate Daoud. I'll wager he knows. He's hoping we weren't there long enough to arouse the royal wrath. If he knows, why didn't he say so? Nefret asked. "'Tisn't like Daoud to keep secrets to himself. "'Don't underestimate him,' her mother-in-law said again. "'Daoud can keep a secret when he is persuaded it is necessary.' "'That afternoon they had a visit from Herbert Winlock and George Barton. 
Their friends were always welcome for tea, but it had been some time since any of the Metropolitan Museum crew had stopped by. Winlock was one of what Emerson called the younger generation of Egyptologists, being approximately the same age as Ramses, though his rapidly receding hairline made him look older. He was a brilliant excavator and a genial host when the Americans entertained at their Luxor headquarters. He greeted them without self-consciousness, but Ramses thought Barton looked somewhat uncomfortable. A gawky, exuberant man, he had developed what Ramses' mother had called a crush on Nefret, and had a tendency to stare admiringly and unnervingly at her. After his mother had served the tea and Winlock had asked about their work in the West Valley, he got to the point. I understand you've fallen out with Carter and Carnarvon. Where did you hear that? asked Emerson. From Carnarvon. Did he tell you that he was in the valley that night? He denies he was there. Says you invented the story in order to cover up your own illegal entry into the tomb and your theft of several valuable items. Qui s'excuse s'accuse, Ramses murmured. His mother, stiff with indignation, said, Or rather, he who accuses another seeks to excuse himself. How contemptible. Barton, who had been squirming, said, We don't believe it, ma'am. I mean, it's known that you were in the valley that night. The Gurnawis have been jeering at the Ibn Simsa brothers for letting themselves be caught by the professor, and Farhat has gone into hiding. But we all know you'd never have done anything wrong. I mean, confound it. You may have saved the tomb from being robbed. I think it's damned, darned ungrateful of his lordship not to thank you. Have another cup of tea, said Ramsay's mother with a friendly smile, and a biscuit or two before the children arrive and finish them. Barton helped himself. Were they there? he asked. Unlike his lordship, we do not accuse others, Emerson said loftily. I will say no more. Admirable. Winlock said. George has it right, Professor. No one would ever believe you had behaved in an underhanded manner, but, well, you folks understand the position we're in. Emerson took out his pipe. So it's true that Carter has asked you to join in the excavation? Unofficially. I believe he's wiring Lithgow in New York for official permission. So you see, we can't afford to be drawn into your feud with Carnarvon, but, said Winlock emphatically, no one, not even the president of the U.S. of A., tells me how to choose my friends. Emerson appeared touched by this declaration, but after their guests had left, he remarked, Friendship is all very well, but Winlock won't let it interfere with business. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I need to have a talk with Dowd, Emerson declared. This is the third day in succession that he's been late. We had concluded the excavation of I's tomb and moved most of the crew to the unfinished tombs, numbers 24 and 25. The only ones left behind were Suzanne, who had begun copying the paintings in the burial chamber, and Bertie, who was making his final plan. This arrangement pleased Jumana, for a staff artist was considered to be lower on the scale than an excavator. She was inclined to put on airs. Dowd is no shirker, I said, and he is entitled to time off if he needs it. But he won't answer questions, Emerson complained. That isn't like Dowd. Curse it, he is verging on insubordination. Perhaps he's taking steps to counter the curse of the golden bird, Nefret suggested. What steps? Emerson demanded. Nefret chuckled. Praying. He prays too cursed much, grumbled Emerson. Suzanne emerged from the entrance to the tomb, sketchpad in hand. Her blonde curls hung limp round her face, and her neat shirtwaist was soaked with perspiration. With a murmur of thanks, she accepted the glass of tea Nefret handed her. You ought not stay inside so long, the latter said with a look of concern. You aren't accustomed to the heat. I don't mind, Suzanne said valiantly. The trouble is, I drip perspiration onto the paper. The paint keeps smearing. Disconsolately, she studied her sketch pad. The drawing was indeed blurry. Have one of the men standing by to wipe your brow, I suggested. Suzanne seemed to find the image amusing. It would make me feel silly. I will just keep on trying. Come and see me if you feel unwell, Nefret said. I'll prescribe a day of rest. That is kind. Perhaps when Mr. Carter returns, I may be allowed to watch him reopen the tomb. 
what I have seen of it has not been exciting. None of us is going there, said Emerson. You may do as you like, Emerson, but you cannot dictate how others spend their leisure hours, I said. Did I hear you say something about the girls? Suzanne asked, forestalling what would certainly have been a heated response from Emerson. The men are all talking about it. There is no curse, said Emerson, like Jehovah issuing a commandment. Mais non, certainement, but it is a good story. She shivered in pretended alarm and then laughed. What's so funny? Cyrus asked, joining the group. I could use a good laugh. It is only about the curse, Suzanne explained. The curse of the golden bird. She broke into another peal of laughter. Cyrus smiled in sympathy, but shook his head. Some people are going to take it seriously, my dear. I think the professor does. He says we may not go near the tomb. She gave Emerson a sidelong glance, eyes widening even more. Emerson looked at her with the same expression as the great cat of Ray when Amira makes playful approaches. Dao turned up at breakfast the following morning. He often did so, since he appreciated Marman's cooking, but I could tell at once that he had a more compelling reason for being there. For one thing, his left cheek was green. I recognized Khadijah's famous ointment, which she applied to injuries. Was there trouble? I asked. Only from the lady, said Daoud, his honest face falling. But do not fear, said Akim. I have her safe. Margaret was safe, but to judge from the scratches on Dawood's face, not in a pleasant frame of mind. Emerson's frame of mind was not much better. Thumping the table with such force that the crockery rattled, he shouted, So that's what you've been up to. How dare you suborn my employees and plot against me, Peabody? Someone had to, I replied, anticipating an enjoyable argument. None of the rest of you seem to have given a curse about Margaret's safety. Sethos ducked his head, avoiding my accusing look. Emerson looked almost as guilty. Nefret's eyes widened as enlightenment dawned. Margaret's here? When? How? What's this all about? It's very simple, my dear, I replied. I knew Margaret would come as soon as she heard about the tomb and that she would pass through Cairo without stopping. There was not much chance of her being intercepted by us or anyone else while she was there. Crediting our adversaries with intelligence approaching my own, I assumed they would be on the watch for her arrival in Luxor. So was Daoud. Following my instructions, I added, with a provocative glance at Emerson. He was making bubbling noises like a kettle on the boil. Why didn't you tell me? he sputtered. When one wishes to keep a secret, one confides in as few people as is possible, Emerson. <clears throat> said Emerson. Oh, well. I invited Dao to sit down and tell us all about it. Nothing loath, he accepted a plate of eggs and toast from Fatima. I knew her at once, said Akim, and she knew me and was pleased to see me. But then she said she would go to the hotel, and when I said no, she must come with me and wear the habara you told me to bring. She said no, she would come to see you later, after she had got a room at the hotel. And I said there were no rooms, and she said she would find one. And what the... a bad word said, was I doing? And when I took hold of her very gently, said, she... He raised his hand to his cheek. That's outrageous, Daoud, Nefret exclaimed. What did you do, bind and gag her, and wrap her in a habara and carry her off? The Sith Hakim said she must not be seen by anyone who might recognize her. Daoud's eyes filled with tears like those of a chidden child. He was not accustomed to hearing harsh words from Nefret. Don't scold him, Nefret. He did exactly as I told him, I said. I feared she might not take kindly to being ordered about. She never does, said Sethos. Thank you, Daoud. You did right. One can only hope so, said Ramses grimly. How many people saw you carrying a bundled-up woman, Daoud? Many. When they asked, I said what the Seth Hakim told me to say, that she was a young cousin who had run away from her father to make a foolish marriage. Not bad, Sethos admitted. Where is she? 
Dawood had taken her to his house and delivered her into the kindly but powerful arms of Khadijah. So there was no hurry. I finished my breakfast before I changed into my working costume. Everyone wanted to come with me, though Sethos's offer was somewhat perfunctory, but it did not take long to convince them that a descent in force would only attract undesired attention. Ramses retreated to his workroom, Daoud went with the others to the West Valley, and I set off alone for Guna, leaving Sethos coolly drinking coffee. Khadija was expecting me. I am sorry to put you to this trouble, I began. Arms folded, she shrugged her broad shoulders. It is no trouble, Sitakim, though it was trouble for Daud, she added, with one of her rare smiles. Khadija admired strong women. She had locked Margaret into one of the rooms reserved for visitors. It had only one small window, high in the wall, but it was pleasant enough, with a nice little bed, a basin of water for washing, and bottles of water and lemonade. I had supplied various items to make the prisoner more comfortable, including a reading lamp and several of the latest novels. Margaret was sitting on a pile of cushions when I entered. She looked up and then rose. Many people, including my husband, claimed Margaret and I resembled each other. I could never see it myself, though her hair, like mine, was thick and black. She was a few inches taller than my meager five feet and a bit, and her figure was not so full particularly round the chest. Her features were strongly marked, with dark brows and a prominent chin. It protruded even more than usual just then. Would you like a proper chair? I asked, observing that she'd had some difficulty getting to her feet. I would like an explanation. She sat down on the bed and folded her hands. You're taking it well, I said. Dowd said you stopped struggling as soon as he put you over his shoulder. I accepted the futility of struggling with a man the size of Dawood. And you knew he was acting on my orders. I assumed so. But you cannot keep me a prisoner, Mrs. Emerson. Her dark eyes smoldered. I'll get away by one means or another. So I was no longer Amelia to her. I couldn't blame her. When I explain, you will understand why I had to act as I did. Are you aware that your husband is in mortal danger? There is nothing new about that. Don't you care? Her eyes no longer smoldered. They blazed. He promised me before we were married that he would give up his career, if you can call it that. He lied. It was his choice. I cannot spend the rest of my life in agony over a man who cares so little for me that he... Her voice cracked, and she bit her lip. So she did still care for him. I hadn't been certain. Their affair had been tempestuous. However, a lasting relationship is not based on passion alone, but on mutual esteem as well. I had to admit Sethos hadn't shown much for her. However, this was not the time to settle their marital difficulties. I would work on that later. Without further delay, I told her about Sethos's present situation. I held nothing back, for there was a chance she might have a useful idea. The danger to you cannot be dismissed, I concluded. The people who are after him may know his true identity, in which case they will know you are his wife. One quality of Margaret's that I believe I may claim to share was that she was quick to understand the ramifications. She at once realized that I had acted out of concern for her, and her face softened a trifle. It is an interesting problem, she conceded the attack on that unfortunate young man, Naji, and the comments he overheard certainly suggest that he was mistaken for my husband. His opponents can't be very clever, though, since the two do not have the same physical characteristics. Does that mean they don't have an accurate description? That occurred to me, of course. It seems unlikely that they don't know what he looks like, but I confess I cannot explain the attack on Naji. Margaret shrugged. I wish I could help, but I know nothing about his recent activities. Must I stay here until the matter is resolved, one way or another? I wasn't entirely certain what she meant by that, and I preferred not to ask. Oh, it will be resolved. You certainly can't stay here indefinitely. I'll think of something. I must accept that, I suppose. In the meantime, a chair, I promised, happy to find her so reasonable. Whatever else you would like.
all you know about the tomb of Tutankhamun. I beg your pardon, I gasped. That scoundrel O'Connell is already here, Margaret said, taking pencil and notebook from the pocket of her coat. The smolder was back, about to burst into flames. While I sit immured in this, this cell, the least you can do for me is give me a story. The least I had done for her was, possibly, to have saved her life. Perhaps, to a true journalist, this meant less than an exclusive story. She and Kevin had been rivals for years, and as a woman, she had had a hard struggle making a name for herself. A half-promise would keep her quiet and give her something to do, but I attempted to temporize. If you have read the newspaper accounts, you probably know more than I do. We have not been invited to view the tomb. Why not? The question came quick as a pistol shot. I would not care to speculate. But I would. The lines around her mouth folded into a grin. Professional jealousy? Some personal disagreement? Did Lady Evelyn make eyes at Ramsay's and Nefret slap her face? Really, Margaret, your imagination has got out of hand. I handed her the book I had brought with me. Here is the second volume of Emerson's History of Egypt. Why don't you write a nice biography of Tutankhamun and his more famous father-in-law, Akhenaten? That'll do to start. She took the book. But I expect daily reports, Amelia, about what is going on in the valley, and send Nefret to see me. She and Khadija are great chums, I understand, so a visit from her won't cause comment. I left, feeling as if I had got off fairly easily. Sharp was certainly the word for Margaret. One of the words. She hadn't asked to see Sethos. I didn't want to see him either, so instead of returning to the house, I went straight to the West Valley. Emerson had been on the lookout for me. He hurried to meet me with Nefret close on his heels. Well, he demanded. How is she? Nefret asked anxiously. I presume you're inquiring about her mental state, since you can hardly suppose Dowd or Khadija would have offered her bodily harm. I allowed Emerson to lift me down from the saddle. He set me on my feet with a thump. Don't equivocate, Peabody. I explained the situation, and she has agreed to remain where she is for the time being. I took my handkerchief out and patted my damp forehead and cheeks before I added, so long as I keep her informed about what is happening with the tomb. Hands on hips, head tilted, Emerson considered this. The sun woke highlights in his raven locks, for he was, of course, without a hat. Finally, he said, I must give you credit, Peabody, for deviousness exceeding your usual talents in that direction. You have found the sole excuse I would have accepted for joining that lot in the East Valley. I assure you, Emerson, no such idea entered my mind until Margaret... <clears throat> said Emerson, loudly. She also requested that Nefret visit her. Requested? It was more along the lines of a demand, I admitted. I haven't been to see Khadija for some time, Nefret said. Of course I'll go. Margaret must be frightfully worried about him. On the surface, she appears more angry than worried, I said. However, anger is one sign of profound concern. According to... She is hoping you will be more indiscreet than Peabody, said Emerson loudly. He was afraid I was about to utter the forbidden word, psychology. You will have to watch what you say, Nefret. Nefret looked alarmed. What shouldn't I say? Hmm, I said. We'd better talk about that before you go. Since I endeavor to be truthful whenever possible, I would admit to the reader that Margaret's request, or demand, was like the answer to a prayer. I do not like being kept out of things. We'd been excluded from interesting archaeological activities before, and, I must add, for the same reason. But this discovery was so extraordinary that it rankled to be treated like outsiders instead of the experts we were. In my opinion, Lord Carnarvon was being petty-minded to react so vindictively to a few curses. Like Emerson, I had no intention of humbly suing for favours from him. But I had hopes of Howard, and there were others who owed us consideration. However... I decided to postpone my visit till the following day. I had a number of other problems to deal with. Among them was what to tell Cyrus. He'd been pestering me, his word, and a most expressive word, too, about Sethos. 
I had managed to put him off so far, but I owed my old friend at least part of the truth, particularly in view of the fact that one of his staff had been affected. Sethos had to be dealt with, and so did Margaret. I had told her that the matter would be resolved, but just then I hadn't the faintest idea what to do about it. Life was becoming complicated. I withdrew to a quiet corner and made one of my little lists. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses had given the others the impression that he had abandoned his attempt to decipher the message, but he hadn't been able to resist tinkering with it. The number groups were susceptible to several variations, and he had tried all of them without success. What dangerous secret could the damn thing contain? A threatened coup? A secret alliance? Plans for war? Disclosure would presumably constitute a danger to those plans, which implied that they were of vital importance. However, he was only too familiar with the peculiar thinking of the intelligence services, and he'd known men to massacre their fellow men and women for reasons that made no sense to a normal mind. Tossing a Hebrew Old Testament aside in disgust, he went back to work on his hieratic translations and managed to concentrate on his work for a few hours before he realized that his ears were pricked, listening for sounds of his mother's return from Gurna. Leaning back in his chair, he ran his fingers through his hair. She was getting out of hand. Kidnapping Margaret Minton was really beyond the pale. Her reasons for doing so had made sense at the time. Those steely gray eyes and firm chin had a way of hypnotizing her listeners. But the more he thought about them, the more he was inclined to think his mother had yielded to her fondness for melodrama. He'd have to have a talk with her. What was taking her so long? Perhaps she had gone to the West Valley, leaving Sethos and him to stew. A little chat with Sethos might not be a bad idea. Tossing his pen onto the table, he went in search of his uncle. After looking in the garden where the children were playing and on the veranda, he ran Sethos to earth in the courtyard behind the house. The women of the household were going about their business, preparing food, washing clothes. In a quiet corner, where his mother's hibiscus flaunted crimson blossoms around a carved bench, Sethos sat with his hands folded and head bent, as if in profound meditation. He looked up with a start. Time for luncheon? No. There was room on the bench, but Ramses was disinclined to give an impression of congeniality. He sat down on the ground, folding his legs under him with the ease of long habit. Sorry to disturb your nap. I wasn't asleep, Sethos yawned, as if to give the lie to his statement. He's trying to annoy me, Ramses thought. And he's succeeding. What are you going to do? he asked. But what? Oh, Margaret, your mother has her well in hand. Another gaping yawn. About the situation in general, Ramsay said, holding on to his temper. We can't go on like this indefinitely. Something is sure to happen sooner or later. He added pensively, I have a plan. You wouldn't care to share it with me, I suppose. Sethos scratched his chin. He hadn't shaved that morning, and now that Ramses took a closer look at him, he saw signs of strain, sunken eyes, new lines on his face. Then the old mocking smile curved his mouth. It's not much of a plan yet. Stay out of it, Ramses. I'm already in it, thanks to you. And so are the rest of us. I made a mistake, Sethos admitted. I should not have come here, but that's all water over the dam. That was undeniably true, but in Ramsay's opinion, inadequate. He knew it was as close to an apology as he was likely to get, though. Sethos went on breezily. I will tell you part of my plan. I shall come out of seclusion and make myself visible. In order to draw attention to you and away from us, Ramsay's raised sceptical eyebrows. How noble. Not at all. It's time I took an interest in that tomb. Ramses duly reported this statement to his mother when she returned from the valley. Her only response was a brief, We'll discuss it later. She was dusty and flushed, and he knew she was anxious to get to the comfort of her nice tin bathtub, but he held her back. Mother, has it occurred to you that we have only Sethos's word that he is in danger? 
Even the attacks on Father and me, and on Najee, bear his hallmarks, melodramatic but not life-threatening, designed, perhaps, to bear out his claim of being in imminent danger. The only fatality has been the death of the old holy man, and that might not have been intended. Every incident could have been engineered by him, and the so-called code may be a fake. She took off her hat and pushed the damp hair back from her face. Why would he arrange such an elaborate scheme? He's after Carter's tomb. Naturally, the possibility had occurred to me. Ramsay's managed not to swear. Observing his expression, she smiled. Dear boy, I admit I have a tendency to claim the credit for prescience after the fact. In this case, however, I am not exaggerating. The conjunction of a rich find and an unexpected visit from a former antiquities thief could not but arouse suspicion. Certain facts do cast doubt on that theory, however. The timing, for one thing. The first attack on you and your father occurred long before Howard's discovery. Sethos has his sources, Ramses argued. Father suspected the tomb was there, and so might Sethos have done. The bout of malaria could not have been planned. It was fortuitous, but if it hadn't happened, he'd have found some other excuse for coming here. You make a compelling case, she patted his arm. Now, if you will excuse me, I must tidy up. Cyrus is coming for tea. Are you going to let him in on this? High time I did, don't you think? When his father and Cyrus arrived, Suzanne was with them, Ramses had the distinct impression that his mother had not included the girl in her invitation, but she greeted the unexpected and unwanted guest with bland courtesy, and suggested Suzanne might want to tidy herself before tea. "'I could use a bit of tidying, too,' Nefret said, with a rueful smile. "'Come with me, Suzanne. You haven't seen our house yet, I believe.' "'Bring the kiddies back with you,' Emerson ordered. He settled himself in a cushioned chair and stretched his legs out. Never mind tea, Peabody. I want a whiskey and soda. She raised her eyebrows, but went to the door and called to Fatima. The housekeeper appeared with the tray so promptly that Ramses realized she must have been lurking. She often did when Sethos was among those present. Seated modestly at a little distance from the others, he was the perfect picture of a humble subordinate. A propitiatory smile on his lips, and his eyes fixed on Emerson as if awaiting an order. I could do with something, too, Cyrus declared. Never mind the soda. Now, what about it, Amelia? You got rid of Suzanne very neatly. She more or less invited herself. Start talking before she comes back. She whisked one of her little lists from the pocket of her skirt. How to begin, she mused, perusing it. Perhaps you'd better let me begin, Sethos said. He had abandoned his subservient pose. Cyrus knows what I do. He won't be surprised to hear that I ran into a spot of trouble on my last assignment. I, um, borrowed a certain document which seems to be of interest to a number of people. They've been on my trail ever since. Cyrus nodded. His pale blue eyes were fixed on Sethos, and his expression was not friendly. They took poor Najee for you. I thought so. What's in the blame document? That's the trouble, Sethos said. It's in code. I couldn't read it. So you came here with a bunch of thugs at your heels. Cyrus took the glass Emerson handed him. A low-down trick to play on friends. He was ill with malaria, Ramses said, wondering why the hell he was defending his uncle. And they, whoever they are, would have come looking for him here in any case. His mother had been waiting for an opening. Ramses is correct, Cyrus. These people know Sephos's true identity, and that means they know who his friends are. And, she added portentously, who his wife is. Good Lord, Cyrus exclaimed. She'd be the perfect hostage, wouldn't she? Where is the lady? As if drawn by a magnet, all eyes turned toward Ramses's mother. She cleared her throat. In a safe place, Cyrus... I saw her this morning. She's here! Cyrus was accustomed to the Emerson's unorthodox habits, but this obviously took him aback. Where? How? When did she? Please, Cyrus, allow me to continue. Some of the others haven't heard about my interview with Margaret either, so if you will permit me... 
Emerson let out a pained groan and emptied his glass. This may take a while, Cyrus. You know Peabody's narrative style. Have another whiskey. Allow me. Sethos, who hadn't been offered one, went to the table and helped himself as well as Cyrus. How is my beloved spouse, Amelia? Perfectly comfortable and in a very bad temper. With me? Sethos inquired. With everyone, especially you. However, she has agreed to remain where she is so long as I keep her informed about the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb. So that's what's brought her here, Sethos muttered. You expected it, didn't you? When have you ever known Margaret to miss an important story? She knows Kevin is in Luxor and is counting on us to provide her with exclusive information. <sighs> Said Emerson. She's due to be disappointed, then. We haven't any exclusive information. That is what I hope to obtain tomorrow, said his wife smoothly. Cyrus and I, Nefret and Ramses... Here they come, Ramses interrupted. The others had heard them, too. Only a deaf person could have failed to do so. The dog's ecstatic barking, the shouts of the children, and mingling with them, Suzanne's high-pitched laughter. Never mind the damn... the darn tomb... Cyrus said quickly. What are you going to do to get out of this mess? If you have any suggestions, I'd be happy to hear them, said Emerson. Get an expert to read that message, said Cyrus. If I understand you rightly, that's what those fellows are trying to prevent. Emerson's jaw dropped. It was such an obvious solution. None of them had thought of it, except Ramsay's. Painfully aware of his own lack of expertise, he had known better than to propose it. His mother and father would have scoffed at the idea that the family couldn't handle anything up to and including murder without outside help. But there were a number of objections to the idea. Experts on codes weren't numerous, and most of the ones he knew worked for the department. If his hypothesis was correct, even an expert couldn't read the message without knowing which book was referred to. The twins burst in, demanding their tea and offering to share the biscuits with Suzanne. They had taken a fancy to her, which rather surprised their father. After an unfortunate incident a few years earlier, Charla had developed a suspicion of pretty yellow-haired ladies. Suzanne must have put herself out to win them over. Laughing, she allowed them to lead her to a chair, and David John brought out his chess set. Let Mademoiselle have her tea, his grandmother said sternly. She may not wish to play chess. Oh, but I promised I would. I am sure he will win. She rounded her eyes at David John, who stared like a hypnotized rabbit. Unlike his sister, he had a weakness for pretty yellow-haired ladies. Turning to Sethos, Suzanne said, David John says you are a very good player. He wins every time. Sethos said, smoothing his moustache and leering. He had a tendency to overplay a role. Suzanne returned his smile. She wasn't really pretty, Ramses thought dispassionately. Her cheekbones were flat and her chin weak. Admittedly, he was prejudiced. As far as he was concerned, no woman in the world could compare with his wife. Nefret had gone to Gunnar to pay the promised visit to Khadija and her guest. At least she had had sense enough to go in daylight instead of waiting till after dinner. There were lots of people around, and she had promised to ask Daoud to walk her home. When he returned his attention to the others, he saw that Sethos had got Emerson out of his fit of the sulks by talking about the tomb. The word no longer required a defining adjective. There was only one tomb in Egypt just then. Where did you hear that? Emerson demanded. I read the newspapers, Professor. Carnarvon sent a statement to the Times ten days ago, asserting that the tomb had been robbed during the 21st dynasty. Stuff and nonsense, Emerson exclaimed. If the existence of the tomb had been known at that time, it would have been emptied completely. And furthermore... We know the other arguments, Emerson, his wife cut in. The tomb can't have been entered after the 20th dynasty. The workmen's huts from the time of Ramses VI covered the entrance and were not disturbed until Howard cleared them away. Why would Howard allow Carnarvon to make such a ludicrous claim? It's obvious, isn't it? Sethos inquired meekly. An intact tomb belongs in its entirety to the Department of Antiquities. 
The definition of intact is open to argument, but if the robbery occurred during the period when most of the other royal tombs were looted, the discoverers are entitled to a share of the contents. Emerson growled in agreement. Suzanne gave Sethos an admiring smile. How clever of you, Mr. Businghurst. You know a great deal about the subject. Enough to know that Carter and Carnarvon are heading for trouble, Sethos said, ducking his head in pretended modesty. Thus far, the Times is the only newspaper to get information directly from the excavators. The other papers resent having to get their news second-hand, and the Egyptian journalists are furious at being passed over. With nationalist sentiments on the rise, he shook his head. And Lacour looking for an excuse to change the rules about the division of antiquities, Emerson added. Carnarvon's concession stipulates that the museum is to keep royal mummies and coffins and all other objects of historical and archaeological importance. Every object in that tomb can be said to fall into the last category. And in totality, they constitute a unique assemblage. The entire contents should go to the Cairo Museum. We didn't claim any of the objects from Tetesheri for ourselves. But we, said his wife, her chin protruding, are not Lord Carnarvon. At heart, he is nothing more than a collector. I guess maybe you could say the same about me, Cyrus said, self-consciously. I sure didn't refuse when Lacour offered me some of the artifacts from the Tomb of the Gods' Wives. You have worked in Egypt for years, Emerson said, worked hard and conscientiously. Compliments from Emerson were rare. Cyrus's lined face shone with pleasure. Carnarvon thinks of archaeology as entertainment, Emerson went on, and Carter deals in antiquities for his patron and others. They expect to make money out of this one way or another. Now, Emerson, you don't know that, his wife said, and you're being unfair to Howard. He has done excellent work in his time, but since he lost his position with the Department of Antiquities, he's been dependent on the patronage of buyers and of wealthy men like Carnarvon. For pity's sake, don't repeat your opinion elsewhere, and do not ask to accompany me to the East Valley tomorrow. I am not in the habit of asking you for permission, Peabody, nor have I any intention of going within a hundred feet of the cursed doom. I have lost interest in the matter said Emerson, chin out thrust. How about me? Cyrus asked, hopefully. You will be very welcome, Cyrus. I am sorry I cannot include anyone else. She gave Suzanne a pleasant smile, and the girl closed her mouth. <clears throat> said Emerson. Ramses, are you going to let that child stuff herself with cake? She will spoil her dinner. Ramses removed his daughter from the proximity of the tea table, and their guests, taking the hint, said goodbye. His mother had one more bombshell for them. Gesturing at the post-basket, she said, I received a wire from David today. He is coming out to Egypt with Senia and Gargery. Good Lord, Ramses said, taking a firmer hold on his squirming child. Charla let out a shriek of delight. Uncle David and Senia and Gargery too? That will be very pleasant, said David John. No, it... Um, Yes, said Emerson, in a strangled voice. Very pleasant. Good gad, Peabody, I told Gargery in no uncertain terms that he was not to come out to Egypt again. He's supposed to be a butler, for God's sake. Language, Emerson, said his wife. Gargery considers that his duties include defending us when the occasion demands. He has often wielded a cudgel on our behalf, and he has appointed himself Senior's guard and defender. The old rascal can barely walk, Emerson groaned. He claims that his rheumatics improve in our dry, hot climate. Medical opinion bears this out. David doesn't suffer from rheumatics, Emerson growled. Confound it. I suppose it's the da confounded tomb. They are coming because they want to be with us at this season, said his wife. Have you forgotten that Christmas is only a few weeks off? Speechless for once, Emerson got heavily to his feet and went for the decanter. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Cyrus turned up early next morning, ready and eager, as he put it. 
He joined us for coffee, and at my request, Nefret repeated her report on her visit with Margaret. She's hell-bent on getting an exclusive story, Nefret said with wrinkled brow. She kept asking about our feud, as she called it, with Lord Carnarvon. I made light of it and denied all her allegations, but we'd better come up with something important or she'll go for the scandal aspect. What scandal? Ramses asked. What allegations? You don't want to know, Nefret said, with an amused glance at her husband. But there hasn't been... "'Newspaper persons will invent scandal if none exists,' I said. "'I want you to accompany me to the East Valley this morning, Nefret. "'You get on well with gentlemen, and Carnarvon can't have anything against you. "'You weren't even with us that night. "'In fact, the only one who was warned off was Emerson.' "'Is that right?' Cyrus asked. "'Then why have we all been pussyfooting around as if we'd done something wrong?' "'Precisely,' I agreed. "'I allowed myself to be influenced by... Never mind. From now on, we will behave as if nothing untoward had occurred. If his lordship makes a fuss, it won't be our fault. Emerson had remained silent, pretending not to hear the hints or see the glances directed at him. He slammed his coffee cup into the saucer. I am going to the West Valley, he announced, to work. There is an interesting area north of WV-25. I intend to have the crew excavate down to bedrock. Good luck, said Cyrus. Bah, said Emerson. He stamped out. With a little cluck of disapproval, Fatima took the cracked cup and broken saucer away. For the benefit of ignorant readers, I should perhaps explain that the system of numbering tombs in the valleys had begun in the 1820s. Since then, other tombs had been added in the order of discovery. Those in the main East Valley were distinguished by the initials KV, those in the main West Valley as WV. There were only four of the latter, and my distinguished spouse had always suspected other entrances were hidden in the rugged cliffs that enclosed the valley. Selim was in the stable under the motor car. Hearing our approach, he slid out, modestly adjusting his skirts. I think I have repaired that sit, he announced. Shall I drive you to the valley? Where is Emerson? I asked, surprised he was not assisting in the repairs. He saddled his horse and rode off in a great hurry, cursing, said Selim. He would not wait. Just as well, I expect, I said. He is not in a happy frame of mind. The rest of us are going to the East Valley, but you'd better go to the West Valley with Emerson, Selim. Not in the motor car. Selim looked mutinous, but he knew better than to argue with me. Is it true that David and the little bird are coming soon? Little bird was Senia's nickname. She was adored by our Egyptian family, as was David, who was related through his grandfather to most of them. Gargery, too, I said. Ah, uh, said Selim. He helped Jamad saddle the horses and rode with us as far as the beginning of the road that led off to the West Valley, where he left us with a wave of farewell. We went on to the entrance to the East Valley and left the horses in the donkey park before we joined the stream of tourists. As we neared the tomb, we were accosted by an individual I had hoped not to see. Jauntily attired in pith helmet and Norfolk jacket, Kevin O'Connell fell in step with me. Good morning, Mrs. E. I thought you'd be coming round before this. Go away, I muttered, giving him a shove. Kevin put on a hurt expression and then grinned. I wouldn't want to query your pitch, Mom. I'll see you later. Rough retaining walls had been built around the entrance to the tomb, and a small shack for storage and for use of the guards was under construction. Howard had learned something from that memorable night a few weeks earlier. The tomb entrance was now guarded by Egyptian soldiers and by Mr. Callender, perched on the wall with a rifle across his knees. When he saw us, he sat up straight and burst into a fit of coughing. There was quite a lot of dust in the air. I hailed him with my usual good humour. Good morning, Mr. Callender. You really should put on your hat, you know. He looked warily from me to Ramses to Nefret to Cyrus to Sethos. Failing to see Emerson, he relaxed and replied with a courteous good morning. The debris over the tomb entrance had been removed, but the stairwell was still half filled. Square in the centre of the rubble stood a large boulder painted with a coat of arms, that of Lord Carnarvon, I assumed, since no one else was armigerous. No trouble, I hope, I inquired, edging closer. No, ma'am. 
A loud cough from Sephos at my elbow made me add, I believe you've not met our new staff member, Mr. Anthony Bisinghurst. His specialty is demotic, but he is something of an authority on the Amana period. A pleasure, sir, said Sephos effusively. Your dedication and ability have become a legend in Egypt. Like myself, Sethos knew people will believe themselves worthy of even the most outrageous compliment. Calendar beamed. No doubt he was pleased to have companionship in his boring job. He heaved himself to his feet. Excuse me, ladies, for not rising at once. Will you take a piece of wool? We mustn't disturb you, Nefret said, with a smile that brought her hidden dimples into play. We only drop by to say hello and bring you a bottle of Fatima's lemonade. The lemonade had been her idea, and it was met with an enthusiastic reception. Calendar drank thirstily. Very good of you, he said, wiping his mouth on a very dusty handkerchief. And may I say, Mrs. Emerson, how well you are looking. It has been some time since I saw you. The speech was not directed at me. Nefret said sweetly, We've been remiss in not coming before. So many duties, but we're ready and willing to help in any way we can. If, heaven forbid, you should be in need of medical attention, I hope you will come to me. This was another approach I hadn't thought of. Everyone knew that Nefret was the best physician in Luxor. Mr. Callender mopped the beads of perspiration off his balding head. Very kind of you, ma'am. I have been feeling a trifle seedy. No wonder, sitting in the heat and dust all day, Nefret said. It must be done, Calendar said nobly, to keep vultures like that one away. He directed a scowl at one of the spectators, who had pushed his pith helmet back to expose several locks of red hair. Has the press been annoying? I asked sympathetically, congratulating myself for ordering Kevin to keep his distance. That fellow especially. He claims to be a friend of yours. I laughed disdainfully. He is no friend of mine, Mr. Calendar. You know these newspaper persons, they will say anything to gain an advantage. They're wasting their time, Callender said, as you see nothing of interest is going on. When is Mr. Carter due back from Cairo? Cyrus asked. Callender hesitated. Any day now. So then you will be reopening the tomb? Cyrus persisted. I gave him a little poke with my parasol. Direct questions put people on the defensive. We must be getting on, I said. Come to tea one day, Mr. Callender. You're always welcome. Here, take this. I opened the parasol and pressed it into his hand. I have others. A pity we couldn't have got a photograph of Mr. Callender holding your parasol, said Nefret. He sure as heck didn't tell us anything, Cyrus said grumpily. Ah, but we have inserted a wedge, I replied, thanks in large measure to Nefret. Anyhow, I have other sources of information. Ramses broke a long silence. Were those the Carnarvon arms on that boulder? I assume so, I replied. Rather arrogant, isn't it? It won't go over well with the Egyptian government, I agreed. Seth, Antony is unfortunately correct. Carnarvon is heading for trouble if he continues to behave as if the tomb is his personal property. Davis always did, Ramses said fairly. Times have changed, Ramses. Resentment of foreigners has only increased since the negotiations for independence began. This find is precisely the sort of thing that could focus that resentment. May I quote you, Mrs. E? Certainly not, I replied. I did not need to look to identify the speaker who was behind me. Go away, Kevin. Now, Mrs. E, what harm can it do? A great deal of harm, as you well know. Good gad, Kevin, don't you have any other sources except us? Emerson hadn't really forgotten that Christmas was only a few weeks away. He hadn't been allowed to. David John had pinned a calendar to the wall of the playroom and was crossing off the days one by one. Charla kept presenting us with lists. A bow and arrow, I read, after receiving one such document. Your spelling is as reprehensible as your request, Charla. You cannot possibly suppose I would permit you to own a weapon. I will ask Grandpapa, then, said Miss Charla, scowling blackly. He won't let you have one either. However, the lists reminded me that I had shopping to do. One more duty among many others. Some might say that a happy Christmas was less important than averting the danger to Sethos or deciding how to keep Margaret quiet. But since I hadn't figured out how to deal with either of those difficulties... 
I decided to concentrate on a more cheerful topic. My last visit to Margaret had been less than satisfactory. She was chafing at her imprisonment, as she called it, and she berated me for not providing her with information about the tomb. When I announced my intention of running over to Luxor, Sethos was the first to offer to come with me. Why? I asked suspiciously. Presents for the children, of course, said Sethos, widening his eyes a la Suzanne Malraux. And you should have an escort, Amelia, dear. Who knows what enemies may be waiting to find you alone? You'd run at the first sign of trouble, said Emerson. I don't require an escort, I said firmly, but I will be happy to have company. What about you, Nefret? I suppose I'd better. I haven't anything for the twins, and I'd like to find gifts for Aunt Evelyn and Uncle Walter and David. So it was only the three of us. Sethos looked very dapper in flannel trousers and a brown tweed coat I recognized as coming from Ramsay's wardrobe. While Daoud's son Sabir was occupied with starting the engine of his boat, I said to my brother-in-law, Do you plan to continue wearing Ramsay's clothes? He hasn't that many extras. You can hardly expect me to place an order with my haberdasher in Cairo, Sethos said reproachfully. Under which of your names? No, oh, never mind. I will have to place the order in Ramsay's name, I suppose. Fortunately, Davis Bryan and company has his measurements. I hadn't been to Luxor for some time, and my spirits rose as Sabir's boat took us smoothly across the sun-rippled water. Earlier, Ramsay's had taken me aside and asked me not to leave Nefret's side, and to stay in safe areas, which I had intended to do anyhow. I was prepared to insist that Sethos remain with us, should he declare his intention of going off alone. But he made no such attempt, strolling along like any casual tourist, with Nefret on one arm and me on the other. If he intended to make his presence known, he succeeded. We were always running into people we knew, and most of them wanted to stop and chat. So did a number of people we did not know. Unavoidable conversations with the latter ran along the same lines. Ah, oh, Mrs. Emerson, I am sure you remember me, Miss Jones of the Joneses of Berkshire. May I hope you and your family will dine with us one evening soon? I gave them all to understand that they might not hope. We made the rounds of the shops. Sethos was at his most gregarious, introducing himself to all and sundry, and bargaining expertly for silver bangles and woven scarves. There was not a great deal of variety to be found in the shops of Luxor, mostly souvenirs and fake antiquities, but some of the good ladies at the school had begun encouraging local handicrafts, such as woodwork, weaving, and alabaster carving. We finished our expedition at the Winter Palace Hotel, where a few establishments carrying European goods were to be found, just in time for luncheon. Let us lunch on the terrace, Sethos suggested. It is too nice a day to be inside. If we can get a table, said Nefret, for the terrace was full. Amelia can always get a table, said Sethos. And so it proved. After we had settled ourselves, Nefret began rummaging through her purchases. Paints and pencils for David John, silver chains for Charla. I couldn't find anything for Uncle Walter. Men are always difficult, I agreed. Half turned in his chair, looking out over the street, Sethos said... I've been thinking of going up to Cairo to meet them. Give me a list and I'll see what I can do. Do you think that is a good idea? I inquired. Why not? You know perfectly well why not. Could it be that you want to avoid Margaret? You haven't once been to see her. It was you, I believe, who pointed out we ought to stay away from her. Perhaps I can... He broke off abruptly. A man had come to stand beside us. He removed his hat and inclined his head. "'Ah, Sir Malcolm,' I said, wondering how much he had overheard. "'Where have you been keeping yourself? "'I haven't seen you since we met unexpectedly in the Valley of the Kings.' "'The hair had to be a wig. "'It was too snowy white, too smooth.' "'Sir Malcolm acknowledged my hit with a smile. "'An interesting evening, was it not? "'May I join you for a few minutes?' "'Certainly,' I said. "'Do you remember Antony Bisinghurst? "'You met him last year, but briefly.' A pleasure to see you again, Mr. Bisinghurst. Sir Malcolm bowed again very cautiously and subjected Sethos to an intense stare. I heard you had joined the Emerson's crew. An excavator, are you? My specialty is demotic, said Sethos. 
I am privileged to further my acquaintance with the subject with an expert like Ramsay's. The waiter came to take our orders, and I asked him to fetch another chair. Sethos studied Sir Malcolm with what I could only regard as professional interest, taking note of every detail. I hoped he didn't intend to impersonate Sir Malcolm again. He had done so briefly the year before, and had been thoroughly confounded when Sir Malcolm arrived on our doorstep without warning. Sethos's hasty retreat had barely avoided a confrontation. Almost I could have wished that the confrontation had taken place. Two Sir Malcolms, face to face, equally aghast. Even Sethos could not have talked his way out of that. Mother, said Nefret, I realized the charm of that image had made me lose track of the conversation. Sir Malcolm had addressed a remark to me. I beg your pardon, I said. Let me put it more directly said Sir Malcolm, mistaking my momentary abstraction for surprise. I believe we can be of use to one another, Mrs. Emerson. Your distinguished husband would still like to get his hands on that tomb. I can help him to do so. Impossible, I said. Not at all. Carnarvon's folly in entering the tomb illegally puts him in a dubious position. If Monsieur Le Corps were convinced he and Carter had removed valuable artifacts, the Department of Antiquities would have grounds to cancel the concession. Nefret let out a stifled exclamation, but she left it to me to reply. Pondering the outrageous suggestion, I remained silent, and Sir Malcolm went on, with mounting passion. The rumours are spreading, but so far they are no more than that. If you, those of you who were witnesses that night, and I were to go to La Cour and corroborate one another's testimony, he could not ignore it. If he were tempted to do so, a threat of public exposure would do the job. You have friends in the newspaper world. One of them was another witness to Carnarvon's actions. He would be delighted to publish the story. I see you have thought it out carefully, I said. The professor's evidence is crucial, Sir Malcolm said. His reputation is unimpeachable, and no one could believe he and I are... Um... In cahoots, I murmured. Very true. His dislike of you is well known. I presume that should this scheme come to fruition, you would expect something in return. Sir Malcolm's pale cheeks took on a feverish glow. You have seen the contents of that tomb. Any one of the objects would be the prize of a collection. Lefret could contain herself no longer. She burst out. How dare you suggest? Now, now, I said. Without wishing to be rude, Sir Malcolm, I think you had better go, before my daughter loses her temper. She is a person of integrity, you see. The subtle insult was lost on Sir Malcolm. He was a true collector, a fanatic whose principles, assuming he had any, would always yield to the lust for possession. He was a clever enough strategist to know better than to pursue the argument, however, Rising to his feet, he beckoned his attendant, who hastened to his side, and handed him his stick. Think it over, Mrs. Emerson, and consult your husband. I hope to hear from you in due course. He snapped his fingers. His servant opened a parasol, canopied like a potentate. Sir Malcolm stalked off. Mother, said Nefret, in ominous tones, you wouldn't. You couldn't. The waiter presented me with a platter of chicken and rice. That looks very good, I said. Eat, Nefret. You need to keep up your strength. Naturally, I have no intention of collaborating in such a reprehensible scheme. It is an ingenious idea, though, Sethos murmured. It might even work. Emerson would howl at the very suggestion, I informed him. So don't you get any ideas of your own. I allowed Sir Malcolm to think we might yet be persuaded, because I believe in keeping all avenues of information open. He is determined to obtain some of the objects from that tomb. He will stop at nothing. If this scheme does not work, he will try something else, up to and including murder. We owe it to Lord Carnarvon to watch Sir Malcolm closely. Surely you exaggerate, Nefret protested. He is an unscrupulous man, but murder? You don't understand the collector's mania, Nefret. The artifacts in Tutankhamun's tomb would drive many a man to mayhem. She's right, Sethos said, nodding at Nefret. That painted chest, for example. Ask the man who knows, I said, 
with a hard look at my brother-in-law. I had hoped Mr. Callender would drop in for tea, but six o'clock came and went with no sign of him. Ah, oh, well, I said to Nefret, perhaps tomorrow. He wasn't looking at all well. Emerson, who had been badgered into playing chess with David John, looked up from the board. You didn't slip a little something into that lemonade, did you, Peabody? I didn't know Nefret was bringing it. Sethos burst out laughing, and Nefret said severely, Don't encourage her. She was out of temper with Sethos these days. I felt sure that Margaret had been regaling her with tales of his failings as a husband. As a professional woman in her own right, Nefret sympathized with other strong professional women. And as a spouse, Sethos cut a poor figure compared with Ramsay's. Dowood had come by earlier with a demand from Margaret that I attend upon her that evening. I decided I had better go, though I couldn't think of anything that would satisfy her desire for an exclusive story. Obviously I could not mention Sir Malcolm's preposterous scheme, though that was certainly news of import, and if Kevin got hold of the story first, Margaret would be impossible to control. However, I told myself, Kevin wouldn't dare print anything without our cooperation, and he was not going to get that. It had required two whiskey and sodas to calm Emerson after I told him about Sir Malcolm's proposition. Having admitted the reasonableness of my behavior, he turned his wrath on his brother. You ought to have given him a good thrashing. On the terrace of the Winter Palace, in front of fifty people, Sethos raised his eyebrows. Mm -hmm, said Emerson. After a moment, he added, Bah! Rising, I said, I'm going to run over to Gunnar for a while. Take your parasol, Emerson said. Give my love to my wife, said Sethos. Checkmate, said David John. Khadija stood in the open door of the house, arms folded, chatting with her neighbors. I brought the medicine you asked for, I said for the benefit of the audience that always gathered when I visited the village. Thank you, Sitakim. She took the bottle I handed her and led the way into the house. An appetizing odor of roast lamb made my nostrils twitch. Observing this, Khadija asked, Will you stay to eat, Sit? I'd better not, Khadija. Some other night. Where is Daoud? The lady sent him to Luxor to get the newspapers. Is that all right, Sitakim? If you say no, I will not give them to her. You may as well. How is she? All day she has been writing in her little book. She thanked me very politely for being so kind to her. Good, I said. Perhaps I might look forward to a peaceful interview. I feel sorry for her, Khadija said. Today she asked me to bring her flowers. Only a few, she said, to remind her of the beautiful world outside. Because my own conscience was troubling me just a trifle, I said firmly, It is necessary for her own safety, and it won't be much longer. I hope, I added to myself. Margaret was curled up in the comfortable armchair Khadija had supplied, reading. Daoud had smuggled her suitcase to her, and she was wearing a loose dressing gown in a drab shade of mauve. She really could use some hints on the subject of dress. On the table beside her were Khadija's flowers, roses and hibiscus and daisies, nicely arranged in a vase. "'I see you've found something to amuse you,' I said, closing the door. Khadija's ponderous footsteps retreated kitchenward. "'It's a marvellous piece of rubbish,' Margaret said. "'Really, Amelia, I am surprised to find you reading such stuff.' "'I was curious,' I admitted. The book was so popular last winter, it sold an extraordinary number of copies. I only skimmed parts of it. That bad, is it? Dear me, yes. Even better than my own efforts along the lines of romantic adventure. Glancing down at the page, she read aloud, He seized my hand, his black eyes blazing with passion. For days your glorious face has filled my dreams, he panted, his breath hot on my face. I cannot sleep, I cannot eat, you are mine, alone in the desert with me. No one will hear you cry for help. I laughed with her, pleased to find her in such a merry mood. 
As I recall, your only venture into romance was the description of your first meeting with Sethos. And that, in fact, was not fiction. But it was very romantic, Margaret murmured pensively. How is he? Unharmed so far, I said, taking a seat on the bed. We're keeping a close watch over him, as we are over you. Margaret started and turned her head. There's someone at the window. I hadn't heard or seen anything, but she appeared so alarmed that I went to look out. The window was so high I had to stand on tiptoe. Palm branches, the walls of nearby houses, warmed to umber by the light of the setting sun. The light went out 